What's up, everybody? Welcome into day three. Three, three. This is the third day of the EXP Expo. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure how I'm still sitting up, but I'm joined by right now Miss Jen King, the commander, the person held responsible. Uh, she is here. We are gonna we just wanted to give you guys a minute while we're uh just before we get started here. With the gang from Red 5, we have Alex DeLuca and Josh Starnes coming on in just a second from Red 5 Comics to talk about their stuff. But we wanted to give you guys a little preview of today's schedule and the schedule for the week, right? Uh, it's so weird to have everything, like this is like so jam-packed. But then we roll into something really amazing, which is our normal programming. Right. Our regular programming is going to be a good time. I mean, and it's 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 weird because my role in this thing is, you know, like this weekend has largely been to be talent, to be here, to be interviewing people. But then starting tomorrow, I'm the guy who, uh, as I said on Facebook, makes the donuts. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm producing uh, almost every show or every show. And, you know, I'm the guy who's pressing the buttons all the time. So it, it's kind of an interesting transition to me to kind of play in both worlds. Uh, and tomorrow night is a prime example of that, right? So our Tuesday night shows go like this, guys. It's uh, 6 o'clock from 6 to 7. It's me with my new show, The Pull List, where we talk about what's on my pull list that's coming out this week and what you should be adding to yours. And then we have Minute to Skim It with Miss Jen and Hannah, uh, a long-running show that you guys have been doing for how long? I, we need to go back and look at all of the feed, but I think five or six years now we've been doing it. It was really janky at the beginning, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we've been we've been adding we've been adding tech to it. We've been making it better, and making it better, and making it better. And uh, you know, now we're debuting on network uh, on Tuesday uh, from seven to seven forty-five. Uh, and the reason we do it that way is because at se at eight o'clock you have uh, a show on the Comic Book Shopping Network where people have a chance to pre-order the books that are up. Excuse me, out this week. Um, so at 7.45, I'll be back for a couple minutes, and we'll just talk about some of the great places you can go buy comic books, um, local comic shops, that kind of thing. And then at 8 o'clock, uh, we have uh, In Stores This Week with Nick, uh, which will be, you know, myself, and uh, or I'll be a part of it a little bit. Uh, Good Moo, Rob, uh, I know you meant morning, I saw, but I think Good Moo is way more our style. I think so. Um, so we're going to go with it. But um, yeah, so then it, it'll be Nick, uh, Nick and I or Nick and some special guests talking to you about more books that are coming out uh, in stores on Wednesday. Guys, our whole goal on Tuesday night is to drive you into your local comic book shop on Wednesday. You know, we, we're here to support the direct market. We're here to support publishers. We're here to support creators. And the best way to do that is going into a store on a Wednesday or whatever day you can go in. I'm not saying you got to be a Wednesday warrior, but whatever day you can make it in, going into a comic shop and buying comics. Like my, my suggestion is to come to the that show night on Tuesday show night with a pad and pen, so you can write down all the things you heard that you absolutely must have. They sell these like at Walgreens. You could buy six of them for like four bucks. Yeah. And by the end of the year, you might be through one of them. So you've got six years worth of writing your comic list down for $4 at the Walgreens. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so uh, the other things we have, we have a bunch of great people on today. Like, we're still doing the EXP Expo. It's not over yet. Most conventions, you'd be like, all right, I got to go home on Monday. No, it's Martin Luther King Day. Happy Martin Luther King Day, everybody. So hopefully you've all got the day off work. Because the banks are closed. And if the banks are closed and the mail doesn't go, I don't work. That's kind of been my rule. So I'm hanging out with you guys. So hopefully you've got the day off from work or you're watching us at work. I won't tell your boss, I promise. Keep the volume low. <laughs> well, here, here's a little trick, right? Open up a Google Drive, a Google Sheets document in another tab. And when you hear the boss coming, just click on it and start typing as fast as you can. I may or may not have some experience in this regard, you know, with March Madness and other things. So try that. Do your work gets done. Do your work, please. Make your bosses. Yeah, don't get fired. But like, <laughs> don't try too hard today. 
So we're uh, we've got right now uh, coming up in just a second uh, the gang from Red Five. Like I said, Alex DeLuca and Josh Starnes. Uh, we've got uh, later on in the day. We've got Second Sight Publishing. <coughs> um, then Jen gets to interview someone she's recently become hooked on. Twisted the band. They have a comic book out called Haunted Ions. <coughs> they will be here. Excuse me. And then Source Point Press. Travis McIntyre will be here a little later. And then following them a little later in the day, even. Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor will be here. Uh, and then uh, we round out the day tonight. You're going to want to tune in at 9 o'clock tonight, East Coast time. 9 p.m. tonight, East Coast time. For the Comic Book Shopping Experience Team AMA. So we'll have everybody here who's involved in this little, uh, this, this madness that we're starting. And you'll be able to ask us all your pertinent questions, all your impertinent questions. And just randomness that you'd like to ask us. And we will answer it because that's how those things work. So you're going to want to tune in for that tonight at 9. But right now we've got uh, Alex and Josh from Red, uh, Red 5 Comics. Uh, who every time I, I read one of their books or think about it, I hear Simply Red in the background. Because Red 5 has some amazing books. But the first one I ever read uh, was, I can't remember the name of the title, but it was a red cover with a plane. And that was the first, huh? That's, that's the rift. The rift, yes. Mm -hmm. And so ever since then, that's just the way my brain works, is it connects it to a song, and then I can always remember what the cover looked like. I'll get better at the titles. So we will be back with them in just about 15 seconds. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hello, my friends. How are you doing this early morning? Hey, good morning. Hey, Jen. How are you? I'm doing so morning. good. I still on my voice, which is saying something. I was going to add together how many hours <laughs> of interviews I've done over the last two days, and then I said, no, that'll just, I'll wait till I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the experience. Now, have you been talking for two days straight? We're joined by Alex DeLuca at the very top. Hello. Hello. Darns. That, wish Alex lived closer to me because I'm sure we would all hang out more. But Josh lives locally to me and I get to have the honor of hosting him on some of my shows. About once a month he'll come by and and uh, show us the cool fancy things. Which is so, so much fun. Uh, those are great shows. So let's get into the weeds here. This is um, Red 5 is an amazing company. I've really loved carrying them as a retailer um when was red five born so red five red five was born we are now a little over 10 years old we're coming on on uh yeah 13 years old so red five was born in the mid 2000s the first book um hit the stands in the fall of 2007 but it was actually born years before that uh by uh, two guys that I had known for a while, and, and I, I was there when they were having their initial conversation to put it together. Scott and um, and uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, and his good friend Paul, and um, they had they had known each other through uh, Star Wars fans for a long, long time. No surprise, Red Five Comics uh, was named uh, from something from Star Wars, and uh, they had known each other since college, and they had uh, and, and Paul. Had actually been working at Lucasfilm for uh, for an extended period of time, and he uh, he had been he was preparing to leave, and he had always wanted to. He'd been doing like some web comics for them, but he always wanted to branch out and do uh, do his own larger comics, and and get them into comic stores and see them created. And um, Scott had wanted to do the same, so they. Um, uh, they spent basically two years talking about it, and I'm kind of within all of those those email change and pitching out ideas and, and talking about things that can be done. And um, finally, in in um, the spring of 2007, they actually started to get uh, their first books made. The very first book we ever came out, which is I'm still in my favorite, is a book called Neozoic, uh, a world a world of dinosaurs where no um, 
no, uh, 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 dinosaurs did not go extinct and they evolved up alongside mankind and live in these giant wall cities and uh, have professional dinosaur fighters. So that, that finally came out in the fall of 2007, the very first, Paul, Paul Inns. And that was, uh, that was his baby that he'd been, he'd been working on for a long time. And, uh, uh, and then that was quickly followed by our, our first batch of, of books, um, as Scott's first title, Afterburn. Uh, which one day soon, hopefully, we will see on, on big screens around us. And then uh, our first big hit, um, Atomic Robo, where we, we sort of by accident got hooked up with Kevin uh, Jack. He'd been doing 8-bit theater for several years. And, uh, and he had a book that he actually wanted to do on shelves and had been and had been taking it from publisher to publisher. And somehow all the other publishers had said no, but uh, but we said yes. And uh, and it was uh, it was kind of an amazing first year. Um, we, within like six months, um, uh, an agent from CAA had called and wanted to really liked Afterburn and wanted to, to buy the rights for it. And then, you know, a couple of months after that, we got the news that uh, the first Atomic Robo uh, limited series had been nominated for an Eisner for, for Best Lit Series. So, and then we won the, uh, the Diamond Gem Award for Publisher of the Year in our first year. We're like, this is amazing. This, this, uh, this publishing thing, this comic publishing thing is way easier. Than I thought it was. <laughs> you just have to show up with good material and, this, and great things happen. And then, uh, then it turned out to be actually quite a bit more difficult than that. But um, <laughs> uh, I had been um, sort of working, uh, working with them, <laughs> a lot of logistics and um, and connecting them with uh, with um, other comics artists who had books to pitch from from the inception. And then about uh, 2015, I decided to make my role official. So I, I joined. I, I, I took an ownership interest and uh, and joined as one of the uh, co-publishers in 2015. Feels like yesterday, but it's now six years ago I came on board. Here we are, still uh, still going strong. So Joshua, how did the how did the uh, the founders meet each other? Did they just meet over dinner at a con, or did they they live close to each other, or just like each other's work? How did that start? They lived close to, they so uh, uh, like Paul and Scott. I know had had uh, met in college, so they they went to college and they quite kind of had bonded over um, over their shared love of Star Wars. So even when uh, even when Paul moved to California, they stayed in touch. And then I met Scott through a friend. Of, he he was my best friend's best friend <laughs> growing up. So uh, it was sort of like um, somewhere along the line, and, and my best friend is a, a man who named uh, Phil Malone, who um, I have known since high school. And just, I, you know, it's one of those things where it's hard. I don't know if you can actually like even pinpoint exactly where it was. Just sort of somewhere within the realm of knowing someone for 30 years, I became acquainted with his circle of friends because it's just hard not to when you're around all the time. Uh, so I had met Scott, you know, by the time, um, by the time, Red Five started getting talked about. I had known Scott for probably um, six or seven years, um, and we also we we traveled in a lot of the same circles, um, a lot of the same comic book circles, and a lot of the same movie circles. So when I'm not uh, when I I'm not getting a chance to write comics and um, and publish comics, I'm also a professional film critic. Um, so there was a, a long period of about 14 years where I wrote um, movie reviews and um, and features for a website called um, Coming Soon Diet, and um, Scott also wrote for that same website, um, focusing heavily on, on um, Star Wars news and genre news and sci-fi news. That was, that was sort of his corner, and I, I wrote up the weirder, small, independent films, just pretty much what I do. And, um, but we got to know each other uh, well then, and we actually, you know, we, we started to form our own friendship from, from having a go-between. And so, um, you know, by the time Scott uh, was starting to have these these uh, initial discussions about forming Red Five. I I'd known him for five five years, and as soon as he said, "You know, I'm about to comic company," I'm like, "I want to be a part of that because uh, I've been I've been a comic fan and comic collector, and in, in, in one in one area or another worked in for most. I mean, I've been a collector since I was a boy. I worked in in retail um, all through college and, and into my mid twenties, and uh, and um, had when I was a teenager some uh some some ambition to like self-publish my own comic one day if i could get around the fact that i, I can't draw at all 
um, without really having, you know, having, you know, a 15 year old's idea of how hard that would actually be. Um, and then, uh, but it's always in the back of my head. So as soon as, um, as soon as, uh, uh, someone I, I knew well, I was, uh, I was saying, you know, we're going to start a comic company. I was like, I, my way in and I, I pestered him, um, relentlessly, um, with my ideas for the company for for a decade until he finally was like all right you know we might as well might as well make official you won't be alone about it um but especially once i you know once i saw the first books come back from the printer and and uh, you could and saw even before that saw uh, the art and saw the care they were taking you know they was always been committed to though we're small has always been committed to uh to really high quality work and um trying to to make the slickest and, and best looking presentation we can so we you know, have too many eggs in our basket but the eggs we have are big and giant and multicolored and shiny and fantastic and that's kind of the way we like it as a retailer i tell you that's been to your advantage it's a, a big benefit to not have a bunch of things to crowd the rack that you're not sure what to focus on things coming out in a, a slower pace makes it very easy to say, well, this is Red Fly's focus right now. I think it's a couple, two, three books. And it makes it uh, much more simple to say, I'm dedicating this much rack space so they get face out time, which is always so much better when you're trying to sell comic books. Comic books with just the top showing are much harder to sell in my opinion. <laughs> so um, it sounds like you had a very early on interest from Hollywood yeah, and some of your properties. Yeah. Um, was that part of the the um, the forward looking focus that you guys had, or was that just something that happened magically? It it I will I want to say kind of it happened man. It was it was definitely not a thought. At first, during during the initial discussions, it was more about let's just make some comics and put them on stands. But then it happened so quickly that it then you know it, it happened almost um, almost simultaneously with the first books going out. That then it did start to be something where that was that was being thought about. And I think because it happened so fast, I think we thought it was easier than it was going to be. What happened was you know with those first books, you know um, we. Um, did not yet have national distribution, so we were uh, um, writing to a lot of, uh, emailing a lot of comic stores and retailers and put our put our books on their counter or work out some sort of deal to be on consignment or see if they wanted to buy direct from us who they had never heard of and didn't know what we were, were teaching them. Um, it, we, you know, we were doing that for probably three or four months before we actually got national distribution and, um, and we we did get picked up by you know a couple of the larger shops in that um, going out and, and meltdown you know RIP uh, were both willing to kind of carry our stuff um, on their shelves and uh, an agent from CAA just walked into I think he walked into the meltdown and he saw he's like this looks really interesting I'm gonna buy this I'm gonna find out how to get in contact with uh, the people that made it because I think I can make it move. so it's just like we were just minding our own business and got the the call and um, and like six months later, Afterburn was sold, and yeah, and we were kind of like, "This is this is a this is amazingly easy. You just put out a great, you know, a great product, and and we'll be banging down your door. You don't even have to do." And uh, <laughs> I wish that were true, but you know, ever since then, we're like, "All right, we have to, we have to, you know, we weren't keeping this in mind before, but we have to to keep it out." <laughs> exactly, Alex. I'm sure. So, no. I, um, but, um, uh, and you know, you, it's, it's a part of the, it, and that was, you know, you're talking about like 2007, obviously their comic at that point had been big, you'd had Spider-Man films and the X-Men films, but you know, you're about a year before Marvel started its unstoppable juggernaut and people were just, studios really just started going, God, we're going to buy every comic you know thing we can find because somewhere in there is our next major franchise but it wasn't you know too long after that that it was it started to become like regularly what do you have what do you have what do you have and we were you know having to go and um and shop around and and we've been lucky that you know, uh, we've had a, a lot of good titles and quite a few um have been been picked up and, and have uh that interest shown on them and uh 
And it's always something we're thinking about now because uh, especially for a small publisher, you, you can't not. It's not the only, it is not the only thing I think of when I'm looking at a new book. Um, I, I tell that when I'm looking at a new comic that, that we're talking about, my first thought is always, you know, does it work as a book first? And I want it to be a good comic that you can just sit down and read. But obviously you can't, you can't ignore the other part of, because that part of the business and um, and something that's got a really good good chance of, of getting picked up is something that we also always want to talk about. And, and I'm up front with everybody that we talk with. Like, you know, this I think is a good comic book, um, uh, but it's, it's, you know, specific to comic books. And those are the kind of comic, a lot of those are the kind of comics I like. You know, I love Grant Morrison comics. They're, they would probably never translate into a movie and that's someone who writes stuff that works. Um, very much entirely within the medium of comics and isn't really translatable outside of it. And, uh, and I always love, you know, and I'm always looking for books like that as well as looking for, uh, for books that have some sort of crossover potential. Cast a wide net. So um, it hasn't been that long since you guys were kind of like new to the scene. Speak to the audience a little bit about what it looks like when you first start a company what are the steps to like, if you wanted to become distributed nationally through that, like a diamond kind of distributorship, what kind of ducks do you need to have in a row to be even considered? So we, to start with, we really, and, and, you know, first I, first thing you do is do your homework. Like when we first, uh, by the time we um, actually had printed our first book, a lot of uh, phone calls and emails had gone back and forth, both with retailers, um, but also with Diamond to discuss like, what's it going to, because I think definitely there was a thought, first I was like, oh, well you just present, you know, three issues of the book to Diamond and they distribute it. And no, <laughs> it is not like that. Um, but uh, so there, but you know, we definitely spent some time doing homework, um, finding out not just like uh, finding out, yes, what, what's selling and what's selling in, in different parts of the country. Because if you call enough and talk with enough retailers and man, for the most part, most of the, you know, we have a, we have, have a long um, contact list that we spent a while building of, of different shops. Um, I spent a, a good long time just building a spreadsheet of, of comic store phone numbers and addresses. And most of them would were way of a call with us. Um, but having conversations with them about what they carried in their stores and, you know, what their customers bought, and you, you can get like a real sense, especially graphically. Um, uh, there are parts of the country where, like only Marvel and DC sells and you're like, all right, so my stuff has no chance there. And there's parts of the country where, um, you know, mostly it's small stuff. Um, and you kind of were having phone calls with, with Diamond. And we're, we're basically asking point blank, what does it take to get into into the diamond catalog? How do, how can we get distributed by diamond into two stores? And they were very upfront about that. Like we want to see this, we want to see that. We want to see have a catalog with completed titles, no vaporware that's going to disappear, but that you have, have interest from stores already, um, probably that you. Can, one to one to stores already, and you can show us how many copies you have been selling, so that we have some idea whether it is actually worth it for us to uh, to carry you in our, our web house or not, our, our warehouse or not. Um, you know, we start off that that indication of what what price and costs are like, so you start to get find out what the actual. I mean, have any idea what that means or kind of what's involved, what what you are likely to get paid for an individual copy of a, of a comic you sell, depending who you sell it to, what it's likely to each individual one of those, one of those books. Um, so, you know, do your research way in advance. So doing that, we spent months and months um, talking with Diamond, talking to friends for um, per, uh, per thousand copies and, uh, you know, uh, figuring out, um, what payment terms were, how we could work out payment in terms, figuring out how to finance both the creation of the books and, um, and their production of what, um, 
counting numbers. We Joshua, do me a favor. Uh, pop back off, pop, pop, pop off, and then rejoin us. Uh, your Wi-Fi is totally giving you a hard time, and I bet you if you do, if you do that, it'll work better. Uh, Alex, what's going on, man? It looks like you're t coming to us from a uh, the back back hallway of some awesome menu uh, music venue. It is my home office. I mean. You know, I like I like to I like to say I'm glad my wife does the finances because if I did the finances, our house would be broke, but we'd have a lot of cool guitars and comics. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, Somebody said, but that might be okay too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, I think it would be. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, um, uh, I know you from your work on the Dragon Whisperer, which is awesome. Thank and you. What is so hilarious to me right now is that with you with the rush hat on looks way less like your internet icon self which looks like you come from the movie somewhere in time <laughs> a very period piece so it's just it's mind-blowing to me i'm like going every time i see you and i see you in a different hat i'm like going alex is a man of many faces he can be anything <laughs> and many hats too apparently <laughs> thank you thank you yeah like uh you know that I, that, that picture you're talking about is uh another kind of a, a musical endeavor that I'm in. So yes, I love the music and I love the comics. So let's talk about the music first because it is front and center in the back. It's obvious that either you like just collect the look of, of uh, musical instruments or you actually a musician. What do you play and when do you start? I, um, I play guitar and I sing and I've been playing in bands forever. Uh, when did I start? <laughs> 19... Norm and um, decades, decades have been doing it. I've been in bands ever since, and I've been very blessed. I've actually been in, in bands that, uh, if if uh, I, I like to say, if I were single and if I was, I was okay living in like you know a closet, I could have like just been a musician. But um, no, I've, I've been in bands for for many many years. I'm I'm in a band now. Obviously, live performance is is. Uh, completely stopped um for the most part for now but uh before that i was i was gigging at least about once a week at, at restaurants and bars and, and that kind of thing and uh i have a children's music group the ray tones that uh that's my 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 joy and passion uh, we, we we're kind of like i like to say if, if the wiggles are the beatles we're the stones we're kind of edgy children's music you know um so we do that and it's it's a good bit of fun and you know and both comics and and music are i i bleed comics and music it's just who i am to the marrow of my bones right so you're in a band but were you a band kid was i oh band kid in school no i wasn't actually i didn't i didn't know no band stuff in school um i don't know maybe because i was too rebellious but when i wanted to there was no guitar in any of the bands and i just wanted to really focus on guitar because you know why guys start playing guitar i mean because to get chicks so so um and i said well there's no there's no band there's no guitar in school band so i guess i can't do that so but then you know i i took i took the sort of route of like being in in school in in bands with friends that i was in school with so Technically, I was in bands at school with friends, so that kind of makes it a school band, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a band kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is uh, music part of your, your family growing up, or is it something you just found on your own with friends? No, definitely. My dad was a singer. My dad was a singer um, in Argentina. My, my parents are from Italy, and then they were then they spent a lot of time in Argentina before they moved to the States. And my dad was a singer in the 50s in Argentina. I mean, I wish I knew him when uh, he was that. It's a, he's a different man. He had this the, the cool hair and the suits. And, you know, you know the look of, of the black and white pictures from people in the 50s? Like, and he had that cool big sure microphone that you hold like this. And he used to croon to the girls. And, and you know, when I was a kid, my dad said, girls, Alex, girls used to chase me. I'm like, no way. Just no. 
and then you know, and then I see pictures of him. It's like, oh my gosh! And like, you know, my wife looks at him. Like, Why your dad is way cooler than you? I'm like, yeah, you know, it's you know, it, it, it's like that. So it was definitely in my uh, and my brother. He's a absolutely fantastic singer, great guitar player too. It is absolutely um, in my family. Yes, I was raised around music all the time. That is so cool! Oh my gosh! So did you um, did you do like the typical garage band where you just like rolled up the garage door and got together with your pals and and rocked it out? Oh yeah, um, boy! At the be in, in the early days, uh, we rehearsed so much more than we ever gigged, and they they said like we used to say, you know, rehearsal's good, but there's not a lot of money in it. Um, and yes, and we the neighbors just loved us and the cops too on occasion at the parties um yes many 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 hours of rehearsal and it, it's kind of it's kind of good i mean it's good to put in a lot of hours of rehearsal at the beginning it's very good one one thing i learned um and i'll always remember this it was an interview with ruth rose and joshua will know who ruth rose is i'm quite sure she actually she wrote uh the, the, she wrote really the, the, the script of King Kong, the original, in 1933. And then, um, and she said, one thing that writers, and it was much later in life, one thing that writers aren't, don't want to do, or filmmakers don't want to do, is start at the bottom. You got to start at the bottom. And I always remember that. I said, yeah, that sucks, but okay, I'll start at the bottom. Because, you know, where else am I going to be? I mean, I'm not going to like be Eddie Van Halen, you know, the first moment I pick up a guitar. So, so I start at the bottom. I said, okay, guys, we're going to get together. We're going to rehearse. And we're going to rehearse a lot. And we're going to get our parts right. And, you know, let's, let's, let's learn covers first. And, you know, one good thing about being into Rush is that if you, you learn good technique pretty quick because Rush is, you know, is, is the technical music. So we rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed. And then later in life, getting gigs became a little bit easier because I was well rehearsed. And then after a while, I was getting enough gigs in which... I was looking for opportunities that there was no rehearsal. There was just the gig. And what that means was you show up at the gig. You, well, you, you, you get a song list at the beginning of that. And then, you know, and then sometimes at gigs, especially at the restaurants where we're sitting down and it's casual and we're at a bar, it's not like we're not the show. We're more background music. We can actually have our, our sheet music in front of us and, and look at it a little bit and glance at it. But you get to the point in which you're um, – rehearsed enough beforehand with the other musicians you can look at each other says okay we're going to do this this is going to be you know a one three four five or there's going to be a 12 bar blues and e shuffle and we have no idea what we're going to do and then the the guy that sings it or the lady that sings it goes two three four and then you start so that's how that's how uh it, the, that's the point that i got to it was really great so i was looking at opportunities in which uh, we said, well, we rehearse four times a month and we gig about once every six months. I'm like, mm, no thanks. Uh, well, we gig about four times a month and we rehearse once, a really long rehearsal. Good. I like that. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. Well, maybe not. I haven't gigged in a while, so I have to probably like practice again. Yeah. Yeah. But do you remember um, how you got your first gig? Um. Yeah, let's see. My first gig that was outside of, I played talent shows in high school and stuff like that. But my, I remember my first gig was uh, when, when, when you're young, when you're a young musician, you think the music that you write is going to be so much better than anything that anybody's ever heard of the covers that they know. Because you don't want to hear the Beatles. You want to hear Alex DeLuca's original that I wrote in my bedroom last week, but it's really good. And I got these musicians that, that are going to play with me. So at the beginning, so our first gig, we played at uh, like a, 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 uh, a bar, um, but it was like a restaurant bar because we weren't under, we weren't 18 yet. So it was, it was all that. It wasn't technically a bar. It was the fourth street grill in downtown San Jose. And, we're just like we're gonna do just originals, man. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be playing for the man. And um, I'll tell you I'll tell you how it went in something that somebody told me many years later. When I play at restaurants, it's all covers. It's stuff 
everybody knows. And then this one guy came up to me and said, you know what I love about your music? That you didn't say this. I went to a, a street fair the other day and somebody was playing, someone who I never saw before says, this is from my fourth album and a one. And, and then I walked away because I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear somebody playing like an original. And that's how the audience reacted. They're like, mm. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, they bobbed their head a few times at some things, but, but mostly like, okay. So I said, all right, you know, doing some covers is good. I'll, I'll ease into doing originals. And with my children's music group, it's all originals. And um, the nice thing about a children's music group is your audience sort of um, uh, renews itself every seven years or so. I mean, a, a small child is only going to is only going to be into your music for a given amount of time. And then you have like a whole new audience just in a few years. And what's good about that is I haven't had a new CD in a long time. And, uh, but what is, what does a, a one-year-old care about that or a, a two-year-old care about that? I mean, it, to them, it's new. It's like, if you hadn't heard the Beatles before, you're, the Beatles are new for you. So, and that's the one wonderful thing about playing children's music. And also they kind of don't care about the tune itself. As long as it's catchy and you're bouncing around and you're happy and you're kind of like, you know, you're, you're getting the parents into it too. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about playing children's music. It's, it's, uh, the shows are short because the attention span is short, but by the end of a show, I want to collapse because I'm just, I'm just the whole time. I'm like happy and bouncing around and doing stuff and just getting really goofy. And we have a costume character performer and we have hula hoops and we toss a beach ball in the audience. We're like, go to the, the raytones.com and you'll see videos of us um, doing that. Uh, it's, it's good fun. So what is, what is the favorite song with the kids? What, what is the one they like? just get up and lose their minds over unquestionably it's <laughs> daddy's scratchy face <laughs> it's called dead because you know let's face it i i mean it's seven in the morning here it's it's seven thirty in the morning and you know you i could i could sharpen a pencil on this and you know and and um and josh too i i've never seen josh without stubble mm -hmm. it's you know it's like that's it's yeah. like dad it's like and then we, we do a dance where uh, we tell the kids to do this. <laughs> and then the kids get up and they do the scratchy face dance. So kids love goofy. Kids love kids love gross. It's it's funny as it sounds. Kids love gross. Anybody with a kid know that, that kids love gross. We have a song called Smelly Socks. And um and you know, Daddy's Scratchy Face and other other fun songs, hula hoop songs, a beach song songs about pajamas just all kinds of goofy stuff uh, and you know the educational ones too like mm -hmm. counting and traffic lights and signals and all that yeah whenever i've got teenage boys now but still if i want to see them cheer up like if they're having a day mm -hmm. i i put on um i think there's like a, a kids radio station just on like sirius xm or something right but they often have this song you probably know it uh it's about a duck and it's called got any grapes <laughs> that's adorable that's adorable yeah you know it's it's true it you know there there, there is a certain thing that it's a certain thing about kids music that brings out the kid in us and we're always going to remember you know my, my my son was in his bassinet i was changing his diapers and he was singing row 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 your boat you know yep. yeah it probably helps keep you young too if you have to like go on stage and start thinking like a kiddo <laughs> It keeps me young to a fault. In fact, it keeps me only young. That's like, I mean, forget this maturity stuff. I mean, it's, it just, it very much keeps me young. Yeah, I think, I think as comic book people, that's kind of like the universal fact that I found out about us is that we do feel like little kids inside. We're just holding on to that with both hands and don't want to let that part go. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to let it go for as long as I live. I'm going to be a complete goofball, you know? Mm -hmm. What was your first comic growing up? Do you remember it? My first comic um, was Chamber of Chills. And it, it was, uh, I remember it. Well, my, my brother, my brother's eight years older than I am. So he was into comics and therefore I was into comics. He was into Star Trek and then I was into Star Trek because everything that he did, I, I glommed onto. So I was actually fortunate to, uh, to get into this stuff very early and, and at a very young age. 
I I loved King Kong. King Kong was it for me when I was a kid. I mean, when um, and and uh, I'm I'll, I'll I'll date myself, but when I was a little kid, it was before the 1976 King Kong came out. So for me, it was the 1933 King Kong, and that was Fay yeah, Fay Ray, Bruce Cabot, Robert Armstrong, all of them. Um, and I just loved King Kong, and I remember I saw this issue of Chamber of Chills in which this giant gorilla man was on the cover. I'm like, oh, that, that's King Kong-esque. So I want to get that. And then, you know, my, my brother, he was into the, he was into him. Definitely. He was, he was the Captain America, the, the, the Batman and all throughout the young life. It was, it was the superhero books. It was Chamber of Chills first. I remember that, but I remember then the, then the superhero books and, you know, I, I ran the gamut. I, everybody was my favorite um, for the longest time. Spider-Man, of course, the Hulk, Black Panther, um, all of those were, were my favorites uh, at a very young age, and then and then later and then later I got into the the non superhero books, and I kind of been going that route for thirty years at least, if not more. Yeah. You know. So, were you, were you the kid that kept your books meticulous, or were they just like in giant piles all over the corners of the room, center of the floor? When I was uh, a little kid. It was that. It was like I would roll them up, stick them in my pocket, that kind of thing. But then, <clears throat> um, around the time of Jim Shooter of Marvel, mm -hmm. I to me to me, yes, eight, 1986 was the the big year. Okay, of course, that was the big year where where everything changed for everybody not just me everything changed for everybody but for me before then when jim shooter was the editor-in-chief of marvel to me that was like there was a real shift in what what these comics could do and and the storytelling and the, the writers and the artists um i didn't i cared less about who the writer was before jim shooter but then jim shooter happened like oh you know okay this guy christopher claremont he's he's really good and um all the writers and then after that then bags and boards probably started a, a little bit before then but i don't think they really completely took off until at least for me and the time around the early 80s when jim shooter started and then then that was it it's like there was good, fine mint, pristine mint, and and therein was my world. And then you know, these books, these these these, there's stacks of long boxes here, and no, they're all in there. And yep, I've read them, and yep, I'm going to keep them, and that's where they're going to stay, in their nice, not quite temperature controlled environment, but uh, you know, in their bags and boards. So now now that's what I do. I don't read with a pair of tweezers, but I, uh, I, uh, I still keep them like that. Got a question from our audience here. How excited are you about Kong versus Godzilla coming out this year from Legendary Pictures? I am. I'm like a girl at a Beatles concert. I I want to <laughs> scream and then faint. Um, that's how excited I am. And unfortunately, good question. Unfortunately, it's called Godzilla versus Kong, and usually the first that's name true. is the good guy. Um, I am a King Kong fan. King mm -hmm. Kong. I do like Godzilla. Yep. There was there was you know a a a, a deleted line from Pulp Fiction when uh, Uma Thurman asked John Travolta, "says Are you a Beatles man or are you an Elvis man?" And he says, "Well, tell me the difference." Well, a Beatles man can like Elvis, and an Elvis man can like the Beatles, but you're only one. I'm a King Kong guy. I like Godzilla. I love Godzilla, but I'm a King Kong man. So super yeah, I, excited. I, I wonder how they're going to address this. I, I've heard rumors that, that they're going to speak to different powers that the Skull Island has afforded Kong that we haven't seen yet. But uh, the fact that they had shown us the atomic breath for Godzilla seemed to make this fight a very disparate fight. So I'm hoping that we haven't seen something that Kong's got. Mm -hmm that will even up that part of the fight. I, I do think, I mean, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna. Um, I think that, well, <clears throat> it's, have, have you seen, have you seen the, the, the toy leak? It's been, out, it's been out for a long time. No, I have not. Well, there's, there's a toy in which Kong has a huge weapon. Okay. And, and, a, a, you know, a, a bludgeoning weapon. Mm -hmm. And, um, that would work. 
Yeah, that would work. But the th and and there's there's other things. I think that there there's going to be other monsters, and I think they're going to team up and beat the other monsters. The, the 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 filmmaker said there is a definitive winner, but he doesn't say between Kong and Godzilla there's a definitive winner. Well, he says there is there is a definitive winner, right, Josh? You heard that too. And I'm I'm okay with that as long as uh, I right. heard. Oh, I heard that. What I heard was was third hand. Was it was like some think more like Batman v Superman, where you know they're like. They're fighting each other for a while until a larger menace appears, and then they and then that's what the actual end of the movie is. That's what I've heard. So. Yeah, that's I that's what I want. I kind of want. I like to see it. Uh, although I, I I'll be watching it from my going to. But. Yeah, that that's that's I what I want. I don't want to be surprised I when I see it. <laughs> right. I don't want to. I don't want a winner between Godzilla and Kong, um, because it would because. I feel like better. The, uh, you don't want to like original one where I think God. No, 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 no. Godzilla did not win in the original, original Godzilla version. No, like they that. both they both fight and they both end up underwater and then only Kong emerges. That's but I, mean. I haven't seen thirty years. Right, but but the, but the implication is because since Godzilla is also also amphibious. Godzilla just swam away, you know, and they both were like, ah, oh, the, the heck with this. I'm getting out of here. And they, you know, and that's what happened. But they both emerge in the water and only Kong comes out. So to seven year old Alex, King Kong wins. But, uh, you know, okay. older, mature Alex, it's like, okay, they realized that fighting wasn't the answer at the end there. And then Godzilla swims away and King Kong comes out of the water. I always kind of think of those two creatures as like mm -hmm. the typical like male rivalries where they will fight, but there doesn't need to be a true winner, just a territory drawn. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I, I like how I like how you put that. Mm. Tokyo's mine. New York's yours. It's all right. good. Okay. Good. Yeah, we're all good. You know, th this town is big enough for I'm the two. Have skull all right. So let's talk about Dragon Whisperer. I just popped up. One of your biggest fans is uh john p's son <laughs> oh my gosh he's been wonderful he has been wonderful he has he and his son have done reviews for dragon whisper video reviews this dad is like he wins the dad award because he like i don't know if you said you saw his like birthday that he was preparing for his son i mean it was a comic extravaganza i sent him posters for dragon whisperer um they've been wonderful and and uh, thank you so much, John. Thank you so much. That that just keeps us going when we hear about, especially kids, liking it. You know, it's like there's there's hope, and it makes us feel good. And you know, kids kids are the, the most uh, honest critics, as we all know. All especially us parents. I mean, they like something, they like it. But if they don't, forget it. And you know, they'll just they'll go on to the next thing. So that was wonderful. It was wonderful to hear that. I love seeing. Uh john with his son i just see him pouring into his son um he gives him time which is what every kid really craves it doesn't matter what the time is doing but that he, he gives him that time and he's pouring into him the love of reading and of the medium of comic books he's he's doing dad right oh yeah definitely definitely hey thanks john thanks <laughs> And I just saw I just saw a team team Gamera, that was pretty sure. funny. Yeah, there we go. See team Gamera. So he's like, you know, I forget this Godzilla Kong stuff. I love Gamera. <laughs> there, there are some some uh, some really cool kaiju we haven't got to see yet that um, they they can spread this out for a long time and have them revealed. But yeah, there's some there are some really crazy uh, figures that I've collected over the years, and I'm like, you know, when's Jet Jaguar show up? And <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about Dragon Whisper. Right. Is Dragon Whisper the first comic book that you created, or do you have a long history in creation? It is actually my the first comic book of my creation that has been published. Yes, I have written other comics here and there um, throughout the decades, but Dragon Whisper is my first creator-owned 
comic that, that I wrote, and I also lettered it, um, there was there was a very small door that opened for me to a bigger world that I'm going to thank Jimmy Robinson, Jimmy Robinson of Bomb Queen, Jimmy Robinson of um, The Empty, Jimmy Robinson of Cyberzone. In the early 90s, all of us, we all, when, when uh, Comic-Con was a lot smaller, we all hung out, and I wanted to write comics, and Jimmy, and Jimmy said, do you want to write an issue of Cyberzone? I'm like, yeah and and um it was the one and only time another creator ever, ever did anything on a jimmy robinson book jimmy robinson's an auteur he does everything right pencil ink color and letters everything and it was the only time he ever did it and i wrote one issue and um and and because jimmy robinson later went into like bigger and better things i mean you know uh image comics and he wrote a wolverine series for marvel that one door I, the amount of mileage I was able to get off that one thing um, got me into Comic Con every year, and so thank you, Jimmy Robinson. Thank you for that opportunity. I I owe you everything in in comics. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have this conversation. But Dragon Whisper is my my first creator owned uh, book that um, is is mine and. Um, how it started it started as a different incarnation in about 2007 and then uh it was very different it, it wasn't steampunk it was much more treasure island ish and um and then i submitted it here and there and i just got a few nibbles um and then one company was just on the verge we're gonna have a meeting about it and, says, and it's a pass i'm like all right so then that lapsed and then in 2017 i saw those pages again i want to i want to revive this but i want to completely make it different so i had like five sample pages and what i did was i changed the story around it and because these are all treasure island and they look more uh classics illustrated i made that sequence a flashback sequence of hundreds and hundreds of years ago and then um I wrote around it, so I completely changed the characters. I changed a lot of things. I made it a steampunk thing, and um, I like steampunk. I, I'm uh, I'm not in that world or the subculture, but I think it's beautiful, and um, so I decided to make it that. I made the character uh, a young woman. That was a young boy at the beginning in 2007, but I made it a young woman. I made her ethnically diverse because um, I'm only one ethnicity. I'm Italian. My parents are from Italy. Um, I'm just I'm just Italian, and uh, while I'm very happy and proud of that, I've always been sort of envious about people saying, "Oh, I'm a mix. I have this. I have a little bit of of Native American in me. I have a little bit of African in me. I have a little bit of Japanese in me." I've I've always been so interested in people with such a mix in their in their blood they can call on so many cultures of who they were so that's i wrote a character that that had that that was that was a mix and um and then i went on uh deviant art and then i uh i looked i looked at my parameters and then i got a couple hits of, of two artists that i like and i emailed them both and the artist that got back to me first was glenn fernandez and i said you want to make a comic i'll pay you writers if you want to do a comic and you can't draw find an artist and pay them end of story end of story you will get the best results um i found the artist and, and we hit it off and um and i knew that submitting the more material that a publisher had the better the chances so i had five good pages and i submitted and a lot of publishers said it's good can i see a little bit more i'm like mm, that gets expensive but okay then i finished i said okay i'm just gonna go nuts i finished an entire issue and then i submitted to publishers and i got a lot of bites I got a lot of bites and I was very blessed to be able to pick and choose. And the way I met the guys at Red Five was at conventions. I saw their table and, you know, if, if, if what Red Five really knows how to make a good presentation, their booth was great. They, they knew how to lay things out. They had the posters right. They had the books laying out perfectly. There was, they, they, they epitomized show don't tell. And they had their, their 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 table was covered with books. It wasn't like a blank a blank table with a guy sitting there. It was covered with books that you know you can completely go nuts. And you know, I, it's like wow, they really have good books. I mean, and there's 
little to no superhero. Not that, not that I have nothing against superheroes, but I wanted to see something different. And you see something different with Red 5. And I, I consider Red 5 the Christopher Nolan of publishers. They don't do bad books. Everything they do is great. So um, I submitted Cold to Red 5. And then uh, I, 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 I almost fainted again when I got the email from Josh. And they said, we really like Dragon Whisperer. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like great. And then, and then there was a lot of back and forth, the, the business side of things. And then a year later, and, and I said, before we do any, before anything's released, I finished the entire series. And then, and then, and then March of 2020, everything was ready. We were ready to go live. I was, I had all these comic shop signings all ready to go. I had my tickets for all the conventions, March, 2020. What happened around March of 2020? Mm. Yeah. Not so nice. all of that went to nothing, but the comic still came out and I'm still very happy about that. I don't. I mean, I'm sure it would have been even more successful if it had gotten in front of convention crowds. But yeah. uh, I, I don't think it, at least for, in my experience, for live sales and yeah. for live selling in this shop, it did not, it, it did not suffer. I had to order many times over. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy with that. So, um, uh, Joshua, how did you, how do you choose when things come into your office? How do you choose? Like when Alex... Alex's project shows up. What about Alex's project made you say this? It's going to be simple. Uh, for me, it's just, uh, it's the story, um, the story first, and then, uh, and then, and then the art. Uh, there have been a couple of books that I really, really liked the story and the writing and the, and the art wasn't quite there. And we had to say, we had to say no to it. Um, but for the, for me, for the first part, it's like, okay, who, who's the character? Um, do I like this character or interesting things happening to what's this, what's the world that this character is living in? And, uh, and then especially, um, kind of in the, in the nature of it as a medium, you can, you can get by with okay dialogue, but I, I like good dialogue. So then for me, it was also like, oh, is the, is the dialogue good? Is it, can I tell? characters apart from each other does each one have a distinct personality and, and does it just reach me and I, I kind of uh, it's you know if the the character and stories are there that's the first thing I look for and if they're there uh, and I really like them I'm um, uh, I'm going to try and find uh, a way to make it so you know I just I read the first issue of Dragon Spur and I really liked it so I said I reached out back to Alex and said oh yeah this is good uh, it's really just what I <laughs> what I think is good if I read it like this is good I'm gonna couple, I'm gonna go on and that and that can be um, robots from from uh, from Tesla, or that can be Dragon Whisper, or it can be um, pilots coming th through a, a riff from the 1940s. You know, but if I read it and I go, "Yeah, this is good," then I'm like, "All right, let's let's find something." And, and I'm glad Alex <laughs> and, like, oh. and, uh, and uh, I didn't realize how much he'd gone through with other publishers, but I just I like it. Way I'm going to want to do something with it. Me too. I'm glad I went the route that I and, went. You know type of genre or type of book comedy. you know we don't do much in superhero uh, it's like it's not that i would say no to anyone who brought a superhero thing but we we do intentionally try not to do much in the way of superhero but beyond that um you know genre books or, or art books it doesn't you know i'm not i'm not it's, i'm not sitting here going like only horror books in you know with a vibe from the 80s or only sci-fi action adventure books nothing against those because i like those kinds of things but i, I like it can't be steampunk um kind of uh, all ages book with a young girl chasing after you know a dragon or it can be big strange um hallucinogenic art book from from 70s underground comics that tells a a, a weird tale of the evolution of mankind or it can be yeah fun um sci-fi cop adventure with cop in the 20th century fighting off aliens you know um, I like all of that stuff. And uh, so if it's something that I, you know, there's probably no way I can, I can create, create like the di the weird Venn diagram of all the different kinds of comics I like, but I, well, I'll read something and if I, I like, I'll know right away, I like this. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it can be from almost anywhere. So, so I like Dragon's Per Rabbit, right? like, yeah, got to do it. So I don't know why anybody else said no fan. to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 
So I'm a big fan of Spook, your first awesome series at Red 5. But uh, I want to know about the <laughs> box as we've got about four yeah. more minutes. Hook them all up. All right. What's really Spook is my second series. My first series is not done. I started working on like a decade ago and it's still not finished, but that's a that's a longer and much, much sadder story. Um, but the box is something that um, I've been seeing in my head for almost as long as Spook has, and it's been kind of sitting there waiting for me to sit down and actually write it. And it is a, uh, it's sort of modern, my take on the modern, um, you know, film noir, private eye story set in the person but with a, a, a supernatural twist. You have uh, this private eye, Leo Bloom, who somewhere in his travels, he has found that, that you can reach into it and take out uh, whatever you want out of it. Now, sometimes it, it works for him better than other times. Sometimes it gives him what it thinks he wants or what it did not necessarily have been what he wanted. And sometimes it gives him nothing. The box has very much a mind of its own, but uh, it's a, it, he uses it to crack the uncrackable cases and to uh, really make, he makes his uh, a lot easier edge that makes him um, a better detective than anyone else and has people coming in knocking his door down for work. But uh, it's also um, um, a magic artifact with a lot of power uh, that's been around for a long time. And as he, he learns uh, to his dismay, there's a lot of people uh, who want it and will do anything to get it. And uh, he's got to decide whether it's worth the trouble of keeping it around and, or whether he should just get rid of it and um, get rid of that problem. The problem is that all the people who want it are very bad people. and uh, and. Uh, there's no telling what they would do with it if they had it. So it's like that age old. Uh, I very much think Sam Spade cost with like Magic Box. Old, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like the cautionary tale of the genie, right? The genie is its own kind of being with its own agenda. The box yes. sounds like it's like that. Right, very much so. A and nobody, nobody entirely knows what that agenda is. And part of the story also is he, not to say part of the story is he finding out more and more about that agenda as he goes along and really, really didn't really know what this thing was all this time. And uh, suddenly it's a lot more sinister than, than I thought it was. That sounds so cool. All right, we just have a minute left. Everybody, uh, we've got the socials scrolling along the bottom, but go ahead and share anything else that you want everyone to know, what your next project is, what they could look for from you. Working on the next volume of Dragon Whisperer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fast. Do it fast. I, I, I want to see that next volume. Okay. Um, the box will be out uh, in summer, um, or August. We're still, still targeting on that particular that particular month. Um, and then I'm already working on a a, a project right behind that, that hopefully I'll be able to announce very soon. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have our great World War II comic, uh, White Lily. Uh, it's going to be, issue one is going to be uh, reaching stands in about three weeks, about the greatest female fighter pilot ever lived that most people don't know about. Uh, and then later this year, um, you will also be able to see Verge, a uh, fantastic, strange um, sci-fi adventure from a, a young TV writer uh, named Bryce McKellen about a, a city in the future where everyone from all time periods throughout history lives within the city at the same time. You got cavemen and Vikings and samurai and whatnot are all living in the same place. And, uh, you have a special police force that has to uh, keep them from, from killing each other and keep the, the city at peace. Um, so you can look for all of that uh, 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 this year from uh, Red Five. Perfect. Thank you Plus guys more so much for your time great announcements. and coming Hopefully be so coming early out in, the morning. in the next couple of weeks. We'll see you guys. We'll have you guys back again when we have a when new project things to talk about. When Dragon Whisperer hits, we'll have uh, Alex back on. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank see you. you see you next time.
That was an excellent, excellent early morning get together with our friends from Red Five. Thank you so much for being being willing to get up so early. Wow, crack of dawn. It's been a long three days and everyone's still trucking. It's so exciting, every single panel. Um, I am super excited for this next one. Uh, thank you for joining us again on the comic book shopping experience, also known as the experience or the EXP. This is now Drew Zucker. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much for uh, making time in your day for us. I know that this is a nice holiday day and we're, we're horning in on family time. So apologize for that. Uh, it's all good. It's, it's just, it's work time. <laughs> That's true. There, there, yeah. are no, there are no days off in comics. I agree with this. This is the truth. <laughs> so how, how is everything in your neck of the woods? It's good. It's, uh, it's cold here. Although it, it can't make up its mind. It's either 50 or it's 30. So, Those are both terribly okay. cold. Hmm? Those are both terribly cold. I'm in Texas and we like start, you know, bringing out the heavy coats when it becomes 50. So, <laughs> well, you guys got snow. So I assume the world is ending. Well, uh, to keep in mind, Texas is this giant place. So I think Dallas got snow and we're maybe three hours away. Okay. We're in Houston. We never get snow. It takes about 13 hours to get out of our state. <laughs> It's own little country. Yes. <laughs> James, Mike James says he likes their Batman in the background here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, I like to kind of get into the, the weeds of people's like, you know, how they got into the fandom they're in. Have you always been a comic book person like from young age or something you came upon later on in life? I was... I was always a comic book kid. I wasn't one of those uh, people that read it all the time. Uh, my, I would occasionally like get them as like a reward for being good. And then I remember specifically when I was younger, uh, I went to Barnes and Noble and I stumbled across uh, Dark Empire as a trade. And I didn't understand, you know, the difference between periodical and trade. Mm -hmm. So really dark empire was kind of like my first major introduction into comics when i was a kid and then as i got older i fell away from it and i went to college and i i wanted to go for toy design and ended up uh kind of reigniting my love of drawing and just stuck around in the sequential department and that that around that time when i was a freshman sophomore is what really drove me back into kind of my modern love of comics. So are we talking about the Dark Empire, the Star Wars storyline? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I really, are you like me? Would you like to see them play that out somehow on the screen? Very much so. <laughs> I would like to see Dark Empire, Dark Empire to an heir to the Empire. That's all mm -hmm. I want. And for me, the, the art that Cam Kennedy did in that book just it still blows my mind like you go back you look at it and yeah it's got its own little like funky style to it and it's definitely a product of its error in the way it's written but you can't beat the the technical level of just how those spaceships are drawn yeah the the concept of having a cloned emperor and you know the the purposeful going over to the dark side of luke but you know mm -hmm. you know that temptation of doing it and then being in it and then feeling that power, like how that yeah. tears at your soul, how do you come back from there when you've actually used that power? That's the, the reason why the, the dark side of the force has any draw at all but on its surface. Why would you use it? If you knew what it was going to do to you and you knew right. that it was bad, it has to give you something. It has to give you something. Right. That power. I, I just love that every that all of the expanded universe is really like prior to Disney was born out of those three series Thrawn's Thrawn's in there. Uh, Jason and Jana are in there. Uh, the Han Leia relationship is in there. Luke Luke's beginning of the new Jedi is in there. It, it's amazing how much even in the Disney era of star Wars is traceable back to those three series. Yeah, I, I'm 
I knew when Disney said they weren't going to use any of the extra canon stuff that I wasn't going to get to see it, but I still, there were little things that they gave us that I think they were saying, we hear you, we know that you like the extra canon, so we're going to give you a little something, but we're not going there. Like when they gave us the teaser for um, the newer movies where you see Luke standing on the precipice of the island that he used as his a Jedi training academy, and you see that stone that's sitting there that looks like a tombstone. Yeah. You think to yourself, that's Mara Jade's. Right. They never address it, but I know that's what it is. And if they ever tell me that it's not, I'm going to say you're a liar and a darn liar. That's where <laughs> she's buried. I, there, there are, there's a ton of stuff in there from that series, which is, it, it's great. You know, and I, I like that that series, even when I was younger, as I've come back to it as an adult, that it, there's just, it still holds up for me. Mm hmm. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm still a little heartbroken that they didn't go back to the Han trilogy and use that for their source material for Solo. Although yeah. Solo is amazing, I really wanted to. This is this is the entire scene that I wanted to see from that. All the rest of it they could have changed. I wanted to see the part in the book where they describe that they have them all in formation as as part of the Empire uh, and, and marching in formation at the edge of this cliff, and that they would on purpose just for training not call the turn and have people walk off the edge to prove that they would still follow the empire to their deaths. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that on the screen. Cause I was like, that will show you how evil the empire is. Yeah. That, that, that would have been fun. Crazy. Oh, alas. All right. So, um, Canto has a huge following. It is such an amazingly drawn world. It's a, such a unique character and motivation for him. How Was this something that you had been tossing around in your brain forever? Was it inspiration that happened right before you started right, the creation process for art? Did you work together on the creation for the story? Or is this something that was born uh, 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 just from the writer? How did this come about? So the, the original design for Canto... I had done about, uh, when was it? Around 2013. I had done, I had done it as like a, as a drawing for myself. It was done as a challenge to myself to see if I could do something a little more cutesy than what I'd normally do. I did it. I really loved it. And I had an idea of how to do the story. And the story was always a combination of Dante's Inferno and the Wizard of Oz. So that tagline that we've been using from the get-go was always attached to the character. Mm -hmm. I ended up throwing it in a drawer because I was doing, uh, I was doing the house at the time. And then the David had approached me about doing a different project. And I didn't have time to do it because uh, we were wrapping up. So when we were done, I re-approached him and I said to him, hey, I have this idea. So I sent him a picture, the drawing of Canto, along with like a paragraph of what the the story was. And his response almost immediately was, yes, we're doing this. I'm a huge Wizard of Oz fan. I know, I know exactly what I want to do with it. So my original version uh, didn't involve the, the girlfriend. And it wasn't, uh, it was a much more... I'd say structurally, structurally followed Inferno than, than David's version of it. David came in and really kind of gave Canto a character beyond my version, which was he, he wanted, he was searching for his humanity. So David took that and made it, well, he's not searching necessarily for his humanity. He's searching to, to give everyone else around him humanity. And then from there, he took a lot of what I had and massaged it into a more palatable version of the story that we got. And that, that's really where this all came from. So it, it started with me. He came in, put his spin on it. And then everything ever since then, it's just kind of been a back and forth with us. So the character, the main character himself, is he, um, is he, inspired by anyone in your life is he fully realized as his own character just based on the idea you needed someone to walk that journey 
Hey, he he's not like based on anyone in my life. I think he's kind of an idealized version of you know the people I've looked up to. Um, I, I've spent my life surrounded, you know, working in emergency services. I've I've seen the absolute best of people. I've seen the worst of people. Uh, you know, but the the guys who who were very senior to me when I came in and kind of guided me through because I was 18 when I started. You know, I, 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 you know, stood on the shoulders of giants to me. And I think Canto kind of represents subconsciously for me that, that idealized hero. And also given the state of the world, I more now than ever see the value in that character for, you know, other people. And, you know, while, most people are kind of content to kill each other at the moment. David and I are both big believers in put out into the world what you want the world to be. And that's part of what Canto is. Yeah, I agree. It's a, a personal journey for Canto, like the the journey to go and to retrieve what is lost, but it's the, the benefit is not just for his, him, himself. Right. The, there, there's a saying for us that, that in my line of work is that you always want to leave the job better than you found it. And that's part of Canto is that he's looking to make the world better than how he found it. Mm -hmm. Walk me through the design of the character's look. How did you decide on his final look? He originally was semi based off of, uh, off of the proportions around a Funko pop almost. The idea was to give him was to was to work in the Tin Man design into a more uh, into something that that wasn't human, but that could obviously because his face doesn't have facial features necessarily. How do you design a face that from every angle that you set it at, you can effectively change the emotion that you're seeing so that grill was really designed that if I look down at certain angles, you can make him look angry. If you look up at certain angles, he might look like he's smiling. A lot of that emotion is translated through the eyes, but it was really a matter of, let me try and design something that is interesting in silhouette, but that I can draw 10,000 times and still make it interesting. Yeah, because he's, he's obviously a character you have to take serious. Seriously, but he here's the this is my favorite cover, by the way. It's uh when he's you know underwater um, and all looks hope all looks lost. That that to me is just like it pulls at my heartstrings. The second series. It, <laughs> it 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 helps that he's tiny. Like the Dave and I have talked about this extensively that we, we think part of the appeal of him is that he is very plucky and, you know, he'll kind of like puff out his chest sometimes and, you know, do the right thing. But the reality is that he's three feet tall. <laughs> he's three, he's three, he, he's a hobbit, basically. He, he's, he's three feet tall in a much bigger world than him. And it's a world that for the most part of his life was bigger than him and ground him down. So to have him three feet tall and now deciding to stand up to the world, I think is something that just as on a character level makes him endearing. Absolutely. And probably for the audience a little bit, you can, you can say, okay, well, if this little creature can have, you know, we can look at the, all the situations that are impossible around him and say, he's just going to keep on going. Then what I'm facing doesn't seem so big. Right. And, and that's been, one of the the best parts about doing this book was that we always said we wanted the book to be an all ages book and not to take that connotation that tends to come with that in comics all ages tends to get kind of a you know foo foo go away it's for kids sort of thing the reality is that going back to our original conversation star wars is an all ages uh franchise most of us discover Star Wars at a very young age and then stick with it growing up. Canto's kind of the same thing. If you're nine or 10, 
you can read it and have a very base understanding of what's happening in the book and you can take away from it what you will. But that doesn't mean that we're pandering down to kids because we want adults to enjoy this just as much. So when we get messages from people saying that, you know, they're reading it with their kids and, you know, their kids are now hooked on comics, that's the best thing in the world for us because that's exactly what we set out to do. Yeah, it also helps uh, to have an approachable book that can be handed to pretty much anybody that walks in. It's very unassuming. So mm -hmm. for somebody that's uh, very uncomic and they don't know where to start, and they're, you know, the you know, superheroes can be intimidating because they have oh, yeah. history behind them. They're like, how do I pick up a Batman book? Does that mean I have to go back and find, you know, his a first appearance in Detective 17? Like, I'm sorry, that's not right. really going to happen for you. You have to, you know, you have to leap in with, you know, faith into a storyline. It's, it's so much, it's very uh, wonderful to be able to have something that I, I can hand to anybody and say, I, I do this often, but that you can bring it back if you don't like it. And I, and that I know in my heart, they're never bringing that book back. Right. Canto is one of those books I can always hand to people and say, just, just try this. You'll like this. Mm -hmm. I promise. So that, that one, that makes me very happy to hear, <laughs> but also they, that was, that was a hundred percent an intentional move on our part was we wanted to make something that would help the shops. A hundred percent. The book was designed from the ground up to be an easy sell for the shops to across a range of ages, especially to try and bring in new readership that would stick around for a little bit. You know, we, we wanted, we want to make the industry, you know, bigger and stronger because we believe in it. And the shops are obviously the lifeblood of that. So from our end, we wanted a book for them that would be an easy sell. And I know you can never know this truly going in when you present a, a project to be published and go out on the stands. You can't ever say, well, I know a first series is going to be successful. So we've planned a second series, but did you always have a second arc in mind for the character? Yeah, we, we did. We, we always had a rough outline beyond volume one. Uh, and obviously, if volume one didn't, you know, wasn't successful, I think you can, there's threads in there that were obviously picked up in volume two. But I, I think that volume one ends in a way that you can, if this had been unsuccessful, fine. You can read it, get a full story and be totally happy with where this ends. But we always, we always had a plan of where we were going with this. And a huge part of that is that we had decided, even if no publisher came along, we believed in this enough on our own that we would have done it ourselves. But we, we personally are very happy that IDW came along because Kickstarters are a lot of work and IDW has put a lot of, a lot of weight behind us. They're a really great company. I, I really enjoy all of the titles that they put out. Um, it, so we're getting to the we're getting to the end or a finished second arc. Is there a third arc in plans? Yeah. So we last week I think we in, uh, we announced with IDW, uh, Canto's been picked up for three new series. So there's going to be uh, in the spring a another mini series, uh, basically an expanded version of Clockwork Fairies, as far as uh, setup, uh, called the City of Giants. Uh, that one I will be taking a break from for art duties. I am doing the one in 10 incentive covers for that, but that one will be written by David and Sebastian Priz is uh, stepping in to do artwork for three issues. After that, in the summer, uh, I will be back on art for uh, Canto 3 Lionhearted. And then in 2022, we're going to have Canto for A Place Like Home. And Canto 4 will be the uh, conclusion of the story. So where will our viewers uh, know Sebastian's work from? Uh, Sebastian is all over Twitter. He is constantly putting out like these amazing Star Wars drawings and these like he, whatever he's drawing for the day. So actually his Twitter is, I'll tell you right now, because you should follow him because he is excellent. 
<laughs> and his his daily drawings make me very happy. Oh, Sebastian. Da, 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 da. So he is Sebastian at Sebastian Priz. And that, yeah, just at Sebastian Priz. Uh, you can find him on Twitter. And his stuff is just, it, it's really, it's great. If you're not following him, you should be. I might be. I follow, I'm following a lot of people so that I can know all the things. <laughs> yeah. But, but Sebastian stepped in and really, he's, he's done a, a great job. You know, because we, it, it's hard to step into that role and to take over uh, on something that David and I are both rightfully very proud of and a little precious of. It, it's our, it's our kid, and he, he totally, he totally gets that, and he's, he's been working his butt off, and I, I, I think people are going to be excited when they see what he's doing. So we mentioned, you mentioned the house earlier. Yes. A lot of people won't know what that is, and I know that I love it. Explain that. So the the house is a World War II haunted house story that was written by Philip Seavey uh, and with art by me and letters by uh, Jen Hickman and letters by Frank. I, Frank, I apologize, Frank Savotikik. I, I can never pronounce his last name. I, I'm sorry, Frank. Don't Don't kill me. Um, but it's a book that Philip and I worked on for a number of years. We ended up kickstarting it. It had a successful Kickstarter. And for the last three years, we have just been hand selling this book to everyone at conventions, shops, and it has continued to have just a small, but very popular fan base among it. It's got a really awesome pitch. It's it's easy as a shop owner to be able to hand the book to somebody and tell them when it's set, but then tell them that it's horror you know, about people having a camp down in this house and it doesn't go well. It's yeah. a bunch of supernatural horror. So I'll just give the pitch for anyone that hasn't heard of it. It's about a group of U.S. soldiers during World War II uh, who, during the Battle of the Bulge, get lost in the woods uh, during a snowstorm and they stumble across a house that has no business being where it is. And it makes no sense that it's there, but they decide to take shelter in it. And once they're inside, all sorts of horrendous shenanigans ensue. And it, you know, it, you can kind of take it from there, uh, how this plays out. But it's really a love letter uh, from me and Philip to, you know, stuff like Alien and uh, and uh, The Shining. Oh, yeah. It's it's a beautifully drawn book. It's truly terrifying. And if you're a fan of horror at all, you should absolutely get into it. You don't have to be a fan of, uh, you know, period pieces, because even though it's yeah. in the, during wartime, that's not really the, the point of it. The, the way I describe it is that the World War II setting is incidental to the story it's there to just drive the story so what was the inspiration for the story because it just seems like a crazy thing that that story was me exercising my own problems uh <laughs> i'll fully admit that uh, it, it's it's a really personal story for me in terms of me kind of working through my own stuff uh and simultaneously it's really a pay on to Alien and my love for that movie and how Alien was not the first movie to go and do this sort of thing, but it, it did it so well that it was undeniable. It's debatable if we did it that well to reach that level, but that was really, you know, that was the goal with it. And then, you know, when we really committed into it, uh, Lock and Key was a huge inspiration for it because I finished Lock and Key and basically sat there and said, huh, that's the kind of stuff I want to do. I, these are the stories I want to tell. And I realized, oh, I have one of these stories. I can go and finish this. 
So that book was kickstarted, correct? Is not with a publisher? No, that that book was kickstarted 100%. Would you be open to a publisher trying to grab that up? Because it seems uh, that they haven't. Y yeah, we, we would be, uh, 100%. Publishers, you need to totally pick up the house <laughs> and get that pr in print because it would sell a lot of copies because it's a, a really quality product. So it, 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 it has been doing the Kickstarter was was extremely hard and there was a lot of our own money put up front for that. But I can say the amount that you end up learning having to having to work everything out for yourself and deal with the retailers directly and just hand sell that product you learn so much from it like it just it can't be understated the amount of knowledge you pick up well the work you put into it uh, as a kickstarter and in social media obviously had paid off because i had quite mm -hmm. a lot of people see it on uh, our store racks and say Oh, I always meant to pick this up, so I'm glad it's sitting in front of me. So yeah, a lot of those that got picked up because people had heard about it, but just hadn't had a chance to pick it up that way. Yeah, no, and that that's been the hardest part is that the shops that do carry it, they we hear from all of them the same thing. Oh, I ordered ten of them; they were gone in an hour because it is an easy pitch to people. Um, you know, we're we're hoping that if we can get it out to all the shops that that will help to, you know, just grow its, grow its base even more. Absolutely. All right. We, we, we have to address the monster in the room of Batman because it's clear that Batman is an influence or at least a love of yours. Is it a, a particular writer? Is it the art? Is it the character themselves? What do you love? So that book blew my mind when I first read it and changed my entire life. And then that one was really my my kind of suck back into comics post college. Okay. Um, I had really been, uh, you know, I was I was working around at the time, and I was reading stuff. But a lot of the way I read comics isn't in uh, monthlies or in periodical, really. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a trade guy because I jump around so much and I, I dig backwards quite a bit. So when, uh, Court of Owls started, that was the first time I started really reading monthly and Court of Owls was just like, I, I didn't know Batman could be this, uh, in particular when they got to that fifth issue and it does the, uh, the rotating, I was sitting on the train reading it and just. <laughs> oh, good. I, I'm losing. I think I'm losing my mind. <laughs> so, you know, for me, Long Halloween was really the the struggle. I I saw the promise of what this of the level of storytelling that you could hit and how large it could be. And then Court of Owls showed me what you could actually do with that medium. And that's what really kind of, so for, for me, they're, they're both, you know, kind of seminal works and, and very personal and important to me. And, and then I've just got a print that, uh, I was lucky enough to have, uh, Greg Capullo sign. Oh, James Benhouse is in the room from Night Owl Society. And he says it might be the best thing to come out of the new 52. It, it, it is w without a doubt because everything from it survived into everything they've done going forward. Nothing else is surviving. This is true. They're they're overriding a great many things with, uh, you know, like death metal and dark dark nights metal. Stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 it's one of those things that like in continuity, like even when things don't make sense, they're still, they're keeping them because they're worth, they're worthy things to keep around. Uh, and, you know, you see it in Court of Owls, as a as a you know as a multimedia property that it keeps popping up in places you know and credit to snyder he did something new with a character that's 80 years old that everyone is like oh there's nothing new to do with it and he he turned the entire thing on its head so um did you get to read any of the tom king run yet no i i i started it and it just I, I couldn't find my way into it. 
Uh, I'll probably give it another shot down the road. Uh, but it, it wasn't grabbing me at the time when I started it. it I, I sometimes get into moods where if I'm reading something and it's just, I'm not feeling it, I'll put it down and come back to it in a, you know, a couple months when maybe I'm in a different headspace for it. Uh, right now I'm sucked into East of West and it's just, that book is crazy. <laughs> So did you get did you get as far as uh, like I am suicide, which is the big bane focus part of the run, or or joke of jokes and riddles? Riddles? No, I didn't get that far. I got into uh, I read the first volume of it. Okay. So Gotham, Gotham Girl, and Gotham Man, I think. Yeah, it gets the it gets um pretty intense. Yeah, right? I've I've heard. Give another chance. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I from what I've seen of it, I'm I'm super into it, and you know, art wise, I was like, I was a big fan of who who was on that book, you know, between between Mitch and uh, Mitch and everyone else, it's like, ooh, so, they're, they're throwing down. So someone's talking about the Robert Pattinson movie, and I'm going to ask the question in a different way than they're asking it. Um, they've been releasing kind of like this person's going to play this bad guy part. This person's going to play this bad guy part. So we've gotten a bunch of villain names and associated people to play them for the Pattinson. Uh, mm -hmm. And people are throwing out around what storyline they think we're going to be seeing. Do What do you think it might be? Are we going to see the long Halloween where they go? What are they headed for? Uh, so to answer the question, yes, I am extremely excited for it because I am a huge Matt, huge Matt Reeves fan. And uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes was a hell of an experience to have the first time I watched it. Um, I am a huge believer in you cast who's right, not who people perceive to be right. I am one of the only people I know that was excited for Heath Ledger pro when he was cast because I saw, I, I knew him from uh, 10 Things I Hate About You. And that was actually, you know, when I went back and rewatched it, I was like, that guy's going to be a great joker you know it's not the obvious choice but you can see how smart he is so i think the casting for what they've done from i know most of these people and their work and it's you know you'll get something good out of them it may not be what you're used to but if you only ever got what you wanted you you'd never be happy with it you'd never be surprised and you'd never get anything new um as far as what I think they're doing, that trailer, I think, is actually points to Court of Owls. Ooh. Yes. Um, I think it's, they're set, I think they're pulling from a lot of different areas. And actually where I think they may be pulling from the hardest might be Telltale. Oh, man. Um, there's a lot of elements in there that reminded me of Telltale. Um, but there are, there are a few lines here and there that I'm, they give me court of Owl court of Owl vibes. I don't think it'll show up in this movie. I think this movie is going to be a little more straightforward to establish, you know, what they're doing with it. But I really got a sense that there's a bigger picture just from that trailer. Oh yeah. Right. And it, it, it looks phenomenal. But just the way it's shot is is really is really awesome. It, it looks like seven. All right, so you're giving advice to somebody who's never read Batman, which just kind of seems like that can't can't be possible. But let's say this person exists in the world. Um, where would you, as a fan of Batman, where would you point them to first? I send them to Long Halloween or uh, Court of Owls. Mm -hmm. uh, I would send them to Year One. Year One is. Uh, to me, year one is while it's the beginning, it it requires you to have an appreciation before you really dig into it. Especially because I would argue Mazzucchelli is one of you know behind Will Eisner as probably one of the best visual storytellers mm -hmm. to ever come into comics. But I will also fully admit that that work is not the traditional mainstream work. Um, I, I personally think if you're looking at stuff for people outside of comics who need a digestible visual style, 
Uh, I actually think Court of Alice is probably the best place to send them. It's interesting, but when I see people that come in that they're buying for somebody else, <clears throat> they've usually been sent for either the Killing Joke or Hush, which makes sense. Hush is good too. Hush is good. I, I don't I don't point anyone really to the Killing Joke. Um, it, it's too much. It's too much. It requires you to have context of stuff, and it's you know an unpopular opinion i i don't really put the killing joke even in like my top five batman stories it's really good and it's like a phenomenally crafted book but to me it it is a it's a snapshot of a story not not the the whole thing um you mentioned east of west earlier um did you is are you in for the long haul or did you start how far are you in? I am halfway through year two. Wow. You've gone pretty far. Yeah. It, 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 it's good at sucking you in. Um, I, I think it's Hickman at his absolute best of doing all the things that he does really well. So I have not delved into the universe of East of West, although I know that it's a, a huge seller. I just haven't found the time. I don't do very well just kind of like reading a bit of something. I know I have mm -hmm. to read all of it. What is the basic storyline? Let me think if I can find a real quick way to describe this. It, it's sort of alternate timeline America where – America has been divvied up between like sort of civil war factions still exist. So there's the union, the endless nation and the house of Mao. And basically there is a prophecy of the apocalypse and the book follows the, the, the faction, the human factions as the faction of the apocalypse begins to come into, into existence. And it's really about how, how these factions are all interacting with each other as this looming threat of the end of the world is approaching. So it's not post-apocalyptic, but just, just ahead of it coming down. Yeah, it, it's, it's weird. It's hard to explain without giving too much of it away, but it's, it's dystopian. It's hard to say if it's dystopian or how much of this is just, you know, alternate timeline, mm -hmm. but it, it's really good. I mean, it, they, they built, they built an entire world on their own with this thing. And like visually it's just, it's stunning. So it, it, does it feel like it's based on our world or its own unique world? Our world, if our world took a different turn. Okay. I like that. Like it, 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 it's, it's kind of like Blade Runner crashed into uh, into the Civil War. Oh, wow. Yeah. I like that description. <laughs> that, that, that's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So are you, uh, you say you consume comic books more as trade paperbacks. Are you the kind of person that holds on to them once you're done? Do you have giant bookshelves full or are you just like having them move on? Uh, oh no, I, I have much to my wife's uh, dismay. I have bookshelves. At least yours make it to bookshelves. My bookshelves are full, so I have along my walls, I have books that are laid flat, just mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. not safe. <laughs> I, I will actually give uh, give stuff away to friends uh, if it's something that like I'm not going to read again. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give it away to people that generally won't read comics to try and just spread it around. Yeah, I think I have to buy a second copy for that because I, you know, as sure as shoot, shooting as soon as I give that thing away, I'll think to myself, I want to go read the whole series again because oh, I yeah. have to do that where I just revisit it and it's like an old the friend. Yeah, I mean, there are certain things I won't part with. Uh, I, I I own the uh, the big leather bound versions of Lock and Key. Uh, never parting with them. No one will probably ever read them besides me. <laughs> <laughs> They're really good. If, you, if anyone's out there that has not read the source material for Lock and Key, the show, you really should. It, uh, it, it is. 
be prepared. It, it is not the CW version that's on Netflix. It is, it is dark, but it is, it, it is without a doubt one of the best pieces of comics literature of the last twenty years. So, what what do you love the most about the series? I, it, it's hard to point at one thing. I love its originality, but I really love its just it it's it's characters its characters are so endearing um uh, bode is i i love bode and to me it's just it, it's there's so much creative energy in it on all fronts uh that like there's artwork in there that if you had asked me without ever having it seen the page to draw some of the stuff in there I don't think I could have come up with how to actually do this. And it just, it speaks volumes about, about Gabe and Joe and Chris and their, their, their skill sets to be able to come up with this kind of stuff. It's just, it's amazing. I love very much the concept that when we meet the characters, we're meeting them kind of mid story that these, mm -hmm. these keys have existed for who knows how long have they I don't right. know if addressed how long those things have, have have been around or how long they will be a, a, around. It's, it's yeah. infinite in its possibility for storytelling. Oh no, it, it's great because you're looking at a, you're looking at a snapshot and the reality is what you're looking at is a snapshot of the keys life, not of the family's life. Mm -hmm. The keys are the main characters. I will absolutely agree with that for sure. All right. I see baby Yoda slash guru guru. I don't know how to say his name. Grogu. Are, are you, yeah. are you, uh, are you like a, an early adopter of watching Mandalorian? This is, you're speaking to someone who just, just bought Disney plus because I was waiting okay. for the superhero parts of the universe to open up so I could then binge the star okay. Wars parts. I, I, I was an early adopter. I, I was a very people. early adopter. So you were the people that like every week were like just jumping up and down in your skin, waiting for the next thing to happen. I, I was, uh, I, I have, um, I, when that show is on fire, it's on fire. Uh, it, that show is so interesting to me because it's, it, it's so weird to go back to having weekly episodes again, because then when you do, because what you end up losing when you do um, the binging yeah. is there are no real lulls in the storytelling. So when they do a filler episode of something, you don't feel that fill at all because you're just on to the next one and the story continues. Sure. If you end up with like two episodes of filler in a row, it starts to feel it a bit. It, it's interesting that the show made me feel that for the first time in a very long time. But then when I've gone back and rewatched the whole thing together, I'm like, Oh yeah, no, this all, this all works perfectly together. Uh, but honestly, I'm kind of getting back on board with having weekly episodes again, because it's nice to have something to look forward to, especially in a pandemic where no one can go outside. Well, it recreates that thing that we had uh, last time I can remember this kind of feeling uh, for something like you, you know, like the, just like the anticipation of the next episode was back when uh, in early, my early married days when we couldn't afford anything, but like the, go to the Taco Bell and get the box of $5 tacos. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go on Sundays and watch the X-Files and it felt yeah. like that was the way that that was. You just had, you couldn't miss it. I mean, right. you had a VCR and no, not everybody did. So, it, Well, it's like, it, it's water cooler again. It's nice because it's like you go, I go to work and it's like, did you watch it? Yeah. I was there. Yeah. And then you have to find out if, you know, who's standing around you. If not everyone has watched it and people are a couple episodes back, you have to, what can't you say? There's a lot of responsibility uh, now. Oh yeah. No, well, I just hide from Twitter. <laughs> I, I, I have this thing that if you're going to spoil stuff, you're a real, like, I don't know. Can I curse here? <laughs> sure. If you're going to spoil, if you're going to spoil this stuff, you're a real piece of shit. Sorry, guys. 
<laughs> but, you know, apparently I'm in the minority because Twitter decided we're going to just, you know, out of spite, ruin everything we can find. I wonder if in some small part, people have found people that do do spoilers are, you know, um, people that in a different life would have been a reporter and they were the first to the scoop. So they want to be the first per- people to, to release it and get the hits from it. So I don't Probably. Know, that's what they're feeling. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it it it's sad to me that it's at that point that like you would you would take you know it, in in a world that's like this messy right now like don't take this away from people. Everybody's got one little thing. All right, leave leave it alone. Come on. You would think everyone that, deserves that. You would think as a generation that somehow has still managed to keep the secret about Fight Club that we could keep the secret about Mandalorian for a week, right? Oh, God, if Fight Club was done today, it'd be out in, in a second. People would just be filming each other, beating the hell out of one another. <laughs> the anarchy wouldn't fly. They'd all be on TikTok, you know, yeah. doing what they were doing. It'd, it'd be bad. I, I was so serious about the rule that I didn't tell my husband for, I think it took him maybe seven years between the time I saw it and the time he saw it. I didn't tell him about Fight Club. Brad Pitt would be proud. Yeah. <laughs> The fear was real. <laughs> when Durden just showed up on my doorstep, no. <laughs> Listen, I am not looking to be thrown down a flight of stairs by a handsome man in a tank top. No. <laughs> I'm trying to think, are there any other movies? Maybe Sixth Sense that had that kind yeah. of mess it up for folk. Sixth Sense, uh, I would say the usual suspects, but everybody's parry- parodied it to mm-hmm. death at this point yeah um i it's hard it's hard to like genuinely surprise people with stuff uh it's you know david and i do our best to hide stuff when it comes to canto we know that there's definitely you know obviously the world isn't paying attention to what we're doing so woohoo but uh you know we uh we we try and hide the surprises that we do have in there as much as we can for people Oh, yeah. So did you primarily work from home all the time, uh, even before, you know, 10 months ago? Is this is this kind of more just normal? Um, yeah, I mean, I so I, I work as an EMT in New York City. So for me, the pandemic was just, you know, icing on top of what is already a dumpster fire on a good day for us. Uh <laughs> So nothing really changed there. It was just a lot more of what we were already doing in the most horrible way possible. And then uh, as far as the comic stuff, yeah, nothing nothing really changed. Um, we were very fortunate that Canto really threaded a needle when it came to the industry. So the trade actually shipped, uh, the trade shipped in the last batch of books that shipped from Diamond before they shut down. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky that the books got out. And then from there, we had nothing left to sell. We were in production mode at that point. And it left us in this great spot to, you know, when the industry came back online and July came around, we were set to go and people needed something to read. And they they were looking for something, I think, a little more hopeful and fantastical that took them out of their, you know, their daily existence and Canto kind of hit in that perfect spot again. So from our end, just through happenstance, we've been very fortunate Uh, and not much has changed for me, you know, as far as my life goes, it's still, I still work from home and I still go to work, which I'm very fortunate for. I'm, I'm lucky that, you know, I'm very fortunate that, I have a book that continues to sell in this environment and that I still have a job. So I, I, none of that is lost on me. Yeah. I think, I think the job that you have is one of those jobs people don't think about as being a very dangerous job, but it is so dangerous what you do. Mm -hmm. So thank you for putting yourself on the front line. No, it's uh, literally what my paycheck is for. (laughs) Can you, can you share any crazy stories? Because I, 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 my, my background is I, I trained as a police officer, so I kind of like I dig all those kinds of crazy. Like, 
I picked up this guy and this happened. <laughs> I, I honestly, it's, it's stuff that I, it will just depress people. <laughs> so I, I will, I will leave it alone. It, it ranges from NC-17 to stuff that no one should ever see in their entire life. <laughs> oh my goodness. What is the weirdest thing you've pulled out of like a kid's ear or nose? Uh, I pulled a micro machine out of a kid's nose. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I didn't even know these still existed. Oh, they totally do. Oh yeah. No, he got it up there and uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Ben, ben House says Crying Game has a pretty pretty big surprise ending. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, no, that that stuff. Aside from uh, laws that prevent me from talking about you know that stuff, this is this isn't. I I, I will leave those stories off to the side. <laughs> I can I can tell you on a fairly you know regular basis. You do have the occasional run into the naked person and it's, they're like, I'm not naked. And it's like, you sure? <laughs> Trust me, bud, you're naked. Yeah. You're a sans apparel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll give you one weird thing that comes out of the South Bronx. They steal each other's shoes. What? I haven't figured this out. If you are passed out on the sidewalk, there's like a 90% chance that by the time we find you, your shoes will be gone. So it's a, a it's a, a high desirability item, huh? It, evidently, but it's like it's not always like Jordans and stuff. It's like it just random shoes will be gone. I, I wonder if those people played way too much D and D growing up and are just like you know <laughs> picking the corpse clean. <laughs> the place kind of can be D and D ish, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's. Like, ah, oh, these are great shoes, and now I'm like skill skill number twelve or whatever. That's right. <laughs> I can jump higher. My dexterity is great. <laughs> oh my goodness. So what what do you have anything, any projects in the in the future that you can talk about? It it's mostly all canto for now. Um if you're a canto fan, you're you're in for the long haul. Um you know, we're, we're talking, me and David are already talking about <clears throat> what comes after Canto for us. So there, there will be something else. We've got, we've got an idea. Uh, <clears throat> but for the most part, yeah, we're just, we are totally focused in on, on hitting that, the, to making that as good as it can be. And I will tell you, I've read the outline for volume three We've had extensive conversations about volume four. You got, I, I'm excited and it's my own book. So we're, we're in a good spot and, you know, just the covers I've been doing for city of giants are, I, I am happy with my own work and anyone that knows me will tell you, I hate my own work. Uh, I will redraw entire pages that I've done because they're not good enough. So if I'm happy with where I'm at right now, that's a good sign. So you're like every artist I've ever known. Yes. Yeah. I will redraw pages. David doesn't ask me to redraw. Okay. So tomorrow, big, big production company X uh, says that they're going to make a Canto film. We'll call it <laughs> animated. Who, who is Canto's voice? <sighs> This got asked a few times, and I honestly don't know. Um, it, it's strange because I have that voice in my head, but I can't pin that voice down. And until I hear it, I don't think I can point to any one particular person for it. Does it sound like a, like a still small voice where it's just kind of like a very calm, unassuming one? Or you have a you have a deep deep voice from a from a tiny little being. He he's more emotional than you think in my head. Um, he he very much uh, his um, his emotional range really goes much further than you would expect it to go in my head. Uh, he can get very angry and he can get very sad. Uh, but it is probably more in line with a. Uh, with a more monotone version than say something super distinct. That'd be so cool. 
Yeah. I often, uh oh, here you go. The EXP, which is slash Kyle, says Alan Tudyk. <laughs> I would not be opposed to that. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny to see how many people in Hollywood, like you don't think about them as voice actors, but they do a lot of voice acting and you, mm -hmm. you may not even re recognize it as being them. Like, yeah, wow. yeah, for sure. No, and it, it's it's such a weird question, like for me, because it's, I, I have no good answer for it. I know what's in my head and David has his version of it in his head, but it's it's one of those things that I think is just like super personal to both of us because it it's just how we interpret it when we read the script. Oh yeah, I totally understand that. All right, if you could go anywhere right now and there was no no restrictions on your movement, where would you go eat? Where would I go eat? Mm-hmm. I'd go back to Ireland and eat uh there's a uh, seafood spot in uh in Dingle, Ireland, which is a small uh, coast town and dingle. they had dingle d-i-g-g-l-e okay uh and they have some of the best muscles that you will ever have in your entire life unfortunately i get very car sick going to dingle because it is a lot of winding roads <laughs> what brought you there before when when did you go visit <clears throat> we were we were traveling uh with my parents so we did a uh across ireland tour and it was Dublin, Kilkenny, uh, Dingle, and then Limerick. And my plan had been when we went to Dingle, I was gonna try and drive over to Skelly Michael so that I could go to uh, the island that Luke was on in The Last Jedi, because I really wanted to climb those stairs. But unfortunately, it is very hard to get out there and it's very weather dependent. Oh, I'm sure. And I'm, I'm someone probably, could probably make a business of just doing that tours that, yeah they do they that, that's what they do um but it's the the waters are very rough so if the waters are too rough they won't take the boats out that makes sense but i got to see it from the coast and that'll have to do for now yes true thank you this is the time has flown i feel like we could talk about our fandoms for a long time and about all the cool things that are coming out from you I appreciate it so much no thank you for having me and uh i just want to say happy birthday to david uh it's actually his birthday today so everyone everyone wish him a happy birthday tell him he's old i am going to go and bust his balls about it and probably get told to shut up tell me really missed him and i'm sorry that i i asked him uh, at such a weird time of the day i totally get it no, it's fine. That, that, that's why I'm here. I can, we, we're both, we're pretty good at covering for one another when something comes up. Perfect. All right, everybody. Thank you for hanging out with us on the experience. And uh, coming up next, Matt Hawkins, Top Out Comics. Bye. everybody doing it's a, a a nice way to start a day on your vacation day happy martin luther king day uh joining us now on the experience is matt hawkins hello hello how are you 
closer. Your hair is amazing, by the way. Oh, I, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons why I asked you earlier a second ago if it was video or just audio, because, um, you know, now that we're all working at home, I, I needed to take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> So I am, uh, yeah, my hair, I actually put product in my hair and everything. So this is the best quaffed I've been in a while. You smell amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. I I, uh, I have to say, you know, it's been a year. It was a year ago I did my last convention in, uh, I think it was North Carolina or South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm a guy used to doing two of those a month. So for going from that to literally being at home for the last year has been very weird. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, I, I, I'm adjusting. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. I mean, you know, me, I, I didn't sit still very well. So, you know, I got together with some guys and we started a channel. <laughs> right. Right. No, this is great. I, I, I love it. I, um, I just, um, I just want to make sure that, you know, I, I love the fact that in our comic book industry that the uh, fans are able to talk to the people that end it. It's one of the things I always thought set us aside from regular authors and pros and in other industries was the conventions and the personal contact, you know, of the people that read my books. I, I, I know a lot of them. And there are a lot of people I know on social media that I look forward to seeing at conventions or hearing what they have to say about stuff that they've, you know, people I've known for 25, 30 years. And uh, it's, it's really, it's just such a weird time. I, I uh, been through a lot. I know we've all been through a lot. I, I feel blessed. My, my family, my kids are very, you know, healthy and I'm going to shut this window because the three squirrels that make a racket just uh, rolled up on the branch right outside my window there. So, uh, you know, first world problems, but uh, so, you know, it's just good to see you. It's, it's good to get out and talk to people a little bit. Uh, it's, it's been a strange time. Absolutely. So, okay. So I'm used to seeing you at a convention. You guys have top cow rolls out with the coolest looking booth. What have, uh, you, what have you guys done to, with your, with your time? What is, what is you, what do you fill that space with for you? Um, you know, for me, it's a lot of reading and research. Uh, I, I've started watching a lot of TV this last year, which I hadn't done in years prior just because I didn't have a lot of time for it. But, uh, you know, I've worked in TV and written TV before. So it was interesting to get caught up and watch some old shows with new eyes. And uh, I, it was actually it was good because I've, I've kind of gone back and, and relearned some of my roots of things I liked and uh, explored some you know entertainment options for myself. Uh, and, and I enjoyed it kind of, you know, it. it I think one of the things when you're a writer, you have to constantly read and ingest entertainment to constantly be stimulated, you know, and uh, so I need it. I miss it. I, mi I miss the interpersonal thing. I really, really do. I feel you so much. So speak to working in uh, the, the TV industry. Well, I worked on um, the uh, Power Rangers TV show for two seasons uh, in 1990 or no, 2003 and four, I think it was. Space Patrol Delta and Magic Rangers. My friend Greg Aronowitz was the showrunner, and he asked me to write a uh, just an episode, and I did. And uh, they liked it, so they hired me to write more, and I ended up writing a bunch. So I worked on two seasons of that TV. You know, at Top Cow, we've produced the uh, Witchblade anime, the Witchblade live action. We've been involved in a number of other film and television options, um, which we've produced. Some have gone, you know, come back to us, and some have been developed out. A lot of stuff we've been developing for a really long time. It's it's a uh, it's an interesting time. Everything is changing. I mean, it's. It's interesting to watch change in real time. Um, so speak to, uh, I, I'm always interested in, in things, learning about things that I have never been exposed to. Like we, are, we consume TV, everyone consumes TV, but I'm always wanting to know what's really going on behind the scenes. So what, what, is it, what does it involve putting on even just one episode of any given show? What is it, what's going on behind the scenes? Oh, I was mainly on the the uh, writing staff, but the interesting thing about the Power Rangers it was it was kind of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, all the footage of them with fighting the monsters and in costume was from the Japanese show, so you were given that footage and said you told to use it, and then you as the as the writer of the American show would have to write the interstitial scenes that connected them all together uh, and would try to make sense of it. Sometimes it was sometimes it was incredibly easy because the episode translated culturally, and in essence, you were kind of doing a fancy translation job. Um, but uh, sometimes it was incredibly difficult because uh, they had some interesting cultural things that people here would just not understand at, at all, um, and even take the wrong way, you know. So um, we had to shoot some stuff in the costumes, and uh, it was interesting because. Towards the end of the season, uh, there were, I think there were 38 or more episodes of the Japanese show, 
And uh, towards the end of the American season, I think there were fewer episodes and sometimes they would give you footage from two different episodes to make one episode together. And I did that once and it was interesting. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, uh, there's only, uh, I, I think the thing with television writing and the reason why I really like comic book writing and prose writing, which is what I'm trying to do as well, is you're really in more control of, of, of the writing process, especially since I'm in independent comics and you know, I work with Image and Silvestri and these people and, and we allow a lot of creative freedom as long as it's cool. You know, I mean, that's, those are sort of our, our metrics. Is, uh, is this cool? You know, is it, is, it, is it engaging? Is it entertaining? You know, I mean, all, all these things sort of, sort of factor in. Were you a fan of Power Rangers ahead of getting the writing job? No, uh, not really. I, I never really watched it. I had two very young children at that point. And uh, when when my friend was given the showrunner job, uh, I knew my kids were fans and I had asked him if it would be if it would be possible. I didn't understand how it worked. So I asked him if it would be possible to bring my kids on set for an hour to check out the people fighting. And then he explained to me how it worked with the Japanese show. And then we ended up catching up and talking about it. And he asked me if I'd be interested in, uh, in writing a uh, just a one off for a freelance. And I agreed to do it. Uh, did it, and it was a fun experience. There were some that weren't weren't as fun. I, I think one of the things you don't realize in uh, writing sometimes, especially when you're doing work for hire work when you don't control it, uh, is they might change what you say entirely. They they could change all of it, and uh, you're still credited as the writer. You know, I mean, there were there were episodes. Um, Several that uh, I, I watched, and I kind of scratched my head as to why they made changes. I'm assuming I'm assuming they had whatever reason, you know, they're, they're the ones that are putting the show on. They've been doing it for years. Um, and who am I to question it really? But there were some creative choices that were made that I, I always was like, really? You know, it, it is what it is. I mean, they were not like uh, detrimental to the storyline. They were just sort of, in my opinion, kind of uh, pointless. But uh, I learned a lot a long time ago that uh, if, if it's semi-pointless, you don't bother fighting on that hill, you know, just let it go. <laughs> there weren't any episodes that you watched and uh, you were credited with that you didn't recognize at all anymore. There were a couple. The one I got to tell you, there's an episode in uh, Space Patrol Delta called Magic Rangers, and it is weird to be talking about stuff I did 20 years ago, but uh, it's fun nonetheless. But uh, that episode, uh, I think it's episode 18 of Space Patrol Delta, is called Samurai, and it's specifically about the Red Ranger. And uh, for whatever reason, that episode is the only one I wrote that was intact with the story I wrote, almost word for word. I don't know why. I mean, all the other ones were pretty radically changed. Some of them were completely changed, but that specific episode I really liked, and it was about the Red uh, Red Ranger using the sword. It was fun. So, so someone wanted to go back and watch something that was pure pure Hawkins. That's where they would they would have to watch that. Wow. I don't know if Power Rangers is pure. I I, I would call it pure <laughs> me, but uh, you know, it's, it's not. Uh, you know, the books that I write that are the most me are the books like uh, honestly Think Tank. You know, I mean Think Tank is is the I, I think. Think Tank is secretly the guy I wish I was. Yeah, speak to that. That that, that intrigues me. What about him? Um, just that's hard to explain. I'm not sure I would have said this 20 years ago, but just just the idea of being able to kind of do anything you want. You know what I mean? Within reason, and uh, because you're just so valuable and needed and important. Uh, you know, everyone just puts up with your bullshit, you know? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I, I know. I, 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 know I, a girl. I know a girl. You can say it. <laughs> okay. So, but uh, anyway, no, it's, it, it's really interesting. You know, the creative process, uh, the, the creator owned stuff that we do and a lot of the stuff that we do at image at top cow specifically, like, uh, you know, Mark Silvestri really loves cyber force, which the darkness. He loves hunter killer. He loves these things. And you could tell when you talk to him because he cares about these characters. He cares about how they're portrayed and you can see, uh, and sometimes, you know, you get in arguments creatively about what to do with things or how to do things, but, uh, ultimately he created them. They're his babies. And, uh, you kind of go with, with his gut on, on some of these things. You know, and I, I have I have that privilege on some of my own creator owned properties, and uh, it is weird sometimes seeing other people write a project that you've only written for like a decade. Like Think Tank, uh, there were a couple of people that wrote. There was a one shot that was written by uh, Rasan Ekadal, and uh, that was he was my artist, so it was less weird. But it still was weird to read a story that I didn't write about that character that was so personal to me. Do you know what I mean? I could totally understand that. 
So it, uh, probably refreshing, right? Like you get to enjoy it as a fan instead of having to feel the pressure of writing original things. Yeah, I think at some point you have to kind of let go because uh, if you put too much hands on something, you're going to prevent it from growing. I think, you know, like you look at uh, all these comic book characters, uh, the people, there were the people that created them. And then there was the next generation, the generation that had to added layers to these characters that made them more interesting, more compelling, more human. You know, um, one of the things I note about a lot of the characters I see uh, from the 60s, 70s, and I don't know if it's a good thing, but all the characters we have today, are, they're so flawed. They're so dark. Uh, it's one of the reasons I, I kind of enjoy reading some of Cedric's stuff because uh, it's just so hopeful. You know what I mean? I mean, everything everything written seems so dark these days, and maybe it's a sign of the times. I think it's true. I, I see that because I started in the industry in the 90s, and that was the beginning of the dark character with Spawn. And we already had a damaged character in Batman, but people seem to kind of glom onto that. It's maybe it was a way for us to work through uh, the things that we were unhappy about in ourselves. We look for that in characters. Well, I think, you know, one, one of the things that Sylvester told me when I first started working uh, at Top Cow, and, and I kind of internalized it, is he said, you know, people, there's wish fulfillment. I mean, even if the character is a bad person, a kind of a bad person, not, Jack Yesticato is not, you could say he's a hitman, he's part of the mafia. You could argue he's a he's a bad person or has bad attributes. But uh, you take a character like that and make them interesting and compelling and likable, uh, it changes things. You know, how is Tony Soprano someone that people look up to? You know, I mean, that's that's kind of weird when you think about it on a meta level. But um, you're creating these these characters that are interesting. You know, you look at uh, Breaking Bad. How did, how did, you know, Walter White's character get evolved and uh, going from a simple family man who was trying to help himself out because he had cancer and he thought he was going to die to becoming a megalomaniacal kingpin that kills people and manipulates people in, in drug deals. You know, I mean, that's, that's quite a character arc, but it's, it's, it's so believable. And I think that's one of the things where these characters have to evolve. And I, I think, and my point on that is that sometimes it takes the next generation or the next writer to come in and push that character I think sometimes the original creators, I've known there's some creators, characters I've created where I've been afraid to do too much to them because I care for the character. Does that sound stupid? I, I, I mean, I mean, there are characters I have that I care about a lot, you know, and then there are characters that I work on that are work for hire or they're, you know, or otherwise, and, and I care less. It is interesting when you can see the characters that you can talk to creators and you can tell that they really care. Uh, versus when they don't, it, it, it's it's very noticeable, at least to me. And that's one of the things I've always liked about Image Comics, actually. And you know, as we're coming up on the the 30th anniversary, uh, which is pretty amazing, you know. I mean, and, and I've only really ever worked at Image Comics, you know, outside of Image or an Image Studio. I worked at Awesome Comics with Rob Liefeld for a year, and that was the sole period of my career, which is 28 years now, that I've not worked for an Image or an Image Comics affiliated company. You know, I've been at uh, Top Cow since uh, April of uh, 1998. Uh, it's, it's, it's weird to me when I think about that because uh, everyone I know has jumped so many jobs in that time period. You know, I know people that have worked at Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, and Valiant. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean all, all four in the, in the time that, uh, you know, I've, I've been with uh, Top Cow and, and Mark Silvestri. So it's, it's different. Um, I don't know why we went down this, this, this thought process, but uh, it is fascinating. I, I, and I question this all the time as to whether people who have passion for their characters sometimes do them disservice. Um, I, I think sometimes with, with, with characters that I care so much about, like I said, I'm afraid to do too much to them, or I, I really do think there's something to that. And I, I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't mean to veer off onto a weird tangent. No, this is a, tangents are where I live. This is good. <laughs> But the, that's the thing I really like about Image Comics, and, and one of the reasons why I've always kind of stayed there and gravitated to there, because the people that work on these projects, they do care. You know what I mean? I mean, they really do care. Because most of the people that launch creator-owned projects, the vast majority of us, we do it with the knowledge that we may not make any money. Okay, think about that for a second. You know, I mean, and that includes the mid-range of creators. You know, um, you know not everything is a hit. You know, and that's why you see so many people that mix, you know, like work for hire work with with other kind of stuff. And I've never really done much work for Marvel or DC. I often wonder if I'm one of the few that's uh, kind of achieved this level in the industry that has not. You know, I mean, I've, this is my third decade and uh, 
I've worked editorially on projects that Silvestri has done with Marvel and DC and that Liefeld did, Heroes Reborn. You know, if you go back to Heroes Reborn, I think I'm pretty sure I'm credited in, in those books. You know, it's uh, it's weird sometimes when I go back and look at some of that stuff. It's a, it's probably a little bit of both, I suspect, that there are people, the reason why they've moved around is because there might be an expectation in the industry that to prove legitimacy, you have to have said, be able to say that I've worked for Marvel and or DC. Do you think that's a little bit true? I, I think that is true. It also depends on, I, I think there, there are not a lot of people uh, that are, to me, like Todd McFarlane, you know, Mark Silvestri, Rob Liefeld, myself. I, I'm not comparing myself to them because they're image founder artists. But the point being is that we straddle the creative and the business. You know, if you actually look at the number of us in the industry, it's not as big as you think. You know, I mean, it, it, I, I would bet it's under 100, you know, and, it, and that includes people like Brian Polito and, you know, and, and people like that and, and uh, Billy Tucci, these guys who are sort of, uh, you know, they have their sort of exclusive online audiences at this point and they don't care about some of these other distribution outlets, so which, which is fascinating to me, you know, that people have sort of this with crowdfunding and all these various things. Everything is changing. I mean, it's, 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 it's scary, but it's also exhilarating. I, I think we can look at it right now as, you know, this is a big change for the industry, but if you look at all the changes that it's gone through over the years, I mean, we, you might've looked at the move that image made coming out of Marvel as being a ridiculous move, but I cannot imagine a comic book industry without that move. Now it was so important to what happened afterward. It really was. I mean, you know, and, and I wasn't there for the very beginning of it, but I was there pretty soon after. I mean, I started in April of 1993 and uh, I don't know how much I beat those guys in terms of being in those offices, being in that early thing. But uh, it was fascinating to be there for early image. And when I was at Extreme Studios in Anaheim, the image comics office, the corporate office was right next to it in the same floor. So um and it was completely different. I, I don't think there are any staff that work there now that uh, that work at Image now that worked there back then. Because Eric Stevenson was uh, at Extreme with me and Rob Liefeld. We both were at, at Extreme Studios back in the early days. It is interesting. I think Rob honestly does not get enough credit for uh, the innovations that he's done and the people that he brought into the industry. You know. Um, because it's a lot of people. I mean, it, it's uh, whether you like Rob Liefeld or not, he brought in an entire group of people and him and uh, McFarlane and Silvestri. These guys, they revolutionized the industry with computer coloring on these books. I mean, go back and look at the books in the late 80s. And, you know, they did. They look so much better now. You know, and then McFarlane went and on top of it, he did it in the toy industry. How cool is that? You know, look at toys now. They are so much cooler than they were in 1990. And why is that? Because McFarlane Toys pushed the envelope, pushed the standard, you know, and now we have, you know, Mattel and companies producing much higher quality figures. And why? Because one guy decided he wanted to build a company and make toys that he thought would be cool and that he, he'd want to play with and he'd want to set on his shelf. And that's why. And I think that's the same reason why the Image Founders did what they did. They wanted to control their own destinies. They were tired of being told what to do when they knew in their hearts they were right. You know, and I, I, you know, these are once in a lifetime things. And, and I, I consider it one of my uh, great life privileges to have been there and witnessed it firsthand. Absolutely. I, I honestly am still a little bit sad in my heart that they're not called Todd Toys. That was the original name, wasn't it? He couldn't call it that, I think, because of, uh, wasn't it because some Barbie has some character, Todd? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I seem to recall he wanted to call it Todd Toys and had to change it. I'm sure there are people out there that have Todd Toys still that they've got in the package. As a yeah. Mad collectible. And I, <laughs> I can remember oh, seeing them. These things are cool. You know, when I made, when I worked with Liefeld, we produced a couple toys. Uh, we did Profit and... Uh, Rejects and Shaft. We did some Young Blood toys, and then I did uh, Lady Pendragon. I, I produced a toy in a Chinese factory on my own in 1998 and released it into the industry. And I'm pretty proud of that toy. You know, it uh, the character hasn't aged as well, given sort of the uh, the change in in what's going on in the industry, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I would I would redesign the costume. Let's say it looks very 90s. <laughs> Whole box of those somewhere along with the cybernary and the web witch and oh yeah no 
You know what? You know what was great about those times? I, and I, I got to tell you, I, I wish those times would come again. Maybe they are for younger people that are doing web comics and they see the new frontier. There was just an excitement and an enthusiasm and a belief that we could do it. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there was there was this belief that we could do it. And I, I think and we just went out and figured out how to do it. And I think that's part of the reason why early image confuses people, because uh when Image launched, we were all hired and none of us, like I was hired and put in a very prominent position and I didn't have any idea what I was doing. I, I, I mean, think about that for a second. I, I was put in a very prominent position at, a, at one of the top extreme, extreme studios, one of the top companies at Image at the time, uh, by itself a top six comic book publisher at the time, you know? And uh, I was put in charge of almost all of marketing, editing in a, a division. And I, I was soon then consulted in financial matters, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's weird. I, I have a science degree, you know. I mean, it's it's a uh, my career and my path is just it's it's so weird to me. And when I stop and think about it, uh, it's odd. I mean, uh, I don't think I don't know that I would change anything. I've had some hard times of late, but uh, it's been good. It's kind of tempered me. Like uh, I feel like you know I'm that sword being tempered that Arnold was talking about in his little uh, speech bagging on Trump the other day. I've, I've got to talk about the science background because I'm like, you tell me that you have a science background and then you got hired to do what is clearly not a science position. You have to walk me through how in the world that happened. I was uh, working at Norwest Financial, which is now a part of Wells Fargo, which is, of course, known for its ethical standards. Right. Um, and uh, I was doing uh, I was doing skip tracing, some collections and some crazy stuff. And then eventually we were doing like they would have jobs like uh, Levitt's. You go to Levitt's Furniture. Right. And uh, you, you get 12 months, same as cash on your couch. Well, the whole, the whole reason why that even exists is because companies like Norris Financial then grab your information. They supply the credit and then they try to sell you on stuff. And uh, so that was what I was doing at the time. And I really hated it. And then I switched into when I when I realized that I couldn't rip people off like that, just uh, knowingly, I switched to retail banking. And then I realized just how horrible humanity is. Um, and uh, so I, I had just had one of the most god awful weeks as a teller. Well, I'm going to college full time. And uh, I my nephew asked if I would go to uh, the signing at, at Mile High Comics. You know, and uh, and I didn't know who Rob Liefeld was at the time. I didn't know who he was. And so I took my nephew to the signing. We waited in this long line. I got to the front. There were a couple of artists that Rob hired that were there that they got hired right in front of me. I hated my job. Here were these young, good looking guys. There were some cute girls there with them. I was like, wow, look how cool that is. And so I was the next guy and I asked Rob if uh, he was looking for anyone for any kind of other job or anything else. And uh, he said he needed someone to write press releases and do letters pages. And is that something I could do? And I lied and said, yes. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. I drove in Anaheim, Anaheim to a place called Crown Books, which I don't know if it exists anymore. But uh, And I went in and found a book on how to write a press release. The book was called how to write a press release. It would have been what would now be a uh, dummy's guide to writing a press release in that section, you know? And so I bought this book, I took it home and I thought, I'm like, well, how would I impress this guy? And I had no, I, I, I he was all in the news. I mean, the weird thing was he, when I started looking into it, he'd been on CNN like two weeks earlier. And so I was like, holy, holy shit, this is like a legit thing. This is a big thing. I just waited in a three hour line just to meet this guy. And uh, I have his business card. So I wrote a press release as if I was writing a press release to send out for the signing that he did at Mahai. Mm -hmm. And I faxed it to him. I said, this is the press release I would have sent out to the local media, alerting them that your signing was happening. And uh, he hired me that day. So wait, so he's probably at this point, what, 18 and you're 20? Oh, no, he's a couple years older than me. Uh, I would have been 21. He would have been 23 because I was in grad. I was in grad school. I wasn't in my undergrad. Um, yeah, such a different time. I mean, and that's why I think tank is such a character kind of near and dear to my heart because, uh, you know, that could have been me. I mean, I, I was never that smart, but I, I could have been sucked into like many of my friends into working at, uh, you know, Northrop Grumman or any of these military industrial complex companies. My dad was an Air Force guy who then worked for Rockwell and Lockheed and was, a, was an engineer. So it's uh, kind of a family business, you know? What were you hoping to do with the science degree? Uh, I, I wanted to go into applied science and, and, and into research. I wanted to do field work. I, I always, I, I was not, I'm not a guy who wants to, see, this is the crazy thing for what I do now. 
in my mind, I was not the guy who would sit in an office and do research all day, which is in effect what I do now. You know, I sit in, in my home or at my office and, and I write comics, you know, and uh, fortunately there's, there's more social aspects to it. But uh, now I know, I know several people that are pretty high up in that scientific mill industrial complex. And, uh, you know, I, I use them as references. If, if you read the science classes in the back of some of my books, I quote these guys from time to time. And uh, I always send it to them in advance to allow them to approve it because the last thing I want to do is jeopardize their security clearance, you know. But uh, there are things you can find out. And I think part of the uh, success I've had with my science fiction books that I've written, they all seem very topical, including like The Clock, which came out last year and was about a pandemic before the pandemic hit um, and uh, weird timing, you know. And part of that is because these things are discussed in academic science journals and I subscribe to those and I get them. And, and they're boring and 99% of the time you sort of scroll through it and it's all this, you know, academics trying to impress each other. And then you get to one or two sentences and they blow your mind because it's like, uh, you know, like I remember when I wrote a book called, uh, uh, one of the books I wrote has uh, about, uh, in it, in Golgotha, it's about having a genetic engine, a stairway, I'm sorry, stairway had, you have uh genetic memory in your DNA, meaning there is stuff that's stored in your DNA and we can use your DNA as a hard drive. This is actually legit science now. I can take and insert information into your body with a needle or, or whatever uh, and, and have it become part of you and then extract it later. So of course my mind when I read that thinks of, well, so that's why we're here. Somebody did that 10 billion years ago, you know, and boom, stories. And that's how the creative juices start flowing from one or two sentences in some sort of journal and uh, I did that with science. I did that with Think Tank, too. I would always get the very leading cutting edge science. It's weird when you look back 10 years later because it's not cutting edge anymore. You know what I mean? I go back and I reread it. and I'm like, God, it was really cutting edge when it came out. You know, when it was out, it was very cutting edge. And now you read it. And it feels a little it actually feels a little dated, which uh, when I reread it and started thinking about doing a new volume made, made me quite sad, actually, because uh, when you when you write something that's very tech specific, mm -hmm. eh, it's hard, you know, Well, it happens uh, like for you know, it seems like when you read, we're reading Crichton books that they were so forward thinking, but almost everything that Crichton addressed has come to pass. It, you know, like yeah. it's based on good science that was like, of course, it makes sense that dinosaurs used to have feathers or, or became birds. Right. And it makes sense. All of like all of his stuff that addresses contagions. And when I read your, the first issue of clock it was like this is the scariest concept because it could totally happen well and that's the uh that's the that's the rub right i mean i i always we we always demonize the nazis and we should I, i'm not pro-nazi believe me but um they uh you know eugenics and that concept of uh, it was an american design you know i mean we created eugenics and, and the nazis adopted it and took it and ran with it we then after the nazis adopted it we abandoned it and we demonized it so we no longer look at it but the idea of an american firm using eugenics that we do it every day what do you think gmo foods are that's an effect eugenics among food and i you know i talk to people all the time that are disbelievers in science you know and especially now we have this weird schism in the country and there are these people that just don't trust science at all and i have to tell you most scientists i know are not political they could not care at all about politics and what's going on uh they're either uh, they're of two cloth they're either ones that are doing it for achievement and they want to do it because they can mm -hmm. or they're doing it to help people those are the two types of scientists yeah but all of them follow the science right they're not going to make up data to fit what they wanted it to say, they go, aha, uh -huh, this is telling me the opposite of what I thought was going on. We needed to figure out why. Well, there, you know, I mean, we, we talk about things which like, uh, it, it is my understanding. I don't have any actual proof and I'm not perpetrating a conspiracy theory. I have no proof, but it has been relayed to me that there are teenage clones alive that uh, people have been cloned. Cause if you look back to Dolly the sheep and when the cloning technology was uh, pioneered, that was almost 20 years ago. Okay. Think about that. That was 20 years ago. So it could have easily been used on humans at the time, which means there's people between 18 and 20 walking amongst us that were our clones. You can clone your pet right now. Mm -hmm. Cost you a couple hundred bucks. You know, the interesting thing that scientists can't figure out about that is the clones of pets often come back more aggressive and they don't know why. Uh oh, they, they come back slightly, not like where they're like demonic, like fanged beasts. 
but they're just more aggressive. And it's happened many times. They notice it especially among bulls because uh, you get one of those prize bulls or one of those prize thoroughbreds. You know, technically it's illegal to clone them, but you don't think people have tried? Oh, yeah. I totally understand that. I, I have a, in my earlier life, I totally wanted to do pre med. So I have an obsession with science also. So we share that. And, um, well it is certainly used for ill. Okay. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we should blindly trust anything, you know, and, uh, but, uh, I, I, I will put my faith in science over politicians, uh, and I will put my faith in science over religion, but that's my choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've watched, uh, or maybe you've watched this also. I'm pretty sure it's a Netflix show that was basically talking about genetics and genetic manipulation about people, you know, kind of like, not in the mainstream, in the fringe. They have all the science and all the this, you know, the ability and the degrees and all those things. They're the smarts, but they're they know that what they're doing is outside of what would be considered the law, and are so doing you know genetic manipulations to try to see what, yeah. they, can, what they can change about the code. Um, well, the, the benefit of humankind to to fix disease. Well, it, you know, the the CRISPR has changed everything. C R I S P R. It's a machine that you can buy. I I almost bought one because they are not very expensive. However, if you wanted to say, acquire jellyfish DNA to slice into your cat so that your cat would glow in the dark, uh, that jellyfish DNA would probably cost you about 10 grand. Yeah. You know, I mean, so you, you can buy these CRISPR machines for, so I've seen them used for 600 bucks, mm -hmm. you know? And the scary part about that is think about that for a second. For $600, you can buy a machine that you would then take, uh, find someone with COVID-19, right? and start splicing in different types of DNA that you pick up in the wild with COVID-19 just to see what happens. If you're, if you're crazy and insane and an extremist, you don't care. You're willing to die, right? Those people are willing to die. So if you create something that causes you to die, then you've probably somewhat achieved your, your purpose, you know? And uh, it's, uh, I, I really truly don't understand extremists. I actually want to take this to a, like a, a crazy other place of, um, you know, we've been writing about superheroes for a long time. This finally makes it kind of feel like, just like the John Crichton books, that that concept that there might actually be able, we might be able to manufacture a superhero, kind of like the boys, um, doesn't seem so far off if we can buy for six hundred dollars something we could start messing with genetic code. Well, it's, it's not it's not just that. I mean, the, the idea of transhumanism where, you know, you merge man and machine and the synchronicity and all these things. I mean, all these things have been happening for, for a while. None of this is new. Um, and the speed that we have in some of these quantum computers, especially when you take four or five of them and link them together, uh, you, you take four quantum computers and link them together and you have more processing computer, computer power than the entire world had 10 years ago in four machines. Okay, I, I, I mean, so when you start thinking about that and the idea of it, and see, I know this scares people, but the idea of putting a chip in your brain that would allow you to in real time access the internet, you know, I, I would do it in a heartbeat. And, and I'll tell you why, because if you no longer have to remember anything, then you can allow your mind and education and everything in terms of analysis and application. You know, uh, rote memorization, you know, I remember memorizing the entire periodic table. I remember memorizing all the state capitals. Uh, neither one of those has served me well for anything other than Jeopardy. Okay, so, you know, and I don't, you know, I, so what's the point in rote memorization? In my opinion, there is none. It would revolutionize uh, education if kids were not taught to memorize, but were given things and allowed. It's why I always liked open book tests when people would, and it was not, and there were more essays or interpretive. It was like, uh, you know, whether you know, uh, you know, NA is, you know, sodium or salt or versus, you know, AG or silver, or these things. I, I mean, who cares? Really? Do you really need to know what the atomic weight of silver is? Do you need to know that? That you can't look it up on your phone in two seconds? Yeah. You know? I mean, Wasn't that the same problem that they had when we started having the written word that they were so terrified that we would lose, you know, those that, you know, everyone did spoken word back then and everyone would pass it down generationally. And they thought it would mean that we would lose something, but then it freed us up to be able to be innovative, to do other things. You know, I have never thought about that. And and you have sparked my uh, curiosity. So I, I am actually going to look into that because I've never really thought about how the written word supplanted the spoken word. 
Um, I, you know, I realize, you know, the Native American or the First Nation uh, storytellers, how they carried down. And I've heard some of the stories from them on reservations. And that's that's uh, I have to say that is somewhat magical, you know. Um, and I, you know, I've been to the Middle East Comic Con and, and I've dealt with a 16 year old kid of a friend of mine who had memorized the entire uh, Quran, you know, and uh, we reflexively think of them. Oh, they're evil. But this is a nice kid, nice family. I mean, you know, I mean, and, and the fact that he memorized the entire book fascinated me, you know, and uh, because I realized how how many uh, Bible thumping Sunday attending Christians can quote more than five verses. I think there's people in both uh, for for all different religions that have the passion to to memorize it all. I, it's it's a celebration of what they believe. I love it. But that's a different thing to me. That memorization is almost like a cultural uh, tradition, you know, uh, in in a way like oral traditions. Uh, and given like a, uh, uh, you know, what's fascinating to me when I'm where my mind goes with that is, you know, when we play games like telephone, you know, like and you see how the word can change or what was said can change. What was the original message? Mm -hmm. do, do you know what I mean? We don't know. I, I mean, so how did it start? Did they translate it literally? And is it the same story or has it evolved? I mean, I don't know if uh, you've told stories about your childhood, but mine have been exaggerated in the years. And I realize that sometimes it's like, wow, the story that I told has, has become a bit of an exaggeration. And who cares? I roll with it. I'm a storyteller anyway, you know, and uh it's just, it's just interesting to me that, you know, and my sisters and I often, I have two older sisters and we often reflect because we're, we're reasonably close and the pandemic has brought us closer, you know, and some family tragedies have brought us all a little closer. But, um, you know, it is fascinating to talk to my sisters about events from our childhood and how differently the three of us remember them. Like we get into arguments about who was even there, you know what I mean? And which is fascinating to me now because the, the arguments are very different now because uh, it's like, oh, oh, remember 10 years ago? Because you get the Facebook reminder. You know, 10 years ago, oh, we were, oh yeah, you and I were in Solvang and, and we went and played mini golf there and rode bikes around downtown, you know? And it's like, there, no, there's like, there's evidence. There's a video, there's a picture. We didn't have that as kids. Mm -hmm. Completely different world, you know? I, I think, you know, I don't go on and on to my sons about how, you know, we had to walk up hills both ways in the snow backwards to go to school, you know, like uh, was the old joke. But uh, I do tell my sons that something has been lost uh, in this real world time that we have, this real time world, I mean, because if you look at everything, it used to be from, you know, balancing your checkbook, writing a check, there was no immediacy to any of these things. You know, you're, you'd write a check and it might not even hit your account for a week. You know, I mean, that concept is so foreign and weird to my sons that they don't even understand it. You know, I had to explain to my son one day why this 90 year old woman was writing on a piece of paper at the, at the, the checkout line and making us wait really long time. You know, I mean, that was, that was five or six years ago. And honestly, I've not seen one, by the way. I don't know if that's changed or, or if those people finally have aged out or I, I used to still see elderly people. Oh, you know what it is? Jen, I, I just realized we're the elderly people now. <laughs> when did that happen, huh? God dang. Uh, uh, like it's only a matter of time before you start telling people to get off of our lawns. Get off my lawn. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I'm having a good time. I, I, I enjoy who I work with. I enjoy, I, I really like working at image in the studios and I like working with Elena and Henry and, and Mark and Vince. Uh, it's been a good, it's been a good experience for me. Any of your family um, come along into the comic book industry? Uh, my middle sister wrote some comics uh, that Top Cow published called Blood Legacy back in the day, but uh, she was more of a novelist. She wrote a series of novels called Blood Legacy, and she she has uh, other work that she's done uh, that's not out yet that I've been talking to her about some stuff. But uh, yeah, she's definitely a writer. She was a uh, like a thirty year retired highway patrol woman. Uh, like I think she retired a sergeant, and uh, so she. Uh, my family is, is really strange. I mean, my, my middle sister is, is, is genius. I mean, she is, she is a mental level, skipped two grades, like, uh, like ridiculously smart, you know, and she, she worked for CHP. <laughs> you gotta be really smart to, to do what they do. No, I, I know. And I, you know, and I, I talked to her cause a lot of her friends are still police and uh, she's been retired for a few years, but, uh, the sad thing talking to her is she's like, you know, I don't, I don't know why anyone would want to be a cop today. 
it's a different thing, right? It used to be a, a position of respect and you were within the community. Right. People went to for help. I mean, you were a little bit annoyed if they pulled them over and gave you a ticket. But uh, it, it's kind of like it's it's an impossible place for them now where because of the actions of some. Yeah, I mean, there is, uh, you know, I, I laugh sometimes because you like I was watching Dave Chappelle's Netflix show. I don't know if you saw that where everyone always talks about you can't blame people for the bad apples. And he's like, well, then then how come we don't have more, you know, bad airline pilots? You know, I, I just thought it was it was an interesting comment. I I. I, I really don't want to veer into politics, but I, I actually never thought about that. I'm like, because we always want to give the bad apples a break, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I guess if you're a, a, a pilot, you know, there are no bad apples, right? You're supposed to be weeded out. Or if you're special forces or, yeah, I mean, if, if you have a job that's considered important, I think the problem is it's like teachers. None of these people are paid well enough. No. You know what I mean, I mean, it just makes me so sad when, uh, you know, because I've thought about, teaching in my lifetime. I'm not very patient, but uh, I, I think I'd be actually a good t college teacher. I, I think I would be. And um, because people are there because they want to be. I don't think I'd want to teach people that didn't want to be taught, which to me is K to 12. Do you know what I mean? Oh, and once you get to college. They're just biding their time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my, my, my experience with uh, education has changed for a couple of reasons because of my two sons who about now are both uh, out of high school. Um, and uh, the work I do with CASA, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I am a court appointed sanctioned advocate for the uh, Los Angeles children's uh, court system. And uh, what I do is I represent uh, foster children, uh, their educational rights and their housing rights. Uh, uh, some of them I get assigned to me and I, and I work with the courts and it, it's all uh, pro bono volunteer work. So I, I recommend that people who want to try to do something to help the community would take a look at this because it actually makes a, a real difference. And uh, you can, you can, you can make serious. I, I, I know that I have specifically made real change in a couple teenagers lives. And uh, that makes me feel good. I mean, I'm not a completely altruistic. I do it because it makes me feel good about myself, but it's still ultimately a, a, a win for everyone. And uh, one of the things I tell people about, it's called CASA, C-A-S-A. -S -S if you Google CASA Court Kid, whatever, I guarantee you the, the it's a nationwide organization that uh, people go through a six month training, then they get assigned children and they work with these foster kids in the court system. The reason why it's so important here in Los Angeles is we have, uh, I don't know if you know, nationwide, the average social worker has 40 cases. In Los Angeles County, the average social worker has 500 cases. Um, and uh, we have 30,000 kids in the foster care system in Los Angeles. Um, and a sad stat, and this is a true stat, and this is the one that really kind of broke my heart, is one in two, one in two, so 50% of kids, men, boys, not girls, boys from age 18 to 21 that are uh, aged out of the foster care system in Los Angeles are either one of three things, dead, homeless, or in jail. So think about that. 50% of these kids, one in five, one in two of these, uh, you know, boys that are generally raised by the system, they're either homeless, dead, or in jail by the time they're 21. And that's just three years. You know, and I mean, when you get involved in the system and you start doing it, it really breaks your heart because uh, they can't pay you enough to do it. I mean, I've, I've sat in a courtroom where I, I saw a 16 year old girl with a 50 year old, uh, uh, the father of her two children, and uh, she had accidentally murdered the kid by getting high on heroin and passing it to her infant through her uh, breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. She just didn't know it was possible, you know? And uh, it, it, there's so much wrong in that when you unpack that. Why is a 16-year-old girl with a 50-year-old guy? Okay, that's first, you know? And the funny thing is when you're in the courts and dealing with this, they don't even address that. Uh, the fact that the father's 50 years old and the girl's 16 has two kids. Think about that. So she's 16, has two kids. One of them was at least two, so that's 13. Yeah. I, yeah I'm sorry. I did not mean to go down this dark hole. I just, I the courts have reopened here in LA, and I've, I've, I've actually got a couple active cases, and one of them I have to work on a little bit today. So, uh, and I was rereading some of that last night, and it, it, it made me a little sad. So. Do you have to have any kind of background in law or any, any particular skills to be part? No, you are, uh, you're not a lawyer. You're an advocate for a kid. And, and essentially what you're advocating for the kid is his educational rights and his housing. So that's it. 
you know, so you're making sure the kid has a place to live and you're making sure the kid has a place to, has, you know, education of some sorts. And it's tough because one of the kids I worked with that's I don't work with anymore, um, he, he graduated high school with a, uh, a really bad grade point average. And for me, uh, you know, a valedictorian in my high school, I pushed my sons to get B's and A's and B minus, I would be mad at them. You know, this kid was, and his family members were ecstatic that he barely passed and graduated high school. And it was such a weird experience for me because uh, I, I had to congratulate a guy. And it, it, it gets into that white privilege first world. There's a lot to unpack in all this. And I, I don't want to get into any of that. But it, it's, it's interesting how uh, I just I'm really happy that a lot of, you know, the last couple of years have been really tough and I've been really down on myself. But in a weird way, uh, I'm kind of happy a lot of this stuff has happened to this changed the way I think about things. And I'm not even necessarily talking about COVID and the pandemic and, and all these sort of things. But, um, you know, I think it's I think it's just important, you know, to do to just try to do something, you know, and it's hard sometimes, I think, for especially. And again, I, I, I'm say one last thing on this and I want to move on because I know this kind of stuff is controversial. But I have to tell you, if you want to, as a white person, actually experience racism, watch it through the eyes of your child. And uh because my children, my children are not white. Yeah, I can see. I can see your heart. I can see your heart. It's okay. I'm driving mean, emotional. <laughs> but, okay, you love them. You love them, and you've seen what they've had to go through. And like I, I was thinking earlier about something about how we approach. You know, we you, even as a comic book person, I've learned that I can't look at who walks in the front door and decide whether they're a comic book person or not because we all look so different that you can't judge it we just need to apply that to everybody that we cannot we cannot judge anybody by what they look like at all nothing about their appearance should inform yeah. about what their heart is like now i remember the first, the first time i ever saw chuck rosansky i love chuck but the first time i saw this guy long-haired hippie looking guy red shoes i'm like what <laughs> you know and it was just because of my youth you know how i was raised it was a complete prejudice and i i it's, it's so interesting when you unpack that as an adult. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You get older and then realize how you, know, you at some point in your life that you were pretty dumb and naive and it's nice to mature and figure things out. Yeah. But no, and, and to clarify, I'm sorry I got emotional. It's been, it's been a crazy, I, 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 we're all emotional right now, right? I mean, the world, pandemic, everything. I mean, I had a friend of mine die last week of COVID. It was not good, you know. Yeah, we're, we all, I think, together need a nice cry, honestly. Yeah. All right, yeah. I had a question that came up that I thought was a really good one. Yeah, the Tanner O'Neill question. What's the your favorite top cow book not written by you? Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, I'd have to say Sunstone. And, and this is not the book I would have said a decade ago. And uh, it's because I have such a fondness in my heart for Stepan uh, Sayich and his wife. And uh, they've changed me and made me a much better writer in, in terms of how to write characters and people and interrelationships. And Sunstone is a book that I should not like. Well, not, not that I should not like, but 20 years ago, I would never have looked at, I would not have liked it. And uh, it is so quirky and cute and fun and kind of beautiful that uh, I love it, you know? And uh, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, and you could tell there it's a work of love. Um, and one of the things I realized about some of these sex positive books and industries in a way like S and M or swinging or whatever you want to call it, these people that do these industries or that do these things as a lifestyle, they don't want to be shamed for it. You know what I mean? And one of the things I think we have tapped into with Sunstone and swing, there are a lot of people that are very active in these communities that would love to have more entertainment to showcase and celebrate their lifestyle, which is what we try to do versus 50 shades of gray, which is kind of rapey stuff. You know, if you talk to anyone actively in the SM community, which I am not, but if you talk to any of them, they will tell you that they hated 50 shades of gray and they thought it was a really horrible reflection of their community and their values. And, uh, sorry, my neighbor is uh, vacuuming. Can you hear that? I can put headphones on. It's barely, you can barely hear it. Let me shut my uh, screen door. I'll be two seconds. Yep. <laughs> There, shut the door. Sorry about that. But, uh, no, and I think there's so many. I mean, I, Witchblade, 
you know, was so far ahead of its time. I mean, Witchblade and Darkness, I think, were genius. And I wasn't that top guy when those were created. But uh, Sylvester and those guys really tapped into something at the time because, you know, you had Marvel and DC, which owned the spandex set. And a lot of the Image Comics were trying to do superheroes. And then Top Gal said, you know what? We tried this Cyber Force codename Strike Force stuff, and it works for a while. But we're going to try this Witchblade, Darkness, Tomb Raider, and Fathom. And we're going to go down this line of these other line of books. And, uh, and they did it. And it worked beautifully, you know. And uh, we, we suddenly had a supernatural universe. And the Witchblade TNT TV show was way ahead of its time. I mean, uh, you know, th there's so many s series that uh, came after that. but. Uh, and I just saw Henry's, I don't know if you saw Henry popping up there. Uh, hey, Henry, how you doing, man? Um, about the Witchblade and Darkness Kickstarters. And since uh, Henry and Elena sort of take point on uh, doing all the fulfillment for those things, I, I want to thank both of them. They do such a great job. I mean, uh, the Kickstarters we've done, and I know uh, I know you're a comic book retailer, so this may be not what you want to talk about. Yeah, it's totally fine. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, the crowdfunding has changed things a little bit, you know? I mean, uh, I don't know if you, we've done, uh, I think 11 of them. Mm -hmm. I would and, think uh, of Kickstarters as being uh, a way to reach a, a, a different part of the market that when there would be people walking into the store. So right. they're usually a little more fancy uh, um, forms of the books, usually hard covers, a little more expensive. They give the, the customer a little bit something different, but I always see anytime anyone's picking up comic books, however they're they're picking them up digital or otherwise, as keeping them in their lives so that right. they still might walk into a comic book store and pick up a physical copy someday, even if they're picking it up for a friend to give us a gift. So anyway, comics get out there. I'm for it. So, well, I think, you know, one of the things that's really revolutionized everything is web comics. You know, I mean, there are so many web comics and that are some that are so good. You know, I've, uh, I've discovered a lot. I go out and read them and sometimes I'll, I'll see, this is pretty common in crowdfunding where you'll see, a crowdfunding for one of these things like uh, and you go in and the underlying creator uh, basically uses the tack uh, help me make my dream come true and I think this I actually do think this is a solid blueprint for people to be able to break into the industry now I, I think it might be one of the few ways you know you go you develop a webcomic with friends whatever it is you publish it for free for six months to a year you develop a small following and then you uh, you ask that following to help you launch Kickstarter and uh, that then raises you to the next level you have books that are in print and uh, i've found a couple creators that way that i wouldn't have otherwise been aware of where i've i've seen a name for a successful kickstarter and i'd never heard of them or the project and then i almost always link it back to something online webtoon or deviantart or, or wherever you know but uh i encourage you know if you want to be in comics create comics it's really that simple, you know, make, make them publish them online. You know, I mean, we have this ability to publish things digitally, which we didn't have 25 years ago. You know, you can create and build an audience from scratch. It's very true. I mean, it used to be very limiting too. Like uh, when I published in the nineties, I had to self fund and that wasn't something that just anyone can do in the nineties. Cause that you had to run, you had to run 3000 books. There wasn't a print house that would do, do it for less. Right. Even if you were using really inexpensive paper, it was a lot of money to throw out there. It was basically a, a really nice used car back then. Well, so, now pay pay for uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but print print on demand now actually is is good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually was shocked. Uh, my sister for a while with her novels was doing that, where she published them through Kindle, Kindle World, and was doing fairly well building her own audience. But then uh, she decided she went with someone who had a print on demand. Uh, she did it for one of her secondary things just to see what it would look like, but the quality especially for prose, was pretty amazing. I, I've, I've seen mixed results for comics because it's a little harder with the artwork and the color. Um, but uh, for prose, it's really easy to do print on demand now. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it allows people to follow their dreams a lot earlier and, um, and not have to worry about the crush of, you know, going into it with large debt. And it gives them something physical to hand to a publisher if they want to be considered. Uh, it, it certainly has to be a lot easier for you as a publisher to consider somebody that has a printed book than someone that hands you just, you know, five pages of. Well, it, it is uh, it, it makes all the difference in the world. And I'll, I'll tell you for, for a couple of reasons. One is if someone hands me a comic in the back of my head, I might actually be entertained. Do you know what I mean? I mean, at least if you're reading a comic, it doesn't feel quite as much work. And unless you get to the third page and it's really bad, you know, um, but uh, so someone handing me a comic is much more likely to have it read than someone handing me a script, you know, because uh, 
you know, reading scripts, there's so many, uh, and I've published on social media at times tips about how to publish and how to, I'm not how to pitch people and, and how to do that. And, um, it's just, it's really hard. I mean, cause the problem is, is for the most part, the people who actually take pitches, they don't really want to read them. They really don't want to read them from people that, uh, cause when you get a pitch from say, I don't know, an established creator, you know, they're following, you know, you're likely to sell X amount of books. They have a Twitter feed. You can sort of use these as metrics and a calculation to mitigate your risk when you launch a comic. I like this book. Plus, it has X writer. Plus, it has X artist. So we should make money. You know, I mean, all these things factor in. And people see that's the biggest thing people forget is that this is, this is a business, mm -hmm. and they don't treat it as such. You know, and uh, that's always been my biggest uh, fear about our industry is there's just too many people in too many positions of power that were glorified fan, fan people. Yeah, it's, uh, so how do you approach it? We've got about three more minutes. How do you approach uh, when someone hands you a, a, a project? How, how soon is it? Is it like a simple, simple enough thing that you just like, you know, within a couple of minutes, whether it's something that's for top cow or it's easy to pass. Um, I think a lot of that depends. We, we tend to not accept unsolicited uh, submissions for the reason, mainly for legal reasons. You know, um, we do the top cow talent hunt and we do it in a very specific and uh, methodical way. You have to fill out a release. And the reason is because uh, people pitch us stories and often we'll get the same stories from different people and there's no way they collaborated or knew anything about each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the weird thing is the zeitgeist, the Carl Jungian idea of the collective unconscious you saw this Star Wars movie, you read this book, you saw this online meme, it gave you this core idea. That's why we have five different, you know, Bugs Life kind of films at the same time. That's why there's Asteroid and this. It's because there, for whatever reason, are multiple competing projects because there was something in the zeitgeist that brought it to the forefront. Absolutely. All right, so I feel like we need like five more hours to really talk and we'll have to do it again, but, we have like two minutes. Tell everybody where they what they should be looking for from you in the future. What's coming out? Um, I'm working on a, a ton of different projects, uh, several of which have not been announced. Uh, the one that I'm working on right now that is known is Swing Volume 4. Uh, should be out in the fall. Um, uh, the Clock Trade Paperback just came out. I have four or five other projects I'm working on and a couple of new science fiction things that I'm working on as well. But I'm not ready to uh, announce them just, just yet. But uh, we are uh, excited about Witchblade and, and the new uh, book we're working with on that. And you can see some of the art and some of the stuff that we've got for the Witchblade half for the Witchblade Kickstarter we just did for volume two. But, uh, now, you know, it's, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities right now because of all the chaos, you know, and, and I hope, and I was talking to a friend of mine who, who said the biggest problem we're going to have more than anything is, is restaurants that, you know, Mama June's soul food, which has been an icon for 30 years and the food is amazing, is going to get replaced by a Chili's. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, you're going to see that in mass in this country in the next year, which makes me a little sad because a lot of the local mom and pop kind of establishments, I think are going to be gone. A lot of them, uh, I, I do know some predatory chain restaurants are doing this now where they're going in and trying to either hostily acquire or, or buy out a lot of individual locations based on their leases. Mm -hmm. Think about that. that. You know, yeah, they're, they're half a month behind. So they talk to the leasing agent and say, Hey, technically they're outside their lease. Yeah, kick them out. I'll, I'll take the lease for ten years, and and we'll put in a Chili's here. And you know they have all the you know if you kick them out, you can you can uh, and they have it paid. You can. This happened to someone I know actually, which is why I'm kind of incensed by it, especially in in this pandemic world. You know, as uh, they, their assets were also frozen, meaning the restaurant was was closed, and and the chain that uh, that went in and bought it actually got all their equipment too. Shame, shame on them. That is horrible. Yuck. Well, we can look forward to all the positive, cool things that you're going to put out this year. I'm excited to to see what's coming out, especially the sci-fi stuff, because that's what I dig about yours, because you always include some real science at the end. So I learn things. Yeah. Well, Top Cow, you know, the, the best way to catch me or Top Cow is just the Top Cow feeds on Facebook, uh, Instagram or Twitter. Mine and Mark's Vestries are all attached to each of those. So you can find us. I'm Top Cow Matt on Twitter. We're fairly easy to find. And, uh, you know, feel free to send us questions. Anything you want to know? Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time so much. And no problem. You do, thank you for sharing your heart with us today. Okay. Take care. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Bye.
What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Well, I shouldn't say welcome back. You've been here. I'm back. I'm Kyle. I've been your host a lot of the weekend. Thank you to Miss Jen for uh, hosting everything this morning. She has an actual comic shop to go run, like, I don't know, a day job. Like, <laughs> she's got to go do her real work. So she will be back with us later on in the day. But I am taking over uh, for a while, and it is my pleasure to introduce and bring on uh, this, the president and CEO of Second Sight Publishing, Mr. Bradley Golden. Uh, hey, also from Second Sight Publishing. Very good, very good. And also from Second Sight Publishing, Marcus Roberts. And creator of The Edge, Marvin Wynn. What's good up, morning. guys? Hey, what's going on now? Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, so let's, let's start here. Uh, first of all, I want to give a big shout out to Bradley. I know he's got a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of stuff going on. I want to give a big shout out to him for taking time out to be here today. Uh, I, you know, it's thank you, man. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, my man. So let's start here. Uh, Second Sight Publishing, founded back in 2016 uh, by Bradley, and you've been in the industry a while, man. Uh, so tell us why did you start? Uh, what made you decide to start your own publication, your own publishing company, and the story behind Second Sight? Well, I wanted to start back in 2012 when I, I, I learned, you know, that comics is one of the mediums that's actually thriving, you know. Um, I could be you know, in factories or some other job, but those are, you know, really, as I call them, you know, whole jobs. Um, you can back to work, go in, stop happy, you can get hurt, get sent home. You know, you're out of the job. When it comes to comics, you dictate how much you sell, how your book sell, and where your book sell. How long you stay in business depending upon the um, reception that your books or your company receives. So everything is up to you. When you work in like a factory or fast wit, it's not up to you. It's up to somebody else. Um I got into comics when I was eight. I said um I had a speech impediment. I couldn't really speak that well. My brother worked at the local grocery store up here in Pontotoc. Um I didn't have any friends. He would bring me comics. They taught me how to, you know, talk in complete sentences and, and, and whatnot. Um, from that point on, I've been into comics nonstop. So, so you founded Second Sight Publishing, and you built you built a pretty solid team around you. And one of those guys is, is Marvin Roberts. I'm gonna bring Marvin over, swap him out here, oh, yeah. and Mark is in charge of submissions and publishing. He's the publishing like manager. <laughs> so, so let me ask let me ask this question. If somebody wanted to bring a book to Second Sight, what are you what are you looking for and what would you tell them? Well, the uh, first thing I would tell them is thank you for considering us because there are a lot of other publishers out there that they could go to. So, it would be, you know, just an honor in that self that they would consider us. Uh, secondly, and this would, may not be so much about the book, but I want to find out uh, what their commitment level is because, you know, uh, it's one thing to put a book out for a hobby. And it's another thing when you're all in and you're saying, look, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. This is where I want my income to come in. This is uh, my retirement plan. When you're all in and you're that serious, then you're going to actually do the work it requires to keep your book going. And uh, that's sometimes more important than anything else. I mean, because you can put out a one hit wonder. It happens in music. It, it, it happens. But when you're committed, when you're all in, then you aren't going to be satisfied with just that one book. So the level of commitment is important. And then. Uh, next would be the quality of the story, the quality of the artwork, because artwork is 
is something that's subjective, then we don't just rely on me and my opinion. We actually have uh, three or four different people who take a look at this, who determine that, you know, this might be something we want to pick up on. And if we decide that, you know, this is what we want to pursue, then you'll be hearing from me and we'll go even deeper into it. How did you come to be in the comics industry? Well, uh, like Bradley, I started out in comics early. And uh, by early, I'm talking uh, back when they were still 10 and 12 cents. And I've always been in comics. I'm what's referred to as a generational comic reader. My father and his uncles read comics. My older brother read comics. Comics has been in my family for a long time. So I've always had hopes and aspirations of being involved in comics in some kind of way. Uh, I learned I had a writing skill and was good at writing. So uh, eventually, and it, it took some years, but eventually I came into the comics community as a freelance writer. Uh, I would do articles and whatnot for the world of black heroes starting out. And from the world of black heroes, I uh, was able to hop into a, a couple of comic groups and get to know people. And before long, I had my own comic coming out. And after that, I ran into Bradley Golden. And Bradley said, hey, man, I got this comic book called Mississippi Zombie. And I want you to contribute a story to. And the rest is history. <laughs> so I I'm going to bring Marcus over. Uh, Marcus, you've got a book. Uh, you've got a book that's coming uh, it's on FOC right now, right? Yes, sir. So you sub you did you come to did you submit to Second Sight your project and go I did. through the process that Marcus was just outlining? I did. Yes. So as a creator, what does that look like? What it, what was the process like for you? Uh well, the the, the process is pretty much um, gathering up all your resources, uh, making sure that you're following those those submission guidelines because. Uh, I said it's probably the most important part of the process is that if you can't follow a submission guideline, then you just your, your book gets rejected right then. But it's, it's it was a pretty smooth process of just gathering up um, information on the book, uh, submitting artwork, um, submitting pages and lettered pages, and getting it over to the guides so they could review it and 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 make their decision as, as soon as they could. So. I'm going to have you tell me about the edge in a second, but why, what made you decide that you wanted to create comics? What was your interest in, in this industry? How did you come to it? Uh, so um, I'm, I'm not 12 cent, 10 cent, like Mike Marcus, I'm 65, 75 cent um, starting out. Uh, late, 80s, <laughs> late 80s going into the nineties is where, where I, I cut my teeth on comics. And I mean, it was just seems like the best medium to tell a story with, and also including artwork in with it. Um, telling a story, it's fun, novels are fun, but just having that artwork that is pretty much emphasizing the words that you're writing just, just makes it so much more exciting to me. And I started because um, the image boom, and you just, you just wanted to, you wanted to see if you could do what those guys did. It's very interesting. And, you know, it's from a from a, a company that's, you know, uh, you know, you just you just got into Diamond, right, Brad? Yeah, we just like, got into Diamond. So are you all you're, so now you're part of the FOC group on Diamond, which is kind of an elite group of people. Uh, there are a lot of small publishers that don't make it that far. So what was that like and how did how did that process go? And how do you see that of helping? somebody like Marvin or some of your other creators uh, with, with their, with their, uh, you know, their endeavors. I mean, well, um, I mean, the process, I mean, it was a very grueling process of getting into diamond, like you mentioned before. It, it's, it's, it's very hard for us, a small publisher or this uh, small studio to get into diamond. Um, we spent three to four months just putting submission packages together and sending them to Diamond, and um, me communicating with Steve Leaf and Kat Catlin McCain, and you know, just just talking, going over 
you know, certain sale numbers of other books that we, well, or I had done personally. And um, they come to the you know, conclusion that um, they were going to try us out. So, you know, we, um, she agreed to sign a, a three to four year um, distribution deal and see how things work out. But um, but getting it done is really hard. It's it's really hard as they say it is. Um, now that we're in Diamond, I feel that we give our creators the opportunity to get their vision seen on a wider scale. Instead, and where if we just like like we did with Call the Dracula at the, at the time we had it, going shop to shop. Now you know how to now do a, a lot of the, the, the leg work, calling the shops now. We can just put it in previews. They can see what we have, and more shops have the opportunity to buy that product. I mean, sure, you've you've been uh, since we've been working together. You know, we've been it's been what like six months now. Uh, comic yeah. book shopping network and some of that kind of stuff. Um, but you've always been so great at communicating. Just you shoot me a Facebook message, be like, "Hey, man, this thing is happening," and so I know <laughs> really when you on to jump on. You know. And it's that communication is really, really something uh, that I think has served you well and will continue to serve you well. So I got to give you a shout out for that one. That was, you Good know, that's take, that's that, that, that's been great. So let's uh, I'm going to bring everybody else. I've been muting microphones uh, just because uh, it's easier to keep everybody from talking when we get more than one person here. But let me ask you guys this. You all have you've all worked on your own projects. You've all had this kind of stuff. And we're going to talk about them all. But if you could take any project from pop culture and put your hands on it and be like, this is mine now, this is what I'm going to do, what would it be? Let's we'll start with Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that's, uh, uh, in all honesty, I don't see anything out there that I would want to take. I've always wanted to have my own because the, What's out there was created by somebody that was theirs. That came from within them. That was their vision. That's their creation. And that's the experience that I would be looking for. So I don't want to take something from somebody and say, hey, it's mine now. I want to create my own and put it, make it to that level where I can say, look what I have along with you. Somebody said aliens. Who said aliens? I did. I said aliens. So you're a xenomorph guy? Is that what you're telling me? I am a xenomorph guy. <laughs> I just learned yesterday that the shoulder cannon is called a plasma caster. What? Like, yeah, just learning. <laughs> right. I'm a, I'm a big fan there. Uh, uh, Marvin, did you have any that you were like, if, look, if I could write this or I could get on this, this is what I want to do. So I'll, I'll just piggyback off of uh, what Bradley said and a little bit on Marcus, because, you know, I, I creating your own thing is always the best thing. That's your baby. But a couple years back, I was actually thinking of Contra as a comic book. And since it has that, that, predator and alien flavor to it and there's never there's never been a like they've never moved beyond like the games and a few toys with that with that uh that property i think a comic with about contra would be would be amazing like having to explain like the spread gun or the laser cannon where you, you just like there's things floating in the air and you pick them up and all of a sudden you've got a new gun putting that into 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 relative terms and making it into a science would be would be something good all right, so let's let's get down to the real business of doing business here. Tell us about the edge. What's the story? Give us the elevator pitch. Well, give us the bigger than elevator pitch. Give us the whole nine on the edge, uh, because you know there's a lot of retailers out here watching us, a lot of people in the industry watching us, and it's on FOC right now. I'm gonna keep saying that so that you guys who are doing your FOC while you're watching us, because I know that's what you're doing because it's due today. <laughs> is you know I want people to click on that book and order some. So. Give us the whole nine on 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 the edge. So the premise of the edge is 
I liken it to a throwback of the 90s book. So if you liked Wildcats, you liked X-Men, you're going to like The Edge. It's basically the story of a character called Revenant who's been infected by, it's kind of like a, a super steroid, The Edge, which gives you abilities. But as you use the abilities, it starts to burn you out and uh, you get infected and then you die. So we've got a group of characters um, I just call them the strike team that are placed between uh, Revenant and the character called Tartable, who used to be Revenant's handler. So now Revenant is out loose in the world, and he wants he wants some payback from Tartable, and this team is placed between him to try to stop him. So that pretty that covers the first arc of the story, and and things just ramp up from there mm -hmm. because the, the book is all about escalation. It's about uh, control. It's about how do you use your powers. And what happens when you have no control over something and, and don't know that the more you use it, the more you're, you're more likely you're getting to death. So so it's it's not an infinite thing like so many superheroes and stuff you read. It's something that, you, hey, you got to use this kind of wisely. You know, and, and the, the way the way the story goes is that, you know, the way you explained it is everything is finite in the story, which is interesting. Yeah. The problem so, is that only one of the character knows that this is, this is a possibility. Oh, that's great. I'm so excited. So let me ask you this. How do you approach character creation and story arc for characters knowing that they're finite? Well, I mean, it, it's it's a matter of... Um, so the art, artist Mark V, uh, he's the, uh, the, the, the brains behind the characters. And I mean, without him... And his really good designs. I don't. I don't think we. Would, I would have made it as far as I did. But you. Yeah. I approach it to a sense of letting the characters cut loose when they can, but knowing that they have no control. So our one character, uh, Randa, her powers actually turn can turn off at times. So there's a there's a scene in the book where she is hovering, flying, and she's using her powers to pick up other things. And her powers cut off, and she falls into the water. And it causes a little bit of depression on her end. And a lot of the characters have a lot of a lot of weaknesses that they put on themselves. And we we play around with that a lot in trying to take away what's what's your most powerful thing away from you and then leaving you out in the world to defend yourself. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, so again, the uh, I'm trying to, I had the code right here in front of me and I accidentally closed the window. Uh, but the, the edge is on FOC right now. Make sure if you, if you, you call your comic shop today and be like, look, I need you to put the edge on my pull list. I need you to order this book for me. If you're doing FOC watching us in the background, make sure you add some to your cart. So you've got some second shite on your shelves. You won't be disappointed. I guarantee it. Uh, everything I've dealt with with these guys has been top quality and has sold super fast. So let's let's uh, let's let's talk uh, to Bradley and Marcus uh, a little bit about some of the other things that are on the release slate here from Second Sight Publishing. What else do we got coming out? What should people be looking for? What should people be calling their comic shops for when they're when they're asking for the edge? What should they be going? Hey, also add this to my pull list and this to my pull list and this to my pull list. Mississippi Zombie. <laughs> if you hadn't already got into Mississippi Zombie, and here's the first one. This one actually came out uh, last year in May, but I'm quite sure you can get a back order. Uh, this is in Diamond Now, and both of these are through Caliber Comics. If you hadn't gotten into Mississippi Zombie, then you are, very, you are missing out on one of the best horror anthologies out there. Uh, Mississippi Zombie 2 from Caliber Entertainment uh, is in previews now, uh, along with not just the Edge. Uh, in this previews magazine, and as a company, this is something that we were really humbled by. We have five titles in previews. The Edge, as I mentioned, uh, Mississippi Zombie 2, uh, The Book of Lyaxia, uh, Lady Freedom, and Leave on the Light. So, yeah, check out Second Sight Publishing, uh, the four titles that are listed under us, as well as Mississippi Zombie 2, that's listed under Caliber Entertainment. So here's, 
I've actually got these here. Uh, lady, yeah, there you go, Mom. Yeah, there's a uh, Lady Freedom, written by Art Billafield, artwork by Larry Spike Gerald, uh, the Book of Laatia, Aaron Pahara. I'm really bummed. I got I I got the my copy of Books of Book of Laatia is the we did an exclusive uh, Derek Chu cover. Uh, and that's my copy, and I left it at home. I put it on the table to bring so I could show it while you all were on, and I left it laying on the table. There's leave a light on. Leave the light on. Uh, leave on the light. Yeah. No. The light. Yeah, that's uh, Bradley Golden's bestseller, uh, originally published by AP Comics, and now and home great. at Second Sight Publishing. That's, that's a question I have for you. As a creator, Bradley, uh, you know, and a pub and a publisher. You know, you had you had books that were other places, and you bring them to your own company. Are do you that gives you a chance to kind of re reevaluate, look at it again? Do you do that, or do you just re release? I definitely uh, re evaluate things that has um you know as reviewers mentioned. And I, I kind of use that and change things. Like I went from color to black and white. Nice. As a whole, I've, I've come to the realization that a lot of people um, like when they read that they're hard, they want it black and white. It has more feeling, more atmosphere to it. And um, I found a few um, plot errors that I that was in the single you know, the floppies I added more you know a couple more pages that weren't in the floppies to the trade and it kind of enhanced that actual story so people can understand a lot more so I definitely reevaluate things from what I previously put out to the trade so I'm 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 gonna ask you a question not about second sight for a second uh just because I got to uh, in this part of the country. Caliber Comics is one of those kind of uh, holy, holy comic book companies because Gary Reed worked with so many amazing people. What was it like taking Mississippi Zombies to Caliber and getting having some success with it there? Dream is a dream come true, man. <laughs> it, it, associated with all of those top tier talent that has gone on in the industry and uh, have become like superstars. It's, 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 it's a wonderful feeling. It really yeah, is. Like, I, like I said, around here, you know, Gary Reed's one of those names. He's a founder of Caliber Comics. Is one of those names that's said with great reverence. And so every time I talk to somebody who worked with them, I got to find out what their experience was like and kind of give them a plug because they, they know how to find talent. And most of that talent doesn't stay around there that long because they go on oh, to no, bigger no, things, no, no, no. like starting their own companies and publishing other people and building the industry. Brick by brick, right, right. But I mean, the experience has been great. It's, it's been great with him. Um, Eric, who you no know, runs it now, he he's been really good at explaining the ins and out of the the industry to me. And as an actual publisher myself, I take what he you know the the information and advice he gives me, and I apply it to my own company. Right, with you know, going through diamond. And what what not, but it's been smooth over there, real good. Yeah, not and not I, only him, but Andreas, Andreas, who's now with with Scout, he's been there for me a mm -hmm. lot. I mean, he, I mean, it was like he he was training me up for this, you know. And I think that's that's something that's interesting about the comic book industry uh, is that there is this level of everybody's helping everybody, especially on the in the independent creator owned uh small press world is that everybody's helping everybody because if we all grow then everybody you know then the whole industry grows and there's something for everybody so uh real quick we have a question from trish i know i can go to amazon and buy a copy of mississippi zombie but is there a website i can get it from you guys like my stuff and like my stuff signed since no cons as of now do you have a website people can go to and click on and order that book from you I mean, you can go on um, Caliber Comics website. You can go on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, hell, even Walmart. You know what I'm saying? You can get it at any website. 
But um, for us having it on our own website at the moment, we're going through a traditional period where we're redesigning everything for our website. So for us ordering direct from our website, it's not possible at the moment. Uh, but let me throw this in here. Uh, Trish is a big supporter of Second Sight Publishing. And I want to acknowledge that. And Trish, if you uh, send me a message with your address, I'll get you a book and I'll sign it myself and get it in your hands because Trisha, like it's a big supporter. Uh, and as a small press company, as an independent creator, and that's the thing about our company. We're all independent creators. That's where we started from. We know the importance of fans and supporters that will never, ever, ever be overlooked. So yeah, Trisha, send me a message and I'll get you a book. I'll sign it. And I appreciate your support. It's true. It's there's there are, there are folks out there who are are who are huge supporters of of small press and creator owned publishers and creator owned artists, independent artists, whatever you whatever we want to call ourselves these days. Yeah. Uh, and the fans are really rabid for Second Sight. Um, I, I see it not only on my own, you know, my own experience with selling the books, but when I watch other other people, how has that how has that been to just be so like I'm gonna use the word hugged by so many fans, but to have so many fans embrace the product and embrace the company. I would say it's humbling because it is. You you, ne you, ne you never you never expect that kind of stuff from from not just from uh, readers and fans but also from the stores and um, and Mark and I were talking about that and like we 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 had almost a, a tear fest of <laughs> of the uh, the support that we've been getting um, recently on um, on on these titles like people people are really really taking notice and the stores are really excited. Yeah, it's humbling, very humbling, because uh, I don't think anybody starts out saying, you know, I want to be so popular, people gravitate to me, or you know, it's, I want to put out a product that I want people to read, and for people to not only read our product, but just love it so well, they, and then they take the opportunity to get to know us and see that, you know, we aren't like corporate guys we're real down to earth hard working people just trying to make a living like everybody else we've chosen comic books to do it and they support that dream as well so you know it's it's real humbling to have people to you know have your back and like i said as an independent comic book creator company because that's one thing we pride ourselves on we are we are an independent creator comic book company and as that you know we'll never overlook our fans we appreciate it greatly and we uh trish, try not to disappoint well trish is responding to uh you know that you're making her cry and that uh she and pushed hard for protector because she knew you were some you guys were someone to watch uh you know and it, it's 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 interesting to have that relationship with fans is like she went to her store and was like, we need this book. You got to have this book and has been a supporter of the company, um, which leads me into my next kind of thing. I want to talk about with everybody is what's next. We know what's on previews now that's coming out. You know, uh, it'll be out in March. What what's in previews next month? What do we got in the pipe that people need to people need to really start pushing? Well, uh, February, uh, first let me say this, between Bradley and I, uh, Bradley being the CEO, me being the COO, we always like, uh, we have our differences of opinions when it comes to books and when it comes to what books we think are popular. I told Bradley, February is gonna be a blockbuster month. Uh, Bradley said, man, January is gonna be the one on top. But with, in February, we have uh, Alfred Page's Chess, coming out. Uh, also Alfred Page's Blowtorch coming out. And we have uh, Carla Gadecki's Duplicant and Jonathan Hedrick's Freak Show Night. We we had we had we had Jonathan on last night uh, on one of our independent creator panels. 
um, talking about Freak Show Night and how excited he was to have that coming out with you guys. Um, but that was a book that was that existed before uh, it was at Second Sight, correct? Yes, it was. And uh, what what happened is Jonathan has brought his Freak Show universe to Second Sight Publishing. Uh, in Mississippi Zombie 2, Jonathan has a story, has his Freak Show Prince's story. So uh, there's another reason to pick up Mississippi Zombie 2, uh, and that's to uh, get in on the Freak Show universe of Jonathan Hedry. It starts in Mississippi Zombie 2 and continues with Freak Show Night next month in previews. Awesome. Now, but when that book, uh, because it existed, when that came to you as a pitch, was it was it a quicker process? Was it uh, a different process? Because, hey, here's the final product. Uh, but I want to do more. Like, how did that go? Uh, yeah, the, the book being complete definitely helped. But also, uh, and I don't know how, uh, how often you see the announcements we make, but we actually have signed the artist who does that book. So, uh, you know, it's, it was just natural having the, the artist who did that book, who's already signed to have a book released through us to, for us to publish that book as well. I mean, plus, you know, it, the book is great. It is an awesome book. We being a horror company primarily, you know, we're looking for horror titles. You know, we think the Freak Show universe fits right in. Oh, it definitely does. Jonathan has a very unique perspective and brings a lot to horror that I don't think we've seen in a long time, if ever. And so being a horror company, I think he's a great fit. And I think the Freak Show universe is really going to fit in well. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yeah, uh, Jonathan is a good guy. I actually met Jonathan last year. Uh, I'm here in Florida as well. And here we have uh, 40, 50 cons a year. But anyway, I met Jonathan last year. Got a chance to, to you know, shake his hand and see him right at the beginning or right at the start of his, his career. And to know him before he actually has gained all his popularity and see that he's still the same humble person that he was when I met at the con last year. That's a good thing. I mean, I, I, I'm very proud of him, very proud of his success. And now I'm proud to be a part of it with uh, Freak Show Night and Second Sight Publishing. So, uh, uh, Heronberg says, Alfred Page's chess is great. Checkmate. Give us, somebody give me the elevator pitch on that one. Uh, chess is a pretty much a paramilitary um, privately funded uh, strike force team. So pre they pretty much work for whoever's paying the, uh, the high ticket price. So if you like compare them to pretty much like GI Joe's the dreadnoughts on GI Joe, where they're willing to work for whoever, whoever's got the bigger uh, bank account. Um, so their, their uh, leader Avery sends them out on missions that may, they may not agree with, but I mean, it's, it's a paycheck. So you, you have two Alfred Page books coming out next month. Um, was that by design or was that just luck? I think it was a little of both. But uh, Alfred, uh, Alfred and, and the chess, and once again, Alfred is here in Florida as well. So and I've known him. Uh, he and I are friends. I've seen his chess property. And – he had talked to me about doing a book with this character, uh, the Blowtorch, and you know, he just—it was in his mind to do this book. This, it originally was going to be a one shot. So when he submitted to Second Sight, because although he and I are friends, he had to go through the submission process as well. So uh, after he submitted Chess. And we discussed signing the whole chess universe and all the related titles. He said, well, I've got an idea for this book, Blowtorch. And uh, once he pitched that to us and got the script together and we started seeing pages, we were like, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to take this too. So it just kind of makes sense to have not only chess, which is the team, 
But Blowtorch, who is a member of the team, have their comments, comments coming out at the same time. And uh, Chess is also a, a like a kind of a 90s throwback book also. Um, Paige and I have, have been friends for a long time and we, we there is a connection between the Edge and Chess also. Ooh. So, and, and I say that, that came out weirder than I wanted it to uh, <laughs> when I said ooh. But do you guys see the second site world because there are connections between Chess and the Edge there are connections between Freak Show Night and Mississippi Zombies. Do you guys see the Second Sight universe becoming something where it's a bigger sandbox that you know you you let your creators play in? I mean, even while they're creating their own thing, you know, as independent creators, they still get to kind of play in that world. Yeah, I, on the one hand, yes, but also. Uh, we don't want to have the creators feel like they are obligated to have their characters appear in other people's books. So we totally leave that up to the, the, the creators. It just so happened that Marvin and Alfred were already making plans to do a type of crossover uh, before they actually came to Second Sight. So. We just happen to be the fortunate beneficiaries of whatever it is they have planned. Right, absolutely. So we have a we have a question from Trish. I'm going to ask it a little bit different, uh, but as a horror publisher uh, and a comic book publisher, uh, have you considered doing both horror cons and comic cons? Horror fans are horror fans are nuts. Um, you know they they could they show up for horror cons. So have you considered doing both? Uh, and if and if you did, uh, if you have, uh, what what do those plans look like when we're allowed to do conventions again? And if you haven't, what's been the the, the holdback? Well, we definitely have plans to do horror cons. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Orlando, they have a, a very big horror con there uh, that's held toward the end of the year that we're eyeing. Uh, because we're so spread out, I'm in Florida, uh, Bradley is in Mississippi, and Marvin mm -hmm. is up in Pennsylvania. So because we're so spread out, then you know, logistics can be one thing. And at the same time, it gives us the opportunity, uh, those of us who actually do the horror titles, to be elsewhere, uh, be in a couple of places at the same time because we are spread out. <laughs> Bradley, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I've actually looked at a few a few hard cuts. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when things clear up with the whole cover thing going on, um, we will be attending a few. We we would definitely be uh, attending a few as we are a hard publisher first and foremost. Um I I wanna say 40% of our titles now have not even 40, about 55% of our titles upcoming for the next four or five months are going to be horror. We got like they want to like cold blooded, these damn kids, Sony. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. We got the freak show, you know, the, the freak show universe with Mississippi Zombie. We got Harvest of Horrors coming. Um, so we would definitely be attending some, some, some horror cons coming up once this COVID thing gets back to normal. You know, as a traditional comic book retailer, my favorite thing to do is horror cons because that's where the celebrities I want to meet actually go. You know, I don't care to meet the guy who played Captain America, but I want to meet everybody who's ever put on a, a you know, the a Jason mask. You know, <laughs> that, that's kind of who I am, you know, that way. Uh, so horror, I, I can't talk about horror cons enough. And people who go to horror cons love comic books. So... I, I can I really support Trisha's idea of asking you and I support you guys going. Let me know where you'll be, I'll be there. Um <laughs> come on. There's so, only there's only one Jason. Kane Holder is the only Jason. I don't I, I've only... met him, I've met him twice. Uh he, he's really, really great. But I've also got to meet a lot of the others. Um, and they're all, you know, they're all great guys. It's been so much fun. Um so 
I'm going to, I've been asking everybody uh, because I, you know, I like to find out about people a little more than just what they're doing uh, for their ultimate pop culture garage. You've got a garage and you get one car and one spaceship from all of pop culture. What are you putting in it? Uh, we'll start with, we'll start with, uh, with Marvin. Uh, so say Kit and the Millennium Falcon. That was a quick answer. Most people, uh, <laughs> most people take more time than that. But Kit's no, a good I already had it in my brain. What, what? Because uh, I've been like, I've been watching Knight Rider and Star Wars recently. So the Falcon's a pretty common choice, but it's a good choice. Yeah, it's the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy. Why wouldn't you want it? It's true. Bradley. Oh, I say. DeLorean. <laughs> yeah, I said <see> DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wrong. And I mean, oof. I don't know about the other one, but I, I would definitely put DeLorean in my garage. <laughs> Is that a time traveling DeLorean or just a regular DeLorean? Time uh, traveling. Go back in time, get all of those those high price comics. You know what I'm saying? Go, <laughs> go back, get uh, Spider Man number one, <laughs> Action Comics number one. So, so you're doing you a know? Back to the Future too, is what you're doing. You're doing yes. a Back to the Future too. Yeah, yeah, right. definitely, definitely. All right, Marcus. <laughs> well, uh, this both. Since, since both Bradley and uh, Marvin took my my ideas for cars, then I I would have to go back and say I'd have to have the uh, Gran Torino from Starsky and Hutch as my car, and then uh, for my for my spaceship. Uh, well, you can't go wrong with the Millennium Falcon, so I, I'm just going to me and Marvin have to decide who's Pilot and co-pilot. And nobody's going to say the Death Star? You know, did the Kessel run at 12 parsecs? She knows. Hey, okay. <laughs> you know, I my answer yesterday, my answer yesterday was was what was what it was, but uh, I, I'm gonna change it today. Uh, because we're you guys are horror guys, and I'm gonna throw it out there. Uh it's now my answer is Christine from the Stephen King book. Oh uh, yeah, you know that's got a mind of its own and that'll take care of my enemies i'm good with and then um i'm gonna i'm gonna stick with the slave one only because i got a small garage and it stores flat so. <laughs> oh, christine, christine. all you gotta do is lay in the back seat sleep right i just chill <laughs> now 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 if you would have asked me specifically about a horror themed vehicle then i would have thrown out the wraith from nosferatu Ooh, that's a good answer. Oh, yeah. That's that's good good yeah. Oh, oh, man, what about that show. Sure. I'm the Wraith. <laughs> that's, I, I have really been digging that show. I, I'm, like, glad I came up on it. So, uh, well, let's get back to business. So you're all creators. You've all got stuff that's out right now that's in, that's in on, on previews right now. If you head over to previewsworld.com and uh, you search uh, – for publishers uh, and put in second site publishing. It takes you right there to all the stuff. It gives you all the diamond codes so you can tell your local comic shop and they can, they can find them super easy. That way they can add them into their, their, their orders with their FOC is due today. So make sure you call them as soon as we're done here. Uh, don't, don't turn the show off, but give them a call while, while we're in commercials and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Um, but uh we got we got we got some answers to our question in the in the comments, and we'll come back to them. But first, I want to talk to you guys about what are you working on right now, like as a, as creators. Uh, what are you working on that's next down the line? But what are you working on at the moment? Right now, I'm working on um, these damn kids. I uh, should have the first issue wrapped up by the end of this week, and um, should have the Kickstarter for that going out. To the next month, then shortly after that, I'm I'm doing Sonny, which is my take on Child's Play. Um, should have that Kickstarter going out uh, April. Then after the Kickstarters go out, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna repackage them with different covers 
and add more storylines, you know, more story pages to them and have them coming out through the company through um Diamond. And from that point on, they're all they would be ongoing from, from that point on. Who wants to go next? Uh, I'll go next. Uh, so right now we're in pencil stages on <clears throat> the edge 14 and I'm scripting 15, 16 and 17. And then I'm going back and doing some um, bookend books. So like a chapter breaks. So stuff that's going to happen between issues four and five and issues uh, nine and 10. Marcus. All right, well, I'm uh, currently finish, finishing up stories for Mississippi Zombie 4 and uh, putting the collection together to have Mississippi Zombie 3 published, packaged, and sent to Caliber. And I'm working on the next issue of The Protector, which is uh, my creator on property, and just taking care of a lot of second sight business. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to write because I'm usually in business mode. There are, there are, uh, Matt Hawkins said it on the last panel. There are very few people in our industry that are both creators and business guys. And the ones who are both seem to be the, some of the most successful and have the longest careers. So do you guys think the the fact that you think about the whole of the company on a daily basis, plus your own work, pretty regularly or on a daily basis uh, is helpful or do you think it's harmful to the creative process? <laughs> well, you know what? The funny thing is, and I don't know if you, you have too many people who will say this or who have said this, but uh, conducting business is my art. Uh, this is what, this is my passion. This is something that I'm very good at and uh, I do it on a high level just as I do my writing, as I try to do everything. But uh, I realized coming in that, you know, there are better artists, there are better writers, but I don't think there's anybody out there who can conduct business on the same level as me. This is my art. So, yeah, I get to do my art daily. <laughs> Bradley, tell me, Marcus, man, you need to take a break. And every now and then I'll stop and read comic books, but <laughs> this is my business. This is my art, so. No, it doesn't hurt my creative process at all. I, I like that answer a lot. <laughs> what do you think, Bradley? Do you think having to worry about a publisher and work on being, being you know, running a publishing company <coughs> has had an effect on the way you create or how much you create? It definitely does. I don't know when it comes to me. I can't, I don't write as often as I used to when I was, you know, just doing it from AP, you know, but I mean, it, it does help as well where I, I can actually put my mind, my get into the, the mind frame as, as a creator when I'm selecting certain books, me and Marcus. Um, we understand, you know, the trials and the, the tri tribulations that creative team might face and what, what not. Um, and we can actually, you know, work around that accordingly. But as far as writing, it, it, it definitely, it definitely plays a part in it. I, I don't write as much as I used to. When I can write, you know, I write about an hour or two per week, where I went from writing two or three hours per day. <laughs> but uh, like Mark said before, I, I'm me and him, we constantly, you know, doing business type thing, so we really ain't got time to actually write actual, you know, comics and whatnot. But when we do, we do. <laughs> so, I've been asking, this is another one of these questions I've been asking everybody this weekend. I think, I think 2021 is the year of collaboration. You know, uh, I think it's the year where uh, because we spent the last year kind of so much in isolation, um, that in 2021, we're all going to be focused on who can we work with, you know, and kind of spreading our wings in that way. So is there someone in the industry that you haven't had a chance to work with yet that you'd love to get a chance to work with? There's a few I love to work with that I'm actually going to work with this year. 
on a few things. Um, I can't really say too much at this point in time. That's fair. But let's just say there's some there's some pretty big names. Um, <laughs> Mark has two of who I'm talking about right off the top. Uh, <laughs> Killing two um, birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few of them right out, right off the top. That's gonna kill it, like kill it. Uh, but there, there is one that I, I haven't really reached out to, and that's um, Mr. Mayor. I, I would love to get him to do a few covers for us. That would be cool. That'd be real cool, Marcus. Well, uh, this this is a little different. There's someone I like to work with. Actually, like would like to sit up under and study, and that's Joe Illich, because I have so much respect for him. What he's done, not just on the creative side, but on the business side of comics. I mean, I I have high level respect, admiration. Uh, I actually tell him all the time. He is my inspiration and my aspiration. I aspire to get on his level and be able to do things on the level and with the quality quality that he does things so joe holla at me please please <laughs> well hey you know that's what i've been telling people is is not to kind of hide you know or hesitate with this kind of stuff we're gonna treat this like it's the vision board or the secret we put it out there and we'll use our considerably limited you know resources to try and make it happen <laughs> but you know i i've known joe a while he's a great guy and he, I, I can totally understand from a business aspect why you'd want to why you'd want to collaborate with him and study with him. Oh yeah, I because the the one thing that and one of the reasons why our, our company works as well as it does is we do have an understanding of the business side of comics, and because we have the understanding of the business side of comics, there's certain things that we're able to maneuver around and through. That's a pitfall for other publishing companies that aren't that don't have that same business acumen. So yeah, I, I followed Joe's business side career for a long time and I've seen the companies he's worked for and seen the things he he's done at those companies. And I'm a fan and he's an awesome writer, awesome creator. I got books, comic books with Joe Illich's name on it. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Mar Marvin, is there one person out there? Is there somebody out there that you would love to collaborate with in the next year? Uh, I'd like, really, really like to not, just listen to Matt Hawkins talk. Um, I'd really like to work with him. I mean, he's he he has everything everything going on. Just like to listen and just like sit down and listen and talk to him about some of the stuff that he's doing. All right. We've got about five minutes left, so we'll go in this reverse order around the horn here. Tell everybody where they can find you social media wise, where they can support you, where they can buy your stuff. If you've got a website, that kind of stuff. Which, which is, Go ahead, oh, Marvin. Oh, so I'm uh, at the Edge Comic on Facebook and on Instagram, on Twitter. Someone's been sitting on this that profile forever, and they they only they never post it, and they won't give it up. So it's at Marvin Wynn on uh, on Twitter. And uh, you can find everything else on at theedgecomic.com. Marcus? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Marcus Roberts 1, I believe. Uh, you can find uh, information on my comic, the comic, The Protector, at uh, Sword and Soul. Uh, I'm on Twitter, mm -hmm. Marcus Roberts 1. And uh, find me on LinkedIn mm -hmm. as well. All right, and Bradley. You can find me on Facebook, Bradley Golden, or you can go to Second Sight Publishing um, on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter at, at Second Sight Pub. You can find me on Instagram at Bradley Golden 6. And you can find me on LinkedIn at Bradley Golden. All right, we got just a couple minutes left, so we're going to go around the horn with another one of my fun questions. Favorite Pokemon? You might not like Pokemon, but everybody's got a favorite Pokemon. <laughs> uh, I aged out a long time ago before <laughs> they even came out. <laughs> Pikachu. <laughs> Pikachu. That's, that's, too easy. Easy. that's too easy. Too easy. Yeah. It's got to be Squirtle, right? Because it's just Squirtle. Like Squirtle. 
turtle and he's like spitting on people, right? <laughs> I I have I have a char I have a Charizard right here on top of my camera that I look at when I get nervous in interviews. Uh <laughs> You know, I just talked to the I just talked to the Charizard. Uh Christy Blanche is saying Bulbasaur. But it's always fun to hear you know, hear the weird, you know, people like their Pokemon or some you know, their favorite Pokemon Charizard. or their favorite. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask this question then since I gotta get Marcus on something. Uh and he didn't he didn't have a favorite Pokemon. Do you have a hidden talent that people who are in the industry wouldn't know about you or that you uh that's really just something you know a hidden talent <laughs> uh, yeah i sing uh i yeah? actually have been i actually have been singing like all my life uh i'm listed in who's who in music in uh 1982 and 1983 <laughs> you're a you're a bass singer i get i would i would i would venture uh, yeah, kind of, sort of, yeah. Uh, you don't hear <laughs> you don't hear too many baritones <laughs> out there nowadays, but yeah, I, I'm right. holding true, holding the baritone down. I, I'm a baritone when I sing, so you you can join the band. I'm putting together because there's we had a guitar player on earlier, uh, and uh, Alex uh, 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 and Alex from uh, Red Five, and we've had a bunch of other musicians on. We're going to form a band called That Band from the Comics. Hey, I'm down, man. I am down. I, I don't have to be lead singer. I even played a triangle. I am down. Oh, we're just gonna sit there down. and just we're not gonna down. play any music. We're just gonna stand there in costumes. <laughs> hey, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Before we give Marcus uh, uh, a verse for us real quick. Ooh, uh, yeah, there you go. We got about a minute left. Drop uh, a little something. I yeah. say spend that yeah, minute yeah. talking to Marvin, talking to Marvin about the edge and what he has coming on with the edge because uh, I'm out of practice. That's yeah. that's <laughs> no. good. That's a good pivot. That's a business move. Plus, a business if, move. If I did it now, it wouldn't be <laughs> hidden anymore. That's true. That's true. All right, let's talk, Marvin, one more time. Tell people about the edge and why they should call their comic shops. While we're on commercials here in a second, and uh, tell them to order this book. Oh, I mean, not only should they be ordering the Edge, they should also be ordering all the other Second Side titles that are going to be available in previews. But the reason why you want to get the Edge is that you want to be, you want to try to get on the ground floor of something that that's starting up and doesn't have 30, 40 years worth of history behind it. And you'll be able to not only grow as I grow, but grow with the characters and, and see how we kind of screw with their lives. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for being here. This has been a lot of fun. Everybody head over to previewsworld.com, search for Second Sight Publishing, get all that information sent to your comic shops, have it added to your pull list. Uh, thank you guys for putting out such great stuff. I completely agree, Dr. Christie. There's a reason she's a doctor. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, we will be back in just about a minute and a half here on the the exp expo day three yeah it feels like longer but day three uh uh here on the comic book shopping expo uh on the comic book shopping experience thank you guys so much
There's something for every imagination at your local comic shop. Visit ComicShopLocator.com to find a store near you. And head over to Comic Shop Locator, guys. Check out the site. Put in your information. Tell them where you at, where you're at, and they will help you to find a local comic shop near you. If you are not actually near a local comic shop, stay stick here. Obviously, but, uh, feel free to reach out to us, and we can put you in contact with great stores. Uh, as always, I'm going to bring in uh, two people now. Uh, one is appearing in his very first convention as a creator, um, and the other has a long history of amazing work. Uh, I'm going to bring in the one that's a real creator first, which is Rob Humphrey. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to bring in Pat, uh, who is who is a who's a baby creator. It's how, it's how you made up for uh, giving Pat top billing, right? <laughs> I've been preparing for this panel for days. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, since you have graphics and everything. <laughs> No, so I'm going to start off by saying you you guys are two of my best friends in the industry, and it's great to have you here. Thank you for coming on this crazy thing that I'm doing. Uh <laughs> Dude, we are so excited for this. and Thank you for – I won't speak for Pat because, you know, Pat could speak for himself. But, no, but Well, we try not to let him speak for himself. But uh, thank you so much for having us. And, man, congratulations. This, I mean, this whole experience – is a game changer. This this is an absolute game changer for the industry. Um, kudos to you, and Jen, Jesse, everybody involved. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Cal. Well, I want. I just want to say, yeah, and thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah. No, I just kind of wanted to echo what Rob was saying. It's it's. I've been I've been checking this out a lot this weekend and seeing some of these. You know. Guys like Howard Chaikin and 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 John Romita Jr. seeing these seeing these like just very uh, very just uh, personal and 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 familiar conversations with these guys. It's just it's it's just amazing to see this and just you know have that that kind of close access to these the, the, that level of creator and the 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 wide breadth of talent that's been on this weekend from you know. From true indie people all the way up to legends of the industry, it's is is pretty pretty incredible that you guys put this together. So congratulations! It's there's a, there's a huge kudos there. I I do not fanboy often. I have been doing comics and have done enough cons and have been around enough. Like I have a short list of of fanboy creators for myself, and Ramita Junior is right up there. So watching yesterday, I was like a nine year old kid again, just so excited. The whole time, I don't know if you can see it, Rob, and you'll appreciate that you can see I was grabbing my chair and grabbing my mm. arm because it was all I could do to keep from doing this. <laughs> like, you know, you, Rob, you're a Spider-Man nut, like just like mm. me, and getting to talk to John and Scott Hanna about their mm. Spider-Man, but getting to talk to John Romita Jr. was like one of those is like pinching myself like is this my real life right you know pulling my arm here to see if i'm awake you know that kind of stuff just <laughs> it's been a wild weekend but let's talk about you and by you i mean rob um <laughs> <laughs> so uh we'll start with rob rob how did you come to be a, a comic book creator and you know it's a long journey um so i have been involved with comics in some way shape or form as a fan uh as a retailer as as a i mean i've worn just about every hat i think at this point but i mean i started in as a fan is like a little little kid like back when kenner superpowers released you know how the, the the toys would come with comic books like the mini comics in them it's like that was my first exposure to the medium but then as like you know, around nine, ten years old. I think I had mentioned yesterday during the segment with uh, with John that, um, you know, I that's that point where like you start getting birthday money and you start spending it on on stuff. And like my first comics that I bought were Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Amazing Spider Man books off off the off the spinner racks, right? And finding um, Amazing Spider Man at that age set me up for a love of the medium. Uh, and then toward my late teens, I started doing, dabbling around with comics retail. I would do like mall shows, um, 
you know, reselling, uh, you know, at the kind of the, the, the boon of internet shopping. Uh, you know, I, I started my own online shop for a short period, uh, was part of my uh, local LCS, helping run that for a while. And then I've always had a, a, a writing background, right? Like I've always enjoyed it and was, I actually was on a path into journalism uh, at one point in my distant past, uh, being a high school graduate, going into college. And uh, sometime around, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years removed from college, I I kind of went, you love to write and you love comics. Why aren't you writing comics? And I'm like, I wonder how you go about doing that. And just one day it kind of all came together. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. And I just started writing for myself. And then opportunities began to open up in terms of being able to do web comics and, and self-publish. And that's, I mean, it really just started as me being a fan as a kid and being a, an avid writer. And then it just spiraled into this. <laughs> and and you have, you. we're going to talk about, I think I'm going to talk about punching the clock probably the most. Because, well, one, I like the name. And two, it's totally relatable. Uh, I think everybody who's ever had a job uh, can relate to punching the clock. So uh, you you drew on your own life for your comics mm -hmm. in a lot of way. And how how does that work, telling telling a semi-autobiographical or almost completely autobiographical story? You know, so it's interesting. Um, I tried not to place the focus on me and – Really, the entirety of Punching the Clock is a love letter to my best friend. Uh, the, the main character in the book, Jeff, who resembles me in appearance, is actually him personality-wise. Uh, some of the stuff that that character gets away with is the type of stuff that Jeff would pull all the time in real life uh, as we were working. I mean, there's nothing better. You, you can have the worst job in the world, but if you're working with your best friend, it's, it's, it's bearable, right? And we've all had crummy service jobs and, and, you know, everybody deals with the public at some point in their life. And it's, to your point, it's relatable. So, you know, I had spent six years working for um, coming out of high school, going into college. I, I spent six years working at a particular retailer that I won't name, but I'll just identify by a bullseye. Uh, and uh, when I left that place, I was told by a number of people that I should you know, write a book because I had all these wild stories about just stupid stuff that happened, whether it be dealing with the general public or like the idiocy that goes on behind the scenes, dealing with management or, or, you know, your, your coworkers when they, you know, when you're doing something to pass the time and entertain yourself while you're, while you're on the grind, you know? So just started there. And then I had post, post that moved into another retailer. And I mean, it, it, after a while, it just became catharsis. When I decided I was going to write comics, I, I decided to go down that rabbit hole uh, because I was still working a retail job and was it, it was therapy. It, it was it, it was how I was surviving, you know, mentally uh, was was having an outlet for it. So. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to let him talk now. I've been. <laughs> Guys, just so you know, if you're watching this, you're like, why is it being so mean? Just remember that I love these people. They're some of my best friends in the world. And if I'm not trolling Pat, I'm probably not breathing. So true story. Pat, it's, Pat, it's like a second language. It is. And it's it's a second. It's a shorthand that all of our con friends have. All of our con family have making fun of Pat, asking where he is when he's supposed to be there and he's not. Um you know, <laughs> the bad part is, is that started without me actually having ever supposed to have been somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know, but the, you know, these stories, uh, us making fun of Pat, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but we're, uh, we're going to, we're going to first give you a chance to uh, tell people how you came to be in comics, uh, and why, why you chose comics. And then, um, if for no other reason than you'll appreciate this. Uh, I need to do a technical thing real quick. Uh, so tell us about uh, tell us about uh, get in the game. Okay. So I started out. Um, I, I I didn't take really the traditional comics path. I didn't. I'm not. 
I've I always knew comics and I loved comics and I'd grab them here or there, but I wasn't the fervent collector that so many were um, that, that are in our industry. Um, obviously, I was you know super familiar with with Spider Man and Superman and Batman and and you know the what we might call the big three. Um, <laughs> but you know I I wasn't in the you know I, I wasn't collecting in, uh, in tons when I was a kid. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with I didn't really grow up around an LCS. That we didn't really have an LCS in my neighborhood. Uh, even growing up in the Detroit area, it, it, we di we didn't really have anything. Uh, the 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 suburb I was in didn't you know, and the grocery stores had like a spinner rack, and you, you know, uh, I didn't go grocery shopping with my parents, so it's like I wasn't in there, and, and you know, it was a lot of that. So it's I had that cursory knowledge, and I knew about it, and I you know, and obviously I still loved Star Wars, and I knew all these things, but you know. It, it, it's it's very different for me. I kind of jumped back in, um, and I jumped kind of in with both feet around the new Fifty Two time, uh, because it was it was it. I was their target audience. You know, I was like, "Hey, we're rebooting. We're gonna make major reboot, and everything's coming back to number ones." And this is a perfect time to jump on. So I literally was this exactly what they were hoping for from 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 that. So. Um, and from there, uh, getting involved in a uh, comic convention uh, and, 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 you know, promoting for that, it really brought that, that kind of love and desire and seeing all these, these great people that are creating this stuff. And I never really had the confidence to, in my writing ability and definitely didn't have the confidence in my heart abilities. So kind of started out with a podcast, like, you know, so many others do, <laughs> uh, and, and went that route, and it just kind of had been bugging me in the back of my head of, like, you need to do something. You need to publish something. You need to publish something. So uh, at the beginning of 2019, I decided that I was insane and decided to do a uh, an anthology book with uh, 10 different creative teams <laughs> as my first project. Uh, wrote one of the stories in there. Uh and kind of shepherded the other nine to to fruition on that, and kickstarted it, and went and got it together, and that getting the game was born. Um, so it's a ten page. It, it's a it is a collection of eight page comics by by ten different creative teams based around one simple prompt: video games. That's it. That was the only prompt that people were given. There, there were no rules. There were no, it, it must be this type. It must be that type. And what came back was pretty incredible because you don't think about what can be in a, a video game inspired until you see these stories. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, Dirk. Yeah. My, that's my collecting time. I obviously I have cursory knowledge, but. <laughs> Pat, Pat went from like having his toes in the water to like jumping into the deep end. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, one of the things I want to ask, I wanted to ask about about getting the game, is you had people contributing to that, excuse me, to that book. That also weren't comic book creators before they got on that book. Correct. Uh, a prime example is our friend Dave, who was a print journalist. He was a newsman. You mm -hmm. know. He's the guy running around in the funny hat with the, the, the piece of paper coming out of it that says news. Uh, and, 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 that's what's, and that's what's beautiful about it because we have first timers, people who have never made a comic before, like Dave, myself, uh, Michelle Gallagher. She, she, she had never done anything. Um, uh, Sam Chestnut from the Get Good Story. Uh, he'd never done anything up to people like Rob who are kind of getting, you know, getting more and more stuff out there. He, you know, he's, he's continuing to create a, 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 a body of work up to people like Seth the Moose and Kaylin Smith who are established and, you know, giants of the indie comic industry. Uh, so it, it was, it was a huge, like very wide breadth of talent that, that went into this. And I was super blessed to, to have all these people want to be a part of this and, uh, and who who knows what the future holds? Because I know there's some people who are mad at me that they didn't get to be in the book. So, 
Well, there's some people who are mad at you for existing. So. Guys, after three days of this, I need a panel where I can just have some fun with you. Uh, and so we're going to do that. But um, no, uh, so you kickstarted the book mm -hmm. and crowdfunded. And then uh, it got noticed by uh, SourcePoint. And I know they helped you put it together and are involved a little bit uh, in some regards. Uh, what is how, do, how does that? I, I don't I don't really care to dig into all of that, but the question I have is how does it feel that on your first time out you've got you know a, a publisher that's having a ton of success right now interested in at the very least coming along and being like, hey, try this, do this thing, it'll help. Yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing. I mean, I I am absolutely floored that in uh what is it, a week from tomorrow? Is, is, is this the second to last Wednesday? Yeah. So, oh, excuse me, a week from Wednesday, the new previews is going to hit the, the comic book shops and then the game's going to be in there for, for April release into, into comic book shops through diamond. It's, it's pretty incredible to sit there and think about that of like, Hey, they believed in this enough to put their name on it. Who in source point press is putting out incredible product right now. I mean, you've got Franklin and ghost, You've got Dead End Kids, uh, Broken Gargoyles. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm going to give him credit. Claim. <laughs> if, if there's anybody that gets more grief than me, it's Greg Wright. Um, <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, it, which which it, it, it's to to be in that in that level, to be in that group of of creators, to to, to be a part of that is is pretty special. Um, for for something like this to have been believed in to that level that they want to put their name on it um, and, and help that distribution and, and and get that through there and we had a wonderfully successful Kickstarter I was I was super happy that uh, we, we raised the goal I was I, I was shocked honestly I kind of put it you know I put it out there in a way that I'm like this should cover if this we if we do this it's gonna you know it's gonna be good and we'll we'll be we'll be okay and it, it fully expecting that man I'm a, I don't know <laughs> uh, but but yeah it, it was it, all the support we got the you know it was just absolutely incredible to see and seeing names pop in there I, I'm like oh okay I'm gonna see a bunch of people I know you know because you you help each other you you support each other's projects but. See, you seeing all over the country, all over the you know, even all over the world for the digital version uh, was 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 spectacular. So, <clears throat> one of the one of the the interesting things about both of you is that in terms of being fans and creators, you're also convention people. Uh, talk, tell everybody about Cherry Capital and. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off by saying Cherry Capital Comic Con is one of the most special Comic Cons in the country. If you've never visited, visit. Uh, if for no reason other than there's a candy store in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> if for uh, no other reason, right? <laughs> so, man, you know, I think we've told this story so many different times in so many different venues that you'd think it would be easy to recount, but... So we've been doing Cherry Capital Comic Con for, well, you know, pandemic year would have been been our 12th show, um, but we keep kicking the can because, you know, hmm. of that pandemic. So the 12th show will happen when the world is safe, I guess. But um, so, you know, we've been, been at this for like 12 years. It started as an idea, right? You know, I, um, I left uh, working at my LCS um, probably about 13 years ago and change. Um, I was working a full-time job and I was working full-time at my LCS to help keep it running. And uh, then a uh, kid comes along. So you got to make some hard choices. And unfortunately, working at a comic shop wasn't, uh, wasn't in the pay the bills plan. So stepped away from that, but still stayed tied to the medium. And, you know, you go and you hang at a comic shop, you talk to your friends, 
and we, you know, start talking about like, well, you know, what's kind of the next step beyond having a comic shop? Well, what about a comic con? And do you think, do you think this area would support it? Northern Michigan's very interesting uh, microcosm, uh, especially in, in in our area in Traverse City, that um, it doesn't behave as economically as a lot of the rest of the state does. Uh, it's a very tourist driven destination. Um, you know, in the summertime, there's a, a national festival that happens here that brings in, you know, over a million visitors. And, and this is to a town that, you know, within the city limits usually has a population of, you know, 15 to 25,000 people, you know, so it's, you know, in the greater surrounding areas, more than like the 100,000 uh, population uh, range. So, you know, from a, from an infrastructure perspective, um, you know, the town isn't built to handle this huge influx of people but yet somehow it manages to do it. So you start thinking about, you know, we have all these hotels and this, this great, great food scene and these, you know, this great entertainment and art scene. I mean, Traverse City's got, you know, just down the road is the Interlock and Arts Academy. Um, you know, there's there's a real like little bohemia feel to part of the town. Um, you know, the arts are alive here. And, uh, you know, we started talking about what would it take to put on a convention and we just, we started talking to local potential sponsors, talking to our radio stations, um, you know, found a partner that was really, you know, that was ready to jump on board and, and in, a, in a fun way kind of committed us before we were ready to. Um, the, 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 the advertisements for that first show, um, unbeknownst to us at the time, um, you know, our, our, our local uh, uh, DJ went live, you know, and uh, was like, gonna be a Comic-Con in Traverse City, here's the dates. And it was like three months away. So like that first year, we planned a show in three months, and, if, and, and be shocked that my entire like head of hair isn't all gray, uh, because anybody that's done a convention will tell you that um, you know it's like trying to plan a wedding in three months. Good luck, right? You know you can do it, but is it going to be good? Probably not, <laughs> right? So um, that first year was like you know, 50 or 60 tables, uh, a, a number of independent uh, writers and artists. We had um, uh, uh, Tommy Lee Edwards, we had Daniel Way, we had um, uh, we had Gary Reed, uh, we had uh, Jason Howard that first year, you know, a lot of, a lot of Michigan guys. And, um, you know, Gary was repping Transfusion at that time. Um, he was kind of, uh, uh, you know, Caliber had kind of, uh, 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 become transfusion and, you know, or at least was starting to marry brands. And, um, you know, so it was just this interesting year of like having retailers and a couple of big guests. And we're like, ah, oh, if we get a couple hundred people, we'll be happy. And and the people came and, and it was successful enough that we said, we could probably do this again and actually like take a year to plan it and maybe do it right. And so those first five or six years were really just us learning as we went and here we are, you know, 12 years later, and it's a huge regional show. People travel from all over the region. People travel from all over the U.S. We've had, um, you know, we, 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 had, uh, we had Jim Steranko. We've had uh, David Finch. We've had um, Jim O'Barr. We had Jim O'Barr. Uh, you know, and Jim's, Jim's a Michigan guy. You know, he, he doesn't live in Michigan anymore, but, I mean, he, you know, he's a he's Michigan native, so it was fun to bring him back home. We've had, I mean, we've had so many just, names in the industry and it's also too it's been fun because you get to really showcase the midwest is a hotbed of amazing comics talent you know, I, I love so i love the snub i love the snub of steggy because it's just so perfect but i'm not actively snubbing ryan stegman i love ryan stegman so R ryan did uh cherry capital like we brought him in right when he started doing uh i think sif he had really sif at marvel it was like his first Marvel work, and he he came and did the show, and then has been with us quite a bit afterward. Kyle, the you look like you really plug is Aaron Stegman, because without Aaron, Ryan would never make it to any conventions. <laughs> um, so you know, it's we all know Ryan really well. We've known him for years, and it's 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 true. Ryan's you know, good dude, but Aaron Aaron is his success is due to Aaron. <laughs> like, He's a rock star. It just it just whatever you do, don't look for him on Sunday afternoon. Or anytime three hours before the show floor closes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so, it, we 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 went down this path, and now it's just you know it's blown up to a to a big regional event, and yeah, I mean, 
It, it, it was it was for the longest time. It was R Rob and uh, Mike planning it with a little bit of help from uh, uh, from uh, some other partners. That uh, was like, it, but it was I mean it was Rob and Mike, and then that was it. And I think around year six, they realized that 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 just wasn't working no more because you know trying to handle this show that's that's channeling three three thousand people through the door now and uh, over the weekend, uh, you know. So now we're we're at about a staff of. 12, 13 people that are, that are actively involved in, in planning and, and, and everything. So, you know, we have a, we have a great team of people who are, who are just super unsung because they just don't, you know, they're not like Rob and I, they don't, they don't need that spotlight. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't have that drive to be like, look at me. Is this a but, shout out but, to Aunt Cheryl? Is that what you're saying? Aunt Cheryl, we could not do the show without Aunt Cheryl. No. <laughs> And Cheryl runs the ticket boost like a switch watch, Swiss watch, man. She's fantastic. That 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 and Linda. Yep. Mike Mike's mom. We we could yep. not do it without either of them. So one of the things that and I don't want to talk too much more about Cherry because coming up to the time of the show, we'll be on we'll definitely be talking about it. We'll we'll get Mike to show his face on the internet and those kind of things. Yeah. Um Mike, Mike, yeah. uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and there he is. There he is. There you go, Richard. You get the spotlight. Richard got the spotlight. There you go, Richard. <laughs> uh, it's good to see you, man. We haven't we haven't done one of those Zoom hangouts where I get to talk to Richard in a while. But <laughs> no, um. So, but I want to talk about there. There's also a huge amount of sentimentality at Cherry, um, and and by that I mean you have the Gary Reed uh, Independent Creator of the Year Award, which is your memorial to Gary. Um, and you also have the Steve Dillon Memorial Drink and Draw to benefit Hero Initiative. Yeah. So there's a huge amount of sentimentality at the show. Uh, oh, perfect. Now he's going back to work. All right. <laughs> See you, Richard. Um, so tell me about how we'll start with the Drink and Draw, and then we'll go to yeah. Gary Reed Award, because there's some Gary Reed Award announcement type things that we can talk about. Um. But tell me how that came to be. Yeah, so it they really kind of went hand in hand. We lost Steve and Gary very close to each other. Three um, weeks apart. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah, sure. like three or four weeks apart. And um, it's interesting because so Gary was an early supporter of Cherry Capital, like from year one. Um, I mentioned he was at the first show and had done subsequent shows. And um you know, really kind of embodied what Michigan comics were and what Midwest comics were. But Steve, uh, Steve kind of became a part of the family. We had Steve Dillon. He was a repeat offender at the show. We had him year two and year four. And, um, you know, we flew him in. And uh, Steve was the nicest, most knowledgeable and just fun guy to be around, right? Like, we, we always... This, you talk about the sentimentality. We talk a lot about that when when you you come to the show, um, if you, you know you come as a guest, you come as a retailer, you come as a artist, writer, whatever, you come as a as a fan, that you're immediately adopted into the family, that you're part of the C4 family. We we talk about that a lot. It's not just a you know a, a sales shtick or advertising. It's I mean it's really it's true. Uh, you know the friendships and and the the darn near family type relationships that have spawned out of the show. I mean, some of my best friends and some some lifelong after well after I am done in comics, whatever that may be, um, so many of these people will still be friends and people I stay in contact with and, and want to hang out with. And um, Steve was one of those guys that just got what we were doing and got it a lot faster than what he other people at the time were, and he just fit the family so much that um you know we we couldn't wait to have him back after he left the first time i mean i have never seen i have never seen a grown man drink so much guinness and eat so little food and be a, a better more fully functioning human being than everybody else that was there at that point he just just this this rock this stoic like wise dad that was there you know for the ride and um we had actually had had plans to bring bring him back a third time 
uh, and unfortunately his, his untimely passing um, cut that idea uh, short. Um, we weren't able to do that. But the the, the drink and draw, we, we had started doing, we always try to do some charity work. Um, we work with the 501st Legion. We usually do a kid's charity um, and raise money with them. But then uh, we started doing the drink and draw and we wanted to um, we wanted to do another uh, charity uh, type event centered around that. And, um, you know, we, we caught a little flack, uh, you know, because Steve, Steve had some health problems, you know, tied from his years of, of, of drinking and um, just, you know, so the air is clear. Um, you know, we before we assigned his name to it, we did get clearance from his family. And, you know, we were in close contact, talked quite a bit, you know, and we said, hey, Steve had this huge Love of the Hero initiative. He would sit at his table and some of my fondest memories are, you know, he would sit and do sketches and do commissions for people and he wouldn't take a dime of people's money for himself. But he always had a jar out on the table and he said, hey, you want to sketch? I'll do whatever you want. Just put some money in the can for the Hero Initiative. You know, so that was that was his thing. It was his passion. That was what he was focused on when he did shows. He had gotten to a point where he was worried about other creators. And we thought what better way to honor his legacy than to take our new charity event, which is really just a fun excuse for all of us to hang out after hours, right? And and see some cool art getting made. But to be able to take that experience and be able to take money raised from the, the sales of the artwork that come from that event and put it toward such a great cause that gives back to the industry because that's what Steve was all about. And uh, we felt there was really no better way to honor him than to do that. It's true. Uh, you know, and then the, the, you'd have that, that's usually Friday night and then Saturday night it's cherry -oaky happens, but the real thing that happens is that there's the auction for everything that's mm -hmm. created at the drink and draw. Uh, there's a chance to buy art mm -hmm. for, and all the money from it goes to, uh, goes to hero initiative. And what's always great. And, and, and I say always because I've done it once, but I know it's true is that at the end of the night, there stands people like me and Mike with the credit card out go, mm -hmm. we'll buy every last piece. We want to make sure as much money goes to hero initiative as needs to get there as we can give them. And it's, it's really, a uh, 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 it speaks a lot to, to the, the atmosphere there and the mentality there at Cherry Capital that the rest of it's not important. It's this, and then it's the Gary Reed award and it's, you know, that's all great that we get to do that, but we're really here for a bigger call, bigger purpose a lot of the time. And that is family and the mm -hmm. comic book family. So we have a comment from Alex Larson. Rob has an enormous heart and he attracts those kind of people. And that's why C4 is successful. It Man. starts at the top. And that's, that's very kind of Alex to say, I love that guy. And I'm not just saying it because he said nice things. Alex is good. <laughs> right. Well, he also said Pat was handsome, which we all know was a, <laughs> you just so, shot your credibility right right in the leg out <laughs> uh i was saving the second comment for after we said something nice about yeah. all right <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> we're, all we're right um, well it, it's that's true uh c4 is family period um the, the the thing i will say about about steve is steve at all times was the epitome of an english gentleman mm -hmm. that that man was was if you look up english gentleman in the dictionary it should have a picture of steve dylan the, the he just everybody was his friend no matter what there was never a a a, a, a an unkind word in his mind it's true. Um, so now tell us about the Gary Reed independent creator of the year award. Uh, you know, it's gone to this year. It went to its first non bearded person, which is weird. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so this will be the fifth, uh, annual, uh, awarding of the Gary Reed independent creator of the year. And, uh, Anybody who knows Gary knows that the 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 only thing he would hate about this award is that it's named after him. <laughs> um, Gary was like Rob said; he was a big a big fan and friend of the show from from year one, and believed in what we were doing. He he also saw exactly what we were trying to do, and, and what the the thought process was for the show, 
Um, and Gary was uh, generous with his uh, advice as well as his criticism because his criticism was always constructive. It could it it could be the most biting criticism you've ever gotten, but it was poignant and it was relatable and you took it to heart because if he didn't like it, if he didn't see something in it, he just wouldn't take the time. He 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 if he's taking time to talk to you about what it is that that you're, you he's seeing, he believes in it, he he has he he sees something in you. So whether whether his criticism was harsh or whatever, it, it, if you were being criticized, it meant you were worth being criticized. And that in and of itself is just amazing. But Gary consistently wanted to produce things and he wanted to bring that next generation on. He wanted to bring them up with him. It wasn't, I'm going to step over you. I'm not stepping on stepping on you. You know, Seth Seth was the, uh, initial, the, the inaugural winner of this award. Seth the Moose won this the first year. And it's so appropriate because Seth's constant refrain is his same team. You know, you're always hearing him talking about same team, and that's exactly what it is. Gary looked at it as same team. We're we're all doing the same thing. The when we all win, we all win. Right. So when he passed, we really we were all gutted because it was literally like the Monroe Comic Con, and then the Monday morning we find out. I mean, people were, you know, it, it was very much one of those times where I was just talking to him last night type situations. And we want, once again, we we have done this. We were in contact with, with Gary's family. They were, they, they were so supportive of this. They saw, they knew that we weren't doing this for anything other than to carry on Gary's spirit and to carry on his legacy. Um, so each year we put put out their applications for pr uh, professionals, for your peers, and for the fans to nominate independent creators who most espouse Gary's spirit by putting out their product, putting out new things, and at the same time lifting up others with them, being generous with their with their time, being generous with their advice. Um, and we've had just an incredible list of people who won that. The first was Seth DeMoose, uh, then Dan Doherty, uh, Dan with Beardo, and he's he teaches he teaches at the comic schools in in Chicago. Travis McIntyre, who it is the the heart and soul behind SourcePoint Press. I mean, the guy is just the driving force. There there there's a lot of people who are involved in that, and none of them. Uh, you know, deserve less, you know, credit than Travis, but Travis absolutely was, it was out there hustling. And then last year, uh, Casey Pierce won. So we've, we've had just a, a crazy good list of people who have won this award who absolutely are, are, are doing what Gary was doing. Um, uh, uh, on a lighter note, Gavin Smith was here the other day, and uh, he was talking about how he won at Pro Tem, uh, as it needed to be. It needed to be in the hands of a bearded man until you gave it to Casey. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, shout out to Gavin. Uh, just synergy, but Casey deserve everybody who's won is deserving. Uh, now, when do the nominations open and that kind of stuff for the fans and for the pros? Uh, they sh shortly. <laughs> yeah so so with with uh the world being in the state that it is right everything's kind of on the fly um the uh fan and pro nominations go live uh in tandem together uh i would expect that we should have an announcement and forms up and ready for people um i would i would hope within the next week i think is what we're shooting for so uh moving on from cherry capital back into the world of you guys are creators. Uh, and I know Rob's answer, so I'm not going to ask Rob this question. I'm going to ask Pat this question. Well, because Rob and I have discussed it at length. Add, like, hours and hours of discussion, discussing this, probably. Uh, if you could take one character 
and put your hands on it and say, this is mine now, I'm going to do my thing, what character would it be? I know Rob would say Spider-Man because we've talked about it. So, Pat, who is that for you? I th – this is weird to me because – I it, and this really just kind of popped in my head as you're asking this question, but – I think it's, I think it's, he's not necessarily my favorite character. He's not necessarily like one I have a, a deep attachment to, but I think Superman, because I think Superman is one of the easiest and at the same time, hardest characters to write. They, it, the, 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 the plot points for a Superman story are pretty straightforward, but to make them interesting is such a challenge because you're taking at the end of the day, as powerful as he is, Superman's at his best when he's the everyman. That's when he is best. And it's just, it's so hard to write that. But I, but I think that would be where I'd just be like, this would be such a fun challenge to do. Um, because like I said, he's not necessarily my favorite character, but he has some of my favorite stories. I mean, grounded is a spectacular story that just does not get, uh, uh, what it, you know when he's walking across America and reconnecting with humanity and all that? It's just it's a powerful story. It you know so, it, I I always love the idea of Superman and therapy. Yeah, I I could see that that absolutely could be seen. Yeah, because he is he's a he's a broken person. He 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 is just as he is as fragile and broken as any of us. If there's anything that Pat knows about, <laughs> softball. <laughs> Why do you let me do this to you? It's Please. true. I'm so good Please. about it. So, all right, Rob. And if you say Pat, I will mute you. Uh, <laughs> is there someone out there who's a cre? Is there a creator out there that you've not had a chance to work with that you would like to work with? Man. So many. There are so many. Like, whoa. Uh, we're talking about like in our indie comic scene, right? With with uh, you know the crazy talent that's out there. I mean, I I got the dream of a lifetime to do a story with Kaylin Smith, right? I would love to do something with Seth the Moose. I would love to do something with Scoop McMahon. I would love to do something with. Uh, any number of the creators that we've come across, like Jay Foskett, um, you know, Gavin Smith, uh, there is that list is way too long. It's it's way way too long. There are so many good people in that circle. If we're talking like notable names, Ryan Lee, right? Ryan Lee's a guy that is a Michigan local. Uh, he did the cover to get in the game. Um, he did a book uh, with our buddy Chris uh, Muez a couple years ago called The Naturals. Did uh, He did a book with another guy that runs in our circles, Ryan Schrode, um, a couple years before that. And, you know, Ryan was on Mountainhead through IDW. Um, and he's just next level, just spectacular, just frenetic art. Like, uh, it, it's I could talk all day about the number of people that I would love to work with in this business. So I've been asking, I've been asking everyone, um, you know, some, some of the same questions, but Pat, you worked with a lot of people on the get in the game anthology and Rob, you've worked with a lot of people on, uh, on, uh, in your career, let's put it that way. Uh, what is, what is your collaborative collaborative process? Like, what do you, what if, what are your experiences? What, what do you think about when you think about collaboration? That kind of thing. I think it's for me, it's different depending on who it is I'm working with. Um, so early on with the punch in the clock, uh, stuff. I mean, that journey was, was very long. Um, and Jeff Manley and I worked on that book for three years together, three years plus, um, you know, hitting a weekly deadline, putting, putting out, uh, putting out strips and then collecting it. Um, I think probably the one thing that is, that I learned because Jeff was really the first, uh, the first artist that I worked with in a professional capacity, actually putting out a product. 
um, Jeff taught me a lot about trusting your artist, right? You know, and as, as a writer, you, you have this idea in your head when you script out, you know, what you want to see on the page, but you have to be willing to just let the person you're trusting with the art duties do their thing and do what they do best. Uh, and it's going to be so much better if you just trust the person you're working with to do what it is that they're there for. Um, that's probably my biggest takeaway from working with Jeff and something that I've tried to apply to working with everybody. But I found my collaborative process does change quite a bit that if it's somebody I've never worked with before, um, I tend to script a little tighter uh, where I will give a lot more detail uh, about detail and context about where things are placed, why I'm asking for certain things to be visible, and if it's going to be tied back to later in the story, like this is an important visual piece that needs to be in this panel because 16 pages from now, we're gonna revisit this item and it's gonna be part of you know part of the payoff. Um, I tend to script a little bit tighter if it's somebody that I've never worked with before. If it's somebody that I have a familiarity with, that I'm friends with, or, or that I've um, you know had some sort of professional capacity with, I tend to do a lot more um, upfront talking. Like there's a lot more discussion about before you start putting pen to paper, before you really start scripting out the details of like at a high level, what are we trying to accomplish as a team? What do we want to put out there? Like, here's my idea. What do you see? And what does that world look like? Because it's really about, it's world building at that point when you're starting with a brand new property and you're, you're building from the ground up and your co-creator is just as much a part of that, right? Whether, whether you're a writer or an artist, you know, getting on the same page to tell the same story is, is, is super, super important. Yeah. Pat, as an editor, I'm going to, I'm not going to ask you as a writer. I'm going to ask you as someone who edited a book, what was the, what was it like collaborating with so many different groups of people? And I, I know a lot of the credit for being able to be good at that, that because you have been, goes to you were mentored by Drina, who will be on next hour. So we're just going to start off the top with shout out Drina Joe for teaching us all how to be better at this job. So <laughs> she really yeah, beyond that, though, that, what was, that, that was amazing. With so many people. I'm I'm gonna continue to give her shout outs because she she was absolutely amazing. I you know you, you, you do this and you think oh yeah this shouldn't be too bad it, it's it's gonna be okay and you know you, through through the process you know it, it's it started with literal just, just just pitches. I didn't I didn't want people to start sending in full scripts. I didn't want anything like that. Um, and I, and I really just went off what I felt from the pitch, um, which isn't necessarily bad, but you end up with some that maybe aren't really uh all that script ready when when you go for scripting um and you know the, 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 the no for, first time creator there's there's no ab absolutely no judgment but you know they they had they had put together a script it was a mountain of panels for eight pages they had the panel layouts all set up before they even sent it to the artists and it's just like okay i can tell that I can't do this. <laughs> I can't edit this. So I brought Drina on and she was so generous with her time and so willing to, to, to help with it. And it, it really, it, but it, but it really just kind of, you know, she, she, she gave me more and more, more and more guidance. It just, what you have to figure out what the personalities you're dealing with are because we're all artists. We're all eccentric. We're, we're all, we're all a little bit crazy. I don't, I don't say that in a bad way. And there's, you know, and and I and I don't mean to offend anybody by that, but we all, you know, we all have our eccentricities, and it's <laughs> go on. Uh, where, <laughs> where? So it's 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 finding that way to communicate, and I think that was the most difficult thing. Is 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 this person gonna get upset because you're you you want them to change something in their art? It, are, are they gonna are they gonna be upset because this? It, it, you know that this phrase doesn't really work or it's too wordy for for this panel or what's what's that gonna look like um so I mean really that was just a huge learning experience going through that and and, and learning from all these people I think the hardest thing on anything is is sticking to deadlines um it's it's absolutely incredible to to see that uh but you know it's it it, it 
I think I was as surprised as anybody that the book actually came to print. <laughs> Well, I mean, we did have a series of very successful mocking hashtags. Yes. So, I had I have know. nothing but faith in you, Pat. Oh, I believed it would come out, but I was going to ride it for all the comedy it was worth. So, <laughs> but it, yeah, it is. It's really funny to see that like, to to go through and, and and you're dealing with with 25 different personalities because yeah, there's there's 10 teams, but there's you know there's artists, letterers colors you know it, there, there were a number of parts that it was you know, you know one person did pencils and inks that's all they did you, you know on a couple of those projects so somebody else is coloring somebody else is lettering and and, and again you've talked about this quite a bit this week because you've had ink, inkers on you've had uh, uh, colorists on that they're just so the unsung heroes of of comics uh, to to sit there and and you just you just don't know what you're missing if you're not paying attention to those people because they add so much and they have so they have different talents. Mm -hmm. It is it's my fervent belief that the real true unsung heroes in comics are the letterers. People don't understand what an art lettering is, but just behind them are color artists and inkers, ink artists. Like you know those guys. If 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 you just turn in a book with blue lines, it's going to look real funny. You gotta, you gotta have the whole creative team. Otherwise, you don't get a final product that's worth anything. And so, not all pencilers, no matter how good they are on pencils, not all of them can ink. Right. You yeah. know. Right. Absolutely. So uh, we've got we've got a few minutes left here, and so I'm going to ask uh, some fun questions now, and then we're going to talk about what people can buy from you and where they can buy it and that kind of thing. So be prepared to plug yourself. Um, First question is, favorite Pokemon? Hands down, Pikachu, Pat, all day long. Pat, go first. I already uh, went. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I didn't have you on screen. Uh, it, it, it's it's got to be Gen 1. It's got to be Charmander because fire type for the win. That's fair. Rob? Hands down, Pikachu, all day long. Snorlax. It's Snor The correct answer is Snorlax. <laughs> Well, he's my spirit animal. That's what I'd say. That's <laughs> in fact in my Pokemon Go, he's labeled a spirit here. animal. No. <laughs> no. Um. All right. So, where, uh, Rob? You have you have punching the clock. You also have gunslingers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what do you have? Any other projects we need to know about that you're working oh, on or have out okay. that okay, I we'll are we'll escaping my brain? Let's do the quick plug. Yeah. There are multiple volumes of Punch in the Clock available. Yes. There's Get in the Game. I came prepared. Gunslingers from Rocketing Studios. Uh, I did a stint in Heather Antos's Unlawful Good, an anthology of crime. I even did a, a I, I helped curate a uh, project uh, uh, with Lucasfilm a few years ago called Fight Like a Jedi. It was a, 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 a personal project uh, with. Um, some ties to uh, raising some money uh, to help a local Star Wars fan. So I've had my fingers in a lot over the years. You can buy most of this, uh, the stuff that is still in print and available through my website at, uh, at robhumphreycomics.com. Um, current and new projects coming out. Um, I have three things that I am currently writing that I can't talk about. Let's just say that w at least one of those projects involves a sequel to something I've written and one of those projects involves a return trip to Rocketing Studios. Um, so hopefully we will see uh, in 2021, at least one of those projects, uh, not just get announced, but fully come to fruition. Um, if I that, drive up and beat Uncle Tony with a sandwich to get, <laughs> to, get to get it out, let me know. <laughs> I think uh, I, I think uh, I think there's a vested interest in having uh, in in having multiple projects uh, ready to go here. <laughs> um, I need to. I, I'll tell you, man. The pandemic is something. I, uh, I I have. It's. I think it's a real thing that the whole like not being motivated to create like and not feeling bad about it. It's just attempting to survive. I've definitely had, aside from a couple of contracted projects, I have. Um, I have a couple of personal projects that I'm writing for myself that are either going to get shopped to a publisher or self-published, one of the two. 
Uh, and, you know, I haven't made nearly as much headway on any of that stuff as I've wanted to, because it's just been about mental self-care, you know, this sure. last year. Um, but a lot of those, uh, a lot of those announcements, um, now that we're, we're hopefully coming out of this and, uh, I'm finding more time in my routine to actively finish off and, uh, finish writing these projects, uh, announcements soon. All right, Pat. Uh, you can find uh, the the archives of, of my old podcast that sometimes makes returns at digitalnerdish.com. Uh, that will be at a storefront will be adding to that soon. I haven't done it yet, um, where obviously you'll be able to get get in the game, uh, which also again will be in previews for February. So you'll be seeing me hammering that link out a lot. Um, <laughs> So if you follow me on social media, I am sorry in advance. <laughs> uh, I am pretty and much... And not just because of all the shameless plugging. It's for all the content that he publishes. <laughs> uh, Instagram and Twitter, I'm at, at Professor Nerdly, as you see on the screen. Uh, and then just my name on, on Facebook for now. Um, there are a couple of things that I have in the pipeline. Um Neither of them are at a point that they, they can be announced. Mostly they are ones in the uh, world building stage. I haven't even started scripting it out, but it's, you know, I'm getting all the, the character ideas together and all that fun stuff that, that happens with that. One is at a, a, a rough draft stage that it, it, needs, a, uh, it needs another overhaul. Um, realized through some conversations with some people that I was going for the wrong feel with the project. So I'm going to take another run at it and be a, be a little closer to my voice as opposed to trying to be somebody else. And those that, that one, hopefully I'm going to be able to get back to again, Rob, Rob nailed it. This year has been tough with the uh, just taking care of the self care. It's, it's hard to hit that um, hit, 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 hit that uh, writing goal. Uh, but also I have uh Three. I, I don't know the, the the publishing timelines on these yet. I don't know where they're coming from. Uh, but David Hayes is curating uh, uh, three different books of essays around the collected works of Steven Seagal, Chuck Norris, and Jean Claude Van Damme. And I will have essays in each of those three books. Um, <laughs> they they're absolutely amazing. I, I I can't I can't wait to read them myself. I know I know what I did and and what I did was interesting, but I can imagine that some people went to a really different place. So, all right, I wanna I wanna I wanna take just a second and thank Pat and Rob for being here. Make sure you check out Cherry Capital Comic Con, Rocketing Studios, Source Point Press, all these places. Rob Humphrey's website. Uh, don't listen to Pat's podcast. I'm kidding. Definitely listen to Pat's podcast. I've been on it. I want people to listen to my voice. So, uh, like, let uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, we are uh, we are just out of time, so we are gonna uh, hit our top of the hour. And guys, coming up next on the EXP Expo Day Three, Miss Jen King comes back, and she has a panel that so many of you have been waiting for anxiously and with bated breath. We're gonna get to it just as fast as we can, and we will be back in just about a minute. All right, welcome back in, Miss Jen. My camera is frozen, so I'm going to get out of here. Are you ready? <laughs> I am totally ready. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Jen King. Uh, you're watching the EXP Expo on the experience, and uh, we're at day three, and it just keeps getting better and better.
Like every single time I get to pop into a room and talk to people, I feel like finally I get to see all my friends. We usually get to do all this at convention where we get to see each other face to face. That feels a little bit weird. We have to look through a camera, but it's so much better than the the alternative, which is not to see each other at all. That is sad. We don't like that at all. So um, I get to meet people for the very first time. This is my favorite thing is like going in completely. I don't know anything. I don't know anything and that's fine. Um, I have uh, consumed some music from these gentlemen and, uh, and I love it. Oh my gosh. My problem when I'm uh, getting into a new thing, I'll talk about it in a second. Um, is I consume new things in a really weird way. So I'll talk to them about that. So <laughs> everybody, welcome in Jamie and Paul. What's up? How are you? Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. I, I hear we're fellow nerds. <laughs> we are. I mean, he's got the nerd them right there in his hands. Hello for it's me. It's awesome. awesome. <laughs> it is. That is awesome. I just picked wow. one up. And and they sent it in kind of a crappy hard stack, so I'm gonna have to trade that. But anyway, how's everybody doing? Hey, Jamie, how you doing? I'm doing good, Paul. How are you? I'm very good, thank you very much. Hi, Jen. How are you? I'm doing so well. I just got threat. Got Man through. Was like, king. Yep, I did three three interviews this morning, and then I went and slung comic books for two solid hours. Yes. And now I get to do this. My life is golden. That's living awesome. the dream. Living the dream. Don't Every we all? Day. I love it. <laughs> so i have to tell you so I, I was introduced to your music recently i've always wanted to listen to it but if you knew my life you would understand why it's hard to fit things in that are new and the way that i consume new things will also explain why it's hard to fit new things in is because when i find something i like i obsessively consume it so if it's a book series i read it over and over and over and over again until people you know something's wrong with that girl and for music it's the same way so um I started listening to your music on a awesome. really horrible sound system, by the way, on my computer. I do not recommend that. Don't don't start listening to it that way. That's dumb. That's but then awesome. I, I took it to my car, which is, you know, a fairly nice truck with a really great sound system. And then I really was like, oh, my gosh, this, this. Yeah. And I started really, jamming. I thought that Lift Me Up was going to be because I that's I saw I listened to that like. 50 times in a row. I thought that was mm -hmm. good. But I found a new one today. And then I'm sad that I'm not listening to it right now. Perfect problem. Oh, okay. That's, That's, a one. That's awesome. I'm all about that bass. We yes. We we feel we have a song for every mood that the world can put you in, for every mood that you've been put in or any place that you've yet to be in. We got a song for that. So I love that you're finding them in your own way. And I, I appreciate that because we're like that, too, in, in, in a certain way. Like we find something we, we like dive in. We get into it like we have to see it all, it can consume it all, whether it's a season, a series, a comic book, uh, a sports card set. Well, we need it all. We need it now. A so we can, we can relate to that thinking. We appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would say our, our uh, collecting habits lean a little more towards the addictive side because we just, we got to have it all. We want the true. Best, we want the worst. We want it all. If you got it, we want it. That's just that's how it is. is. That's how it goes in the collecting market. Paul, how, how far and how, how, how expensive have you gone for a, a pop you need, just had to have? Um, make sure nobody's listening. I've spent, I think the most I've really spent on a, a Funko Pop was like 2600 Wow. Okay. That's, that's, that's impressive. That's a lot of bread. That's there, a lot of bread. There's oh, yeah. people that are like, I spent 40000 I spent, like, the really, you know, I don't think I could go past that. I got kids and shit. My kids will be wanting yeah. to kill me. <laughs> I don't even like that show. Like, oh man, it just becomes. Once you go 26, oh, 50 that's and above. Oh, so good. <laughs> Holy shit. That's awesome. I, I can see them now. Like, wait a minute, Dad. You said you couldn't get me the PS5, but you got the Right. PS5, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like calling calling on past purchases. I remember in November, someone spent 2600 You're like, oh, man. Yeah, yeah so no, I, I love that. There's but something. I love the hunt. You know, I'm, for I'm sure. not so much of go to eBay and just buy what I want. I love the hunt. I love to be out and checking targets and checking walmarts and walgreens and wherever you that's can the fun though sports cards like we've been like that 
in some weird side of the other side of the coin, when you do all that, it accumulates all of your gas and you're driving around. So you so your money and your time. And then in some senses, it's kind of the, the same diff to just pay the premium to somebody who got it. In some senses, you pay less. But I do hear you. It is the fun of the hunt. And somehow that's that's how we that's how we grew up. Yep. But nowadays, it's like you go to hunt for things, and these people, you have to wake up earlier There's than the early bird. Dare I say you don't go to sleep when that bird is sleeping, and you be early before him or her. Like, it is, you got to be on top. Yeah, It's, it's crazy. crazy. It's, it know, is. With any successful venture, there's a secondary market. And sure. sports cards right now and Pokemon and Funko Pops are just. For real. And comic books, graded books. Love it. The resurgence is immense, and, and we're back, baby. We we're love back. that. We love that. We were just talking about that the other day, how like how how quickly, how rapidly comics are are, are gaining up in value. Everything, quite honestly, but the, with this being comic books, it's a, it's even graded comic books. In some cases, raw comic books. Yeah. And I don't know if it's even some points from the historical value or just the fact that people are home going stir crazy and just want to spend that stimulus. I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is, but I love it when it happens because – it brings it brings this electricity around the hobby and and all things fun. So it's like it's good to see that. It's like these books are gaining up at rapid rates. Like right. literally within a year's time, we're talking double in some cases in value. A lot of people are finally starting to get the value out of their collection. You know what I mean? A lot of that's true. The mm -hmm. '80s and the '90s that just absolutely really took it in the ear because it was so overproduced and mass sure. marketed. Now it's coming back. Those were the dark days. I just couldn't be happier, man. For all me too. Me too. It's a uh, funny, like you, you talk about. It's not even like it. It doesn't take a year anymore for right. for. Let's just throw out there, High Republic that just came out a star, new Star Wars book. That mm -hmm. one, that one had tripled in price before it hit the news the stands. Yeah, absolutely. Insane. And that's you talk about. Bot, you you, you know, add on top of that with. Oh, I was just saying you talking you, about. It. Like buyer incentives and one in 25s and all that. And you just start stacking that value. And it gets at some point, it prices itself out to where people are like, I can't. It came out two weeks ago. I'm not. It's $3,200. I'm not buying that. You know, like I'm just going to go for the one beneath it. It's like, but it's great to see that big of an activity and just that, that much attention. Anything that warrants that kind of attention is just is amazing. And that's what's happening right now, and that's an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, Star Wars. Jamie, who, who would you bow a bro out of the way for to to get as a collectible? Yeah, jeez, oh, would would I elbow a bro out of the way to get a new collectible? Now, you know, I don't think so. I think most of the time. Paul and I have 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 gotten collections or bought things with the intentions of of splitting them or 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 will rock paper scissor for for the odd piece or stuff like that. But yeah, most of the times, but we differ in some of the stuff that we collect. So luckily, I would never have to bow that, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though, but I love it. Though. It's like when you like stuff, it's 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 like it's like the biggest part of your day. I think in some cases to find it. Like, like Paul said, when you're out in the wild, you're picking up a script from like Walgreens and, oh my God, they got these new mystery boxes or or they got the Pokemon mystery box for like $30 with rando packs from back in the day. It's like, it's still, it still can be fun. You can try to find those little hidden gems throughout the day to still make it. It's, it's, it's awesome. I love that. We live for this shit. Yes, indeed. There he is. Oh, There's the man. Hello, guys. What up? What's up, man? How are you? Good to see you guys. Good to see you as well, Jen. We were getting the internet all situated. So right. <laughs> this is the new the new triple threat, right? <laughs> it is. All Heck the yeah. to you as well, man. Hey guys. Hey man. So where where do you do you have any like secret places you go and hunt collectibles? Like like somewhere off the beaten path that no one thinks of? As far yeah, as for us, I ain't telling mm -hmm. nobody. Yeah. he has he telling. has some of them behind him. So the real question is, where is he now? Because he <laughs> is where they are. We have come full <laughs> circle. No, uh, in 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 small dark spaces where sunlight does not shine mm -hmm. because it can yellow those bubbles. It can make those pages brittle. It is not your friend in the collectible world. So I've been told. There is Somebody's UV right. enhanced acrylic glass when we are grading these things on that pretense alone. So the insanity I speak is not really that insane. There we go. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys ever hit the, the antique mall or the, the flea market? Absolutely. 
most of the time when we're on the road, we try to do that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously it's been a while since we've been there, but when we, when we're privileged to go to like some of them places, we try to dip in there and just take it in, even take the phone out and like show go live or just whatever to like show people. This is like a slice of, of, of life that just doesn't exist anymore. And when you find those pockets in the universe, share them. There's a smell. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. <laughs> when you know like in the right place. It's yeah. true. If it's true. Yeah. And all you, you know you're in the right place. It's kitchen food. Get out of there. You're in the wrong mm -mm. place. You need to mm -mm. go in there and smell dust. <laughs> you and books you smell and old, old forgotten <laughs> basement. And that is where you are. I love it. I love it. Old it's book good. smell. When you can yeah. walk in and it's musty. Yeah. It's and like, you're like, yeah. I feel like I'm in yep. someone's someone's grandparents' garage. I don't mm -hmm. want to. Where are the dollar of stacks? Weird pizza. Yeah. <laughs> if, they, if they're serving hot pretzels, I'm out. Uh oh, uh -oh. I, just, I don't want to smell it could... over the over the valuables. No, <laughs> those are big signs, though. Those are big signs. If you're selling hot pretzels, it could be a good or a bad thing. <laughs> I've seen both. I've seen both, so I don't want to judge you by that. Oh, uh, that's fair. oh man, I love it. Good shit, Jamie. What's your first collectible? Can you remember back to what you the first, very first thing you got as a kiddo? Probably, I, I always gravitate back to the Mego, like Mego Batman. Like I had, I love Batman. And obviously that was probably the most, uh, like I guess, average toy you could find in the stores. Like Mego dominated the toy aisles. And it's like, I had one of those. And obviously because there's parts and pieces, I was a kid, I would lose. And I ended up acquiring several naked Batman <laughs> figures <laughs> throughout the course of my life. But nevertheless, I mean, if I had them all today, they're probably priceless. So, but no, that's awesome. That definitely, definitely Batman, definitely me go. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Did mom sew yep. some clothes for your, for your Batman? Yeah, well, you know, like, and that was what was cool, too, because you could really change it up and have Spider-Man go incognito as Batman to go hang out with, uh, uh, who would it be, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz and all the other lines that they made that were all interchangeable. The imagination, Mr. Manning, would take you anywhere. I know you can relate, sir. I would switch yeah. the heads. So you put, like, Spider-Man's head on Hulk's body and stuff like that. And then you, like, saying. I'd, like, write the story in my head about, like, I would spend more time, and this thing, I don't think, I think kids nowadays, they forget about the, the power of like playing with toys and stuff. Imagination. I would, I, I, would, I would spend hours like setting up like the whole scenario for like a 10 minute, like 10 minutes to play. There was time to break it all down, you know, and like go, you know, go. That's eat. awesome. That's yeah, awesome. I, I was watching the heads. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, would think I just collected <laughs> small shoe box full of heads. Right. No, Every time my say, babysitter I'll... came over, strategically placed somewhere in the house, ended that <laughs> just everywhere. I was just gonna say, like, I was watching these retro commercials, and and one of the key things that was said in a lot of them was, "You can imagine his rockets firing. Now you can imagine him shooting." I'm like, imagine. Hmm, imagination. You see SpongeBob. You started it off with SpongeBob, damn it. You took it back. The imagination. There he is. I'm telling you. It's like something that falls lost and 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 I think it's fresh. So when I see imagination happening, whether it be at play or in marketing, I smile and because I tip we my hat. Are the kings of the shortcuts? If there is a way to do something, we are gonna find a quicker way to do it. You know what I mean? Like you said, Dirk, I'm not setting up five hours worth of that. Uh-uh. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh -huh. I'm gonna print it out. I'm gonna tape it to the wall. It's just different now, man. It's right. fair it enough. Took the long fair enough. It is a different time. These kids. The turnaround walking. time should be lightning fast, is what he's saying. Like you right. should walk, man. We we paid attention to every detail, mm -hmm. we knew every bend in those figures. Sure. We knew every yes. accessory it came with. Yep. Now they just know it. Uh, it's a snake eyes. Right. Yeah. Right. No, you came you're, with like right. 50 different kinds of weapons and you had to try to, they, they only had like one thing that was different. Like the trigger was backward or <laughs> right. 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 Or like the, like the Chewbacca, like you would have to like stick it on his arm because like the hand wouldn't even hold the gun and stuff. And you had like certain spots, like, like that old, uh, that Darth Vader head case that you keep your guys in. You had like all their weapons. Yeah. 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 They couldn't cut them out quick enough. They couldn't keep them in the shelves. That's they right. They started making That's tertiary right. characters in the background. They were just like, right. who's that guy at the cantina bar? Cantina bar guy. Put him out on a 12 back. It's like, it's insane. Next yeah, thing you know, yeah. everybody had a character, but right. people loved it. And it's like, it, it, yeah. 
<laughs> we just have a different relationship than than the kids today, man. It is completely yeah. different. It's like we I don't want to say we appreciated it more, but we almost did because our kids are spoiled little assholes that get what they want most times. And now they're to the point where they're numb for oh, shit. nothing gets them excited. Fair enough. Oh, it's the attention much. span. Like, hey, it's the attention hey. span. Think about it. When when we were when we were that age, when we were their age, we hadn't seen any. We hadn't seen one tenth of the shit they've seen at their age. You know right. what I mean? Even via via through social media or there. whatever. You know, now it's like the products of central air in the internet. Like I, I, mm -hmm. I grew up with the sheet hanging that separated the front room from the rest of the house. Fair enough. No if you had the AC because... on, only if you had the AC right, on, right. consolidate that cool air into that one room. Now they <laughs> that, they don't know what that is. They're like, what? For sure. Yeah, well, they ain't never heard of that. And they don't know struggle. Uphill both ways. But, but it's interesting. That was, that was the bridge, too, to me to comics because, like, I'll never forget in the theater in Star Wars when you see that big ship come over the screen for the first time and you're like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. and, and that's eventually how I started getting like comics and stuff as well, because you could see things that you wouldn't see in other, any other place too. And again, that is triggered by imagination, you know, it's like, you know, if you could think it and someone could draw it, you could make it. And it's what led to kind of that, that path now where of course I got my, you know, fun goes and everything else, but books everywhere, you know, it just, yeah, it gets your but it all stems, it all stems from the imagination. And what's crazy is to think that if that is in fact, exactly what he's seen in his mind that we eventually seen on the screen. And it's just like when you write a book or, or, you know, it's illustrated and put to, you know, like out there, it's like, you're seeing someone's imagination come to life. And when others appreciate that, that's got to be the best form of flattery. It really has to be aside from all the other fun shit, like money and fame and all that other crap, but just like having somebody acknowledge that, hey man, your imagination is fucking rad, dude. Like, I love that. Like, that's right. gotta be, that's gotta be great. You know what I mean? So, like, I do it every time I see Star Wars. Ringo, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. That's dope. Like, that's it's crazy, crazy, man. Yeah. Hey, you know what? It's cool, though. It's cool to have any of those accolades because it just adds to it adds to the file card of, of two guys who 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 joined a, a talented writer to bring a, to life a project that probably would have, should have, could have never happened, but did. Yep. Ha ha. Welcome the path of the ninja. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Nice to meet you. We got the elite ninja team. See, there he is. I'm trying to tell you. Like you said, it's three, awesome, man. We've had we've had some ups and downs, but it's been cool. It's been it's been crazy, and it seems like it's just getting started. So we're having we're having a blast. It's yeah, great. We're taking off now. We got the trade paperback coming out next month. Through it went through previews. Like you could get it through us, mm -hmm. be able to get it if all these lovely comic shop owners pick it up. Because I'm telling you, yeah. there she has it right there. It, yeah. See, you have you have all the good stuff. It, it appears yeah. that she's got the out of print stuff too. Yeah, he does don't jet, take jet. Up space. This stuff is gone, man. It is very, awesome. Very That's wanted it. and we're so appreciative of that. Very cool. Seriously. Jen, Jen was an early adapter too. You know, I mean, Jen, mm -hmm. Jen was one of the ones that even we were at the diamond retailer summit and stuff like that. And uh, I'm not going to put you on front street, Jen. I'll, I'll let you decide if you want to reveal that whole conversation. But talking about this book, and I said, I'm doing this book with Twisted and stuff like that. And uh, sure enough, you read it, and you were one of the first ones that were like, people, check this out. This is That's this awesome. Is good, you know? Yeah, I was like, 100% on our it. side. We were like, That's it. That mm -hmm. is the comic. Yeah. That's it. For I sure. Love that it's you guys. I mean, like, it's not like the characters of you guys, it's like, it's you guys. And, uh, Dirk has Dirk, Dirk has a good way of finding all of the fun attributes of us and and kind of putting that that essence, if you will, or our, our original herbs and spices onto his uh, his palate and making it cool. I like I like how we're you're right. It is like you're reading about Jamie and Paul in some cases, and it's like you have to stop for a second. Like, do they really have a Batmobile? <laughs> it's like I love how you have to stop and think about that because it, it's it's we're like that. I love that. It's great. Like right. That. Have you guys Where? actually been on a ghost hunt? Is this is this like something from life? You just wanted to an official an official no, but but Paul and I used to play a few clubs that were quote unquote haunted, mm -hmm. and I recall him and Blaze 
going in the basement of a few of them and and blaze and i had went a few places we filmed a couple things scared the shit out of each other did we really find anything maybe i will we'll never know because we, we were like the haunted tours through yeah yeah and we did that too no those were fun those were yeah. fun but like a for real like you know go in with like you know mad cameras and night vision and all the all kinds of devices and gadgets nah hell no nah. but but that would be cool that would be That's great not, but what would be we, we are old school. We walk in that place. If we're scared, we stay longer. <laughs> and if nothing happens, we leave when we're done. That's how we are. That's how we investigate back in the old days when they didn't have all those gadgets. Who don't want to watch <laughs> us walking through houses that could be haunted? That's true. I mean, but 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 they, if you think about it, it's like the, the couple times like in that it was terrifying down there. Like you could feel that like sometimes that that tenseness. And I think that's what people they want to see. They want to see you scared. Okay, we were in the rave in Milwaukee, right? Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be super haunted. There's probably about 12 of us walking around, and we all yeah. come to this door. There's video footage of this. We have to find it. And okay. we're standing on a door that does not open. We've tried to open it. Everybody's talking or whatever, and all of a sudden, you just hear boom, boom, boom. And <laughs> of course, everybody like shits that. their pants and runs left and right. <laughs> We have to we have to source that video. That sounds amazing. That I'm does sound you, ridiculous. It's, yeah. It's 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 we've we've always been intrigued by it though. You know what I mean? But it's like, yeah, so so that's why it, for it to extend into the comic book, it's it's again, it's just more more spill out of us. I love that. Well, and like they said to commit ago, that that would be a fun show too to actually do that, you know, get all the, the technology and stuff like that because uh for yeah, sure. That'd be a trip. That'd be a trip. That'd be great. I'm down. For real. You know, I've never asked you guys, and uh, do you do you legit believe in ghosts? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't one, no I'm glad. Yeah. The other one, meh. <laughs> 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 okay. Keep it real. That's what I love. Tell Go ahead. Story. Yeah. Story, there I'm is. Tell you, Jamie's story is the one that solidified it for me, but here's where. I uh I finally was like, yeah, something's going on. I was on a couch that just like this. There's a sheet behind me just like that. I'm watching TV. I have a handful of M&Ms in my hand, and I can feel something watching me. As weird as it sounds, it was a humming that made me be like, what? And I could feel something lean over me and like push on the couch cushions. I just kind of sank back, and I convinced myself to go to sleep. I woke up three and a half hours terrified. With a handful of melted M and M's, I ate the M and M's and I ran. Holy the shit! But I yeah, love I it. Like, I oh, love it. Oh my I'm god, like, that's insane. No, that's fucking terrifying. I just yeah, there. I, I I believe in ghosts. I believe that they there there's there's energy and 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 things and residuals shit like that. Yeah, hell yeah. It different different kinds of ghosts. Different kinds of ghosts. Do you believe? There's a there's a. Tr I'm gonna tell you the truth. I know of at least two haunted comic book stores, like legitimately wow. haunted comic stores. That we could I could point you to. I don't know if they'll admit that they're haunted to like the public. Uh -huh. but they, they would tell me in private that they would actually be in their store, putting in like trade paperbacks into like slots on one side that it was a double sided thing. Wow. And that there would be. Comic books, there be trades coming off the rack. We're going to see them come off the rack, float in the, uh, in the air, not like fall off. Float For the sure. Air and then oh. drop. Wow. And they're like, I'm just going to come back and rack that later. Bye. Like, I would so, I would so like wield that into the name of, you know, like, like Suspiria Comics or something. Like, I, I, I make that into the name. Like, you're coming for an experiment and, and, and an experience, quite frankly, when you leave with your polls, your weekly polls. Be one hell of an LCS, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you, you may or may not have a ghost come with you. It's like, right. right, right. Like, it's like the gift that keeps giving. You leave with a little something more than a membership. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. But I think that's cool, though. I, that's insane. Like, I would totally meld that into the into the gimmick of the comic book shop. I would, especially if it was real. Like, goddamn, that's the next level. <laughs> yeah, the other yeah. one, he knows that it came with a collection because it can point it to the, the collection that it came with. And there's, wow. a little girl, there's a little girl that shows up in the shop all the time. And it came with a collection. She's not scary, but, I mean, anytime you have a, a curly-haired little girl show up in your shop, that's, wow. pretty scary. that's pretty scary. And she'll, like, that's in the middle insane. of the night, they'll watch it happen. She, she, they can actually see her. She'll come in, like, all of one thing. 
Like I think That's she terrifying. should remove all the statues and take them out of the cases and put them on the ground. It's so yeah. cool. cool. Right. At least, at least not malicious. At least not breaking those statues. No, she doesn't break anything. <laughs> Dirk, what about you? You do you do you believe in ghosts? You know, I obviously I like a lifetime of like creepy stuff and occult stuff and all that because I think it's fascinating. But I never believed in it, and this is actually a perfect segue. Until I went to New Orleans, and I went mm. on one of those ghost tours. And again, I went on it kind of like a lark, like okay, hey, whatever. That's really, elite, yeah. Really, really, those are like architecture tours. You go and you see the city; it's cool. And I had an experience there that was unquestionably, undeniably, could have been nothing but a ghost. I mean, legit. So I find myself still in this situation 20 years later where I don't believe in ghosts, mm -hmm. but, I, but I know they exist. It's like, rationally, there is no way to explain what happened than it was clearly what this guy said, which was this little kid ghost being tagged with people. And I literally got You don't want to believe. You don't want to believe in ghosts, but yeah, but you right, have to believe because of the, the what right, you're seeing with your eyes, basically. Right, right, yeah. you know, All right, fair enough. That's, actually, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, and, and it's one of those things where it's like, when you acknowledge that ghosts are real, how far does that go? How, like how, how you know, and again, the writer's mind, you know, it's like, how, wow. how, how much else is real? Is the conjuring real? Is the exorcist real? Is that, I mean, hell yeah, I mean, just, and boom, 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 and it all comes Low back. Bet. Low right. bet. <laughs> Low <laughs> bet. But I actually, I actually drew on that for Curse of the Green Book, which is the new one a little That's bit. That's dope. Yeah. Okay. Ohio. Hey there. In New Orleans, getting to kind of piece that in a little bit as, as we go. You know, that's but, awesome. yeah, it was, oh, that's cool. it was it, to this day, I still have that cognitive dissonance. I can't, I know what happened. There is mm -hmm. no logical explanation. It was, it's, it, it's like what you were saying earlier. Well, it is what it is. I mean, that's what happened. That's crazy. Can you, can you share those kinds of things with people though. When you share like personal experiences, like I can show you secondhand hand experiences. Everyone will buy it. So like, I totally, that secondhand knowledge is fine. If you share mm -hmm. first-hand knowledge, almost everybody tries to explain it away. I don't know what there is about that. Yeah. It's weird. That's crazy. Because yeah, nobody yeah. wants to believe. Because like Dirk said, if you believe that and that's real, it can't stop there. There's a ripple effect. It's going to bend out into your other faculties, and then now you have to question everything, and that's a problem. It, <laughs> it, yeah. That's too much for me, man, at this point in my life. It's, I'm, I'm it's right, that, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's deep though. I like I like how I like how it's a thing and I like how like like creative minds like Dirk or or, or anyone for that fact can take that and and make it into something. You know what I mean? The fact the fact of even it's a, it's a conversational uh, belief of it being a thing. There could be, you know, uh spirit police and all kinds of fun shit that keep the spirits in line. Hey man, what are you over here haunting these people for, man? You're in a 275 on a Tuesday, bro. I got to write you up. You know what I mean? It's like it depends yeah, on right. how you fucking look at it. It could be great for anything. I just like the fact how we we do we do believe in it and we've had brushes with it. So it's cool like when in in how when he writes it in the book, it's like from this different perspective. Like you kind of, you know, I, I love it. it. It makes it it makes it awesome. Can you talk a little bit about the new one, Dirk? The in, Curse of the Green Book? Are we allowed to talk? Yeah, absolutely. Bit? In fact, okay. you know, and I know your guys' time is limited. Be like, you know, I know you guys have other obligations today as well. So it, you guys know me, and I hope you forgive me for this. I got a small surprise to show you. If that's uh -oh. okay. Kyle, do you want to bring in our, our small surprise? <laughs> Look at that! Hey, Hi. how are you? <laughs> Good. Oh, yeah. I miss you guys. Ah, damn, hell yeah. How y'all doing? What's we up? got we, we got the whole team here. This is the whole team for Haunted High Ons right now with Jamie, oh, yeah. Mariana, and Dream oh, Joe. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, Curse of the Green Book is going to drop in August. I, I want to give shout outs to you guys too, Jamie and Paul. Uh, you know, you oh, have yeah. Astronomicon. Tentatively, hopefully, you know. I mean, right. That'll be that'll be one of the exclusive covers. We'll be at Astronomicon, mm -hmm. God willing, yes. And and if not, then we go straight to previews. Yep, yep, yep. So okay. one way or another, we're gonna have haunted high ons coming. This is issue one. This issue is issue one. one. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Four issue miniseries this time. We're in and out, and we even have a special preview that no one has seen before. Kyle in the back. Are you able to bring up the special? Oh, here we go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> 
this is this See? is all this is all Mariana. Uh, Mary, you want to talk, talk real quick about your process and stuff like that on this? Or I know we got you for a few minutes as well. But. You you kind of know my process because uh, I always do great tones wow. uh, and uh, and this is just uh, the brilliant coloring of Alessandro who brings it the atmospheres. <laughs> I like absolutely. Oh yeah, it's very atmospheric. I like that. That's <laughs> that's what makes it creepy though. That's what gives it that edge. Yeah, and I'm having so much fun with uh, with her. <laughs> do you do you? I want to ask a question. Is art? Do you draw? Do you draw in where the colors should separate, like in a background sequence, like how that shading panel at the top, it was top left or whatever, like the splash. I do everything in separate layers. Like uh, you let, do you leave that to him? Inks on a layer, colors uh, for Alessandro and letterings too. Mm -hmm. So it's all separated. Uh, but uh, the the backgrounds are um, always inside the any, any every panel. Wow, very yeah, beautiful. Yeah. No, that's it's awesome. It's it's very it, it it's it's attractive. It, it looks good. It looks like art. It looks like fine art. That is one Thank square, you. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, and if you scroll down, if you scroll down for a second too, Kyle, if you're if you're there listening, and again, I love how you guys color Felicia. You can see and then and then go over a little bit. Here's a little preview too of something else to come. That's awesome. Yeah, scroll, scroll sideways, and look at that. So you know, of course, we're in New Orleans. There's maybe some zombie action, and we got such. Okay. We're we're drawing a lot. I'm digging from, it, man. We're drawing that was a lot. like, hey Mary, do you know what you you're gonna draw? Zombies. Yeah. And I was like, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome no it's it's so great man it looks killer i love it holy shit now this isn't going to spoil anything for anyone right if you're if you happen to have it on a larger screen where you can read all the the, no. the caption bubbles and stuff this no, is just merely no, no, no. setting us up we were very very careful to show it okay spoiler. fair enough i love it <laughs> because yeah i you know i like to keep that stuff super you know super tight and super locked in but for sure you, you and readers, I mean, you guys, you guys know, having seen stuff and having discussions, and we have such surprises in store for Haunted Highest. Did you know with Mariana and Alessandro and the book, us being nominated for three Ringo Awards, we got to level up now. <laughs> got we gotta to level up. We got to get some attention going on. That's it. And uh, yeah, drawn a lot from the Twisted Musical Library and stuff like that on this one as well. Obviously, with the Being Chris Alfie awesome. book. With Ham Shabam and, and Drina Joe contributed something really cool. Do uh, you want to give a spoiler on that, Drina, before we have to kind of move into new stuff? I'm allowed to talk about it. <laughs> I, I I think a name drop or maybe a hint. His name is Little Joe. Yes. Oh, Little Joe. I love him. I just say hey, this. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there's, there's a character, Little Joe. He hangs out in a certain lagoon that may be familiar to some of your, uh, some of your okay. listeners. That's all, I'm gonna, that's all we'll say for now. So. Okay. Wow. All right. There you have it, man. Oh, my God. I'm excited. I know. Uh, this is the first time that Paul and I are seeing it, too, for everybody watching this. You'd like Surprises and surprises. <laughs> I'm saying it's 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 awesome though. It's always good to know that we're in good hands and like everything looks quality and it's on par with like some of the best books in the biz. So I I rest assured in that. I mean I think it's just it's amazing to know that we're still doing this and that is still kicking. So man, let's mm -hmm. get it. Curse okay. of the Green Book coming right. soon. August August and, and August in previews. August and pre yeah August and previews latest but it'll and be Astronomicon as well if you, if you happen to be in the uh, metropolitan Detroit area and make the trek hell yeah right all right we're picking an album that we want to listen to while while consuming haunted high ons which is the right one oh. mm. uh, I would say a record I would say Crossroads Inn is a, is is a nice one to to set the pace. It, it has a very spooky ambiance. It's about it, it's it's about a haunted house, or actually, you know, like a place you could go and 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 stay, but you can't leave. That's a good one. I like that one. I think that would set the tone. Uh, what do you got, Paul? He said, "Yeah, that's a, that's <laughs> yeah, a good hell one. yeah." I would say if you put on Wicked and just listen to that, Wicked is, is the epitome of what that is. I think that's a great one. You could pretty much just Absolutely. stick your hand in a bag and pull out anyone. But that one, I think, would set you up nicely. That's awesome. Those are, that's a really good that, – that entire record, he's right. That entire record is just insane. I went I went record as in single, but, yes, that, nevertheless, all good choices. <laughs> Hell, yeah. 
Mary, is there anything that you recommend that you listen to when you draw? When I draw, uh, well, except from the twist, for, from the for uh, all your, your your albums, because I, I need to be in the mood. The inspiration. <laughs> then the inspiration. I, I hear it. When I draw, I used to use to listen to draw music because mm -hmm. it has uh, the atmosphere and it, it creeps me out a bit. So that's awesome. Perfect. That's awesome. I love that. I love how everybody has something that like gets them to the creative point they need to be in that mind state, whether it's they're creeped out and then they draw creepy illustrations or or Dirk's creeped out about the little ghost and he's writing creepy shit or, or me and Paul are creeped out about just being creeps. I don't know. <laughs> no, I like it. Well, before I know, before we get a split up and move on to shout outs, these Ooh. are the two I've been jamming on. But they're yeah, good. those are good ones too. They, they oh, yeah. Mad Season brought the heat, and then, oh my God, you guys, Revelation, I'll tell you to your nice. face. That's awesome. Probably my favorite hip hop album of the last 10, 15 years was this album. Thank you, man. Hell you yeah. Guys, that's good shit. Two together, but man, Revelation oh, was just fine. Appreciate it. That's awesome, man. Thank you guys so much. And we continue to try to keep doing it, man. On repeat. <laughs> Which one? That's awesome. That's I love it. No, I love it. That's that's amazing. Hell yeah. Good you, shit. Can you tell me a little bit about the first time that you guys actually got to go to a convention and sign your books in front of a crowd? What was that experience like? For Paul, you said? For you guys. Oh, for both of us. Oh, it was it was awesome. Oh, it was cool as hell. Like people that run the convention to come and ask us to leave. <laughs> but but it was yes. awesome. We, we had this we had this mentality that that like you know we were going to be at the source point press booth and just signing stuff and we're like you know there is a possibility that no one will know like you could just slip under the radar be here and no one will know and we had a line and it was for a while and then it was just like okay cool and then we kept wanting to leave so we could go look at fun stuff for ourselves we wanted to be nerds there as well and not we wanted to handle our obligations and still be nerds. And 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 in the perfect twisted fashion, we got to shop and buy some fun stuff and sign everybody's books. And it was just amazing. It was an amazing time and it was awesome to be a part of it. Yeah. On both a, ends. On both ends. That was a well. New York Comic Con. Receiving, I suppose. Yeah. It was a good time. Yeah, that was a New York Comic Con when you guys were there. Yeah. And it was it just, was. It was it was. It was like a great, it was a great trek. Like we all did it and we stood there and and you know what I mean? It was just it was a good time. And I and 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 thank you to Drita for taking us through and and being our guide telling everybody to get the hell out of our way so we could shop. We got people coming through here with want lists, people. I'm like, yes. She was right a pet on. boss. It was a great time, I'm telling you. Good awesome. stuff. Awesome. Jamie and Paul, thank you guys so much for Thank you guys for time. having us, man. Thank appreciate you it. Thank you guys for making us an awesome comic book. We also appreciate that as well. Yeah, August, and we'll we'll hopefully see each other all again in August. So yes. appreciate you guys. Thank you, thank you Paul. Thank I you, Jen, you. for having us on as well. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, friend. All right, have a good day. Yeah, see you guys. And and Mariana, thank you too for joining us too. Yeah, Jen, you're gonna be a, 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 a special. Surprise. I just missed you guys so much. <laughs> I I agree. You know, the the world is what it is. We're not gonna talk about the time between 2019 and 2020. Let's talk about it's gonna end. Yes. It has an end. Absolutely. I'm filling you away in August, by the way. I'm taking you. <laughs> Yeah, we will we will see each other in August for starters, and then we'll just be off to the races again. So, <laughs> but thank hey, Mariana, you. Mariana, where, where are you from? Where are you working from? I'm working from well, I live in Italy, in Italy, in Milan, and uh, here's my home, my humble home, <laughs> and this is my desk actually. So I, I, I'm I have a desk on my living room. <laughs> That's where, the ma that's where the magic really happens. Cozy. Yeah, exactly. With with my graphic tablet here, and I'm just uh, in my my perfect spot. <laughs> Wonderful. Over your right shoulder, it looks like a lot of like really cool pictures on the wall. What is what is that? Oh, uh, there are paintings. Um, some graffiti from Alessandro because he was a writer back then. And then I have this treasure here. I don't oh, know if you yeah. see it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this well, is here. my treasure. You know, with I got... Dirk and Alessandro. 
Oh, and you, um, yeah, yeah. I'm the, sorry for the reflex, but <laughs> with twisted mastery, I, it's funny because I keep one up on my desk too from that same evening. This oh. is, uh, <laughs> the picture of me, you, and Alessandro and, and George all together from with those. I little, miss that time. Oh. Um, the, the, the other one, you probably don't know. I keep this in my desk too, but <laughs> the mystery drawing you did for me. Oh yes. Yeah, that one stays right here. He's always scowling at me, telling me to keep working as well. So, what was that? But, what was that uh, event that you guys were all doing together? That one was Astronomicon. Astronomicon two. Two. Astronomicon two was the second one. So hopefully we'll have the whole band back together again for for volume uh, uh, for volume four. Wow, for for Astronomicon four again this August. I, I promised I wasn't going to show my face, but I'm trying to talk Jen into coming to Astronomicon. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You would, have, you would have a blast. You would have a blast. And, you know, we, we've talked about, again, when things open up, coming down to Space Cadets Collection, collection to do a signing, but Astronomicon, oh, my gosh. It is, it is such a cool convention because it's like a hybrid between a horror con, a comic con, a pop culture con. They really do a lot of it. And a concert. They have concerts there. Every night, a concert. So... Yeah, Mariana, they have karaoke one night afterwards. Mariana and I uh, lit up the karaoke, <laughs> lit up the karaoke stage. <laughs> we're going to do karaoke together again. <laughs> yes, we have, we have plans. We're already, we're already, we're already mapping it out. So. <laughs> really, all you ever have to do to convince me to go to any con is to promise that we'll all get together afterwards and break bread because I love eating together. Absolutely. Done. We'll take you to Detroit's finest <laughs> establishments. So... Well, cool. Well, Mary, thank better, you for joining us as well. We, we, we know that you got to get back, but thank you. It was good to see you, my friend. We miss you. We will see you. In Same a... for me. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Feel that. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and then there were three. And what a nice wall behind you, Jen, with all the other stuff we have coming up. You, you okay, tell me, you know, uh, I mean, dealer's choice. Is there anything particular you want us to touch on, Jen? Or uh... I, I mean, I've never gotten to talk to Adrena very much about, um, like, how did you get start in comic book editing? What's, how, who suckered you into that? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a dream. It was something I've always wanted to do. And I had been doing it really low-key down low for a long time. And then um, I met Dirk, and he was more on the, yeah, you can edit my stuff, but you got to put your name on it. You can't just, you know, you got to put your name on it. So own it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, fine. You can put my name on it. It was a long, long process, though. I was panicking about it, freaking out about it. But in the end, we did it. <laughs> And now I'm here. <laughs> well, you had been editing. You've been doing a lot of editing in a lot of mediums for a while. And yeah. to me, I'm always very, very big on making sure that people get the credit for what they're doing and, and, and stuff like that. And when uh, an editor that I had a very close working relationship with previously, Leah Letterman, who has kind of circled back and is editing some of my upcoming work again as well, she was phasing out. I know I needed to work with a new editor and finding out that, that Drina had been editing like I said, things in, in multiple mediums. And we, we started having that conversation about bringing her in, actually first edit Haunted High Ons and then move on to other stuff. And it was a battle. And again, I'm not going to put you on front street, Gina, but it was a battle to like give the credit for it, you know, because yeah. you've been kind of used to not, not putting yourself out there. Yeah. So that's I'm not, still the not comfortable way. with it. I'll be honest. I still don't like to see my name anywhere out there, to be honest, but I'm working on it. <laughs> well, I think that's, Part of being a good editor too, though, is knowing that it's about putting the talent forward. So I think that's very admirable in what you do. And I think it's one of the reasons you're one of the best comic book editors out there right now. But at the same time, it's like, you need to get the credit for what you're doing. You know, you need to be recognized. So that, was, that was very important. To me. <laughs> what, the difference between, what are the big differences between editing for like say novels or articles and comic books? Well, I did screenplays mainly. And the biggest difference there is that there's a lot of editors involved. There's a lot of fingers in the pie. So if I get a, a screenplay 
the screenplay I edit ends up on the movies and it's not even close to what I edited because it had gone through a process to get there where everyone, you know, picked and chose what they wanted to keep and what they wanted to take out. And that it was kind of a heartbreak because you'd be like, that's not like the comic book at all. <laughs> like, did you hear nothing I said? But, you know, it, it'd be a huge hit. So what are you going to do? You got to mm -hmm. throw things in there that you wouldn't want to put in there and take things out that you think should be in there. So that was probably... Editing Pardon? isn't about making spell check and grammatical no. things. It's about the, the pacing and those kinds of things more, right? And continuity is super important. And um, dialogue has to be right. You can't just have something that makes no sense because it, I don't know about you, but like if you're reading a story and all of a sudden it's like, what? <laughs> it takes you out of the book as you try to reformulate the words. So that's important. But with comics, you have to, you monitor every single aspect of the comic. So like, you'll read it once, I've read it 15 times, all with a critical eye. You know, like you gotta you make sure the buttons are the same color, you know, and you gotta make sure that the shading is coming from the right direction. And it's just, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Is it hard for you to read a book and just enjoy it? Or do you always come with a critical eye first or can you turn it off? No, I can turn it off. Yeah. Very easily. That's yeah. True gift. Cause I do costume design and I can't watch a movie the first time without like looking at costumes, not for critical, but just be like, how can I make that? Movies? Yeah. It's very hard to turn off because <laughs> it's, it drives me crazy if like in one scene they're holding flowers that are red and then suddenly there's a white one in there and then it's back to all red and I get like somebody was paid to screw that up like what were they <laughs> it just aggravates me but a comic book I can I can shut it off well and correct me if I'm wrong but it's probably interesting too for you that in a movie like you said there's so many layers of it but like we talked about when we kind of brought you in, you know, um, with Haunted High Highlands Volume 2, the character Little Joe, who people will see in, in Curse of the Green Book, was pretty much like you had this, you know, we had, you had this idea to implement that. And then it's in. You know, it was a good idea. We worked it out and boom, it's in. You know, it just. It's well, it went from there. being like something small in a shop to being a character. Yeah. Like a co-star. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that also is a great writer because um, a writer that understands and appreciates input will take your input and they'll say, you know what, that's great. Or they'll say, no, it's not going to work. But I've dealt with people that wanted no suggestions whatsoever. So they just want a proofreader, which is not what I do. I am an editor. So <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to like, Oh, I'm just proofreading this. Are you sure? Because this is awful. <laughs> I changed this to something else completely. But no, just just a proofreader. So, <laughs> for the record, I do like to say I'm one of the ones that takes input. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Dirk takes input real well. Bob Sally is incredible at that. He just he is like absorbs everything, whatever anyone wants to tell him. He's just like, yes, give me more. <laughs> Pat, Pat says he can't stop editing. I can see that about Paul. I could see him becoming like a little, um, not obsessive about it, but like wanting to fix everything now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it becomes a thing. And, and that's one of the things too. And one of the things that I've been very loud about for years and, and more so than ever is I think as creators, we all go through that journey when we start that our babies are so precious and they're ours. And, and, and that's, that's, that, that's going to be it. But then you get to that level of, of comfort where it's like, okay, and, and usually it's a break point. Something happens in your career where you say, okay, I need to bring in an editor. And like Drina said, initially it comes down to like, you know, a proofreading thing. Just, just, just proofread it for me. But when you find professionals who are not so much interested in twisting your vision, but helping you enhance your vision, 
it, it becomes a game changer, you know, and I've been very fortunate working with editors like Lee Letterman, working with Green Joe, that, that really helped put it over. And now, you know, you got guys like Bob Sally who are sitting there singing the praises of editors and things like that and, and recognizing, and it's something I, I talk to creators about all the time, get an editor. A good editor is not going to twist your vision. A good editor is going to enhance your vision and help you best tell the story that you want to tell, you know? And again, uh, you know, you know, Drina's eye for art is incredible and she'll pick up on things. And we're working with, uh, on Haunted Highons, Mariana Pescosta, who's one of the most, who was nominated for a Ringo Award. I think she's one of the most gifted artists I've ever worked with. And she does a great job of catching things. Or working on Tales of Mystery Volume 5. Jen, I know Tales of Mystery is one of your favorite books. Um, working with Austin McKinley. Incredible artist. He, he's fantastic. And Austin and I have worked together a lot over the years. And this is our first long-form book we're doing. But again, you bring in another pair of eyes with, with Drina, and she'll catch things that Austin and I, we, we looked at it 30 times and never caught it. And she comes in like, nope, this, you know, or, or you know, it, it, you know, and it's, it, it enhances the, the quality and the level of the, the book and it helps you level up. Yeah. But there are so many steps to it. The first is of course, dialogue. Then the dialogue gets fixed and you got to reread the dialogue to make sure it's now right. Then you got to send it off to the pencils and then pencil sends it back. And then you're looking at every single panel. There's a lot of steps to it until it's final eyes and then off to the printer. Mm -hmm. Even so, at that stage too, it's like looking it over one more time and stuff like that. No, you always say one more time. And then like two right. hours before it goes to the printer, you're like, oh, just give it to me one more time. Yeah. The anxiety <laughs> the anxiety is real. It's like, hold on, let me, let me, let me look at this one more time just to make sure everything's just right. <laughs> so you always find something and something will always get by. Something's always going to slip through every time it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, yeah. Especially, especially doing graphic novels because historically, I I have leaned on the graphic novel distribution method more than the single issues. Although that's something working with SourcePoint over the next year or so, I'm going to try to you know, like we did with Hope do do a mini series to a trade, and with Haunted High on do a mini series to a collection. There's books like Tales of Mystery. To me, I always like to put out the book. Just boom, here's the next volume. But doing those big books like that as mentioned you know sometimes it's like it's different to edit 22 pages than edit 144 pages yeah is that a long volume five of is is it 100 no it's, it's more it's more yeah, yeah. volume five of tales mystery is a big one <laughs> it's a big boy oh paul i would say for hho one issue probably gets about 12 edits 12 12 read-throughs yeah yeah, we hopefully we don't have to fix mistakes twelve times over. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. For for the record, <laughs> the first the first round, I just sit there and just bang on the keyboard and just let Mariana handle it. You know, <laughs> make make something out of this. But yeah, it's very much very much a process. So but Jared, uh, you know, I'm going to try to try to talk it out of you. Do you do you have any top secret things you can at least hint? <sighs> you do. Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll go first. Um, we announced in the newsletter that twenty, you know, twenty twenty one, we're just coming back out of the gate strong. Buried but not dead drops in February. The big one I was sitting on for a, for all of twenty twenty was butts and seats to Tony Giovanni's story. Yeah. Oh my God, you know. And again, it was funny listening to Pat and Rob earlier, and a lot of people felt this that that twenty twenty was very hard for them to write. It really, for me. I can really tell I'm a horror writer because all the pain and anguish that I went through personally that everyone's going through, it just, it just lit a big fire under me. So Tony Shavani, butts and seats, the Tony Shavani story was a big top secret thing. Um, Tales of Mystery Volume 5, we've announced that. Uh, Jen, one of your, another one of your favorites, Cthulhu Jr., uh, the full graphic novels coming out later this year. Uh, I, I've talked about this a little. Um, we are re-releasing Right or Wrong Volume 1 this year uh, with like a revised edition. Uh, Leah Letterman went back with me and we, we totally re-edited Volume 1. I, I, I don't know if I've talked about this publicly yet. The Right or Wrong Volume 1 second edition has about 30% new content. So it's still the same book, but I found in prepping for Right or Wrong Volume 2 next year, going back and reading Volume 1, 
I'm still talking about things like message boards and things like that, which really is the lessons are still valuable, but I wanted to kind of go through and give the book a, a little bit of a facelift. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of top secret -y that we get about 30% new stuff in right or wrong volume one, the second edition. Again, same book, but just more, more updated. Uh, Hope volume two is plotted. So that'll be in 2022. Kaylin Smith co-plotted that with me. I'm excited about that. I'm trying to make sure I don't get the evil eye from, uh, from the boss here. Uh, I'm, I'm, be, I'm behaving so far. <laughs> I'm going to stop it on my head. Drina, you got stuff coming out too with other people besides me. So I, I do, but that I'll, I'll talk about those when I'm with them at a panel. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, oh, we have, are you allowed to talk about the one with Les? Uh, yeah, okay, that's top secret. I uh, got a project coming out with Les Gardner, who did Apocalypse Girl in 2022. That's super exciting. Les is a guy I've known for a really long time, and, and we've wanted to work together for a long time. You're in trouble. Kyle's here. <laughs> you know? well, Dirk's not in trouble. You're in trouble. Uh-oh. Talk right. about your work, Drina. Thank you. you. This is what we talked about the beginning. White press block. <laughs> okay. I saw the private chat where you said we had 10 minutes, nine minutes ago. So I was like, oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we're waiting. Travis, he would okay. be fine if you plug your work for his company. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, for it. I see some of the stuff I'm working on isn't with SourcePoint yet. So, or, uh, you know. Spill the beans, Gina. Spill the beans. Be free. Be free. Okay. Broken Gargoyle is volume two. We are in. We're in the middle of working on that one right now. And it's super, super exciting to be working with Christina. And, you know, of course, Bob. I just love Bob. So <laughs> he's, I'm not going to say he's my favorite, but <laughs> good. He's, <my> favorite. <laughs> he's your favorite. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. I'm always the bridesmaid. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, yeah, Bob Sally and, Christy Blanche together. That's going to be really cool. So you got other stuff too. You work on other stuff besides with me. What else you got shaking? And then there's Lab Brats, which I'm really excited about. And I it's with an author that I worked with on Get in the Game with uh, Pat. And I think it's going to be phenomenal. I really, I really think that one's going to take off. And then there's a book called Weaver with Aaron Keepers that I'm enjoying. A lot. And then there's Beholden with Becca Kinsey, and she's doing the art, the colors, and writing it, um, co writing it with Bob Sally. Oh, wow. And that's coming out soon, I hope. <laughs> so there's a lot coming out either by the end of this year into 2022. I think I'm on like 14 titles. So there's a lot. <laughs> right, I'm going to play this part. This is my favorite part of any panel that I can fit it into. Your secret hidden talent. Secret hidden talent, Drina. Oh, I, I, I'm a very good artist, actually. <laughs> See, that's awesome to know. I never knew. That makes sense, you know, being a comic book editor. Uh, I, I will let you know when I figure it out. Um, I'm uh, a martial arts instructor, you know. See? Yes! So that there, that that's something. I had to kind of give that up, you know, with my job becoming as intensive as it has and stuff like that, you know, but uh, no, um, the great black belt instructor. So that's something I take a lot of pride in. And that's something I don't really put on front street because you always get some knucklehead like, Oh, heard you're a such and such black belt, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you don't want me to prove it, man. Just, just <laughs> it. let it, don't worry about it. You're not going to like where this goes. <laughs> Your secret talent is that he can eat all the ice cream set in front of him and never get sick. Uh, that is also true. That is and not get diabetes. Or gain a pound. I, I. That's not a hidden talent. That's just that. That's that. Everyone knows that. One. The hidden talent is the not getting diabetes somehow. <laughs> All right, Jen. I don't mean to do this, but we're running out of time, guys. Social media is go. Oh Lord, uh, Drina Joe. Super easy. Or editor Drina Joe on Instagram. I just started that like two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. At Dirk Manning. Look for the avatar, the guy with the top hat and the scarf. He looks like this. And uh, one more top secret thing, I guess. Uh, DirkManning.com will be getting a facelift. 
in the next couple of weeks. So I will be putting that out there as well. I'm well overdue for a cyber facelift coming into the new year. <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it for the first part of day three. Thank you to Miss Jen. Thank you to Drina. Thank you to Dirk. Thank you to Twisted. Thank you to Mariana Pescosta. Uh, stay tuned, guys. Here's what you're going to have to do. This is that super tough time where we're running up against our technical wall. So we are. this broadcast is going to end. Refresh the page you're watching on now and come right back for Richard Davis and Travis McIntyre of Source Point Press. Uh, we will be back in just a few seconds.